guys wore really short shorts today. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The German On shorts. that note, we'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> So good afternoon. Welcome to the 12.30 p.m. public course portion of closed litigation session of the January 22nd, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony and thereafter the Council members will move to the courtyard conference room for closed session. I would like that to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings is currently absent, and Mayor Watkins? Here. And let me, does Justin know that we, oh, there he is. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. <clears throat> okay. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to speak on any item on closed session? Seeing none, we will uh, now adjourn to the courtyard conference room where the council will go into closed session. Are we ready here, Barney? So good afternoon and welcome to our 2 p.m. session of the January 22nd, 2019 meeting of the City Council. I would like to ask that the clerk, clerk please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover is currently absent. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins. Okay. And here. And if possible, could the clerk please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? The flag of the United States, States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So we have one presentation today, and um, we have Cherie Storm. Uh, from uh, the Chief Development Officer from Dientes. Hi, welcome. So what should I click? Oh, Imagine. Hi, I'm Sherry Storm and I'm the Chief Development Officer for Dientes Community Dental Care. Thank you for coming and uh, inviting me to come and speak. I'm going to walk through the 2018 uh, report card, which is an update to the countywide oral health strategic plan. And you have a, a, a pretty version in front of you. Right. It all started in 2016 when Dientes commissioned the first ever oral health needs assessment for Santa Cruz County. From this report, we found that the access to oral health care in, in our community is at a crisis level. Nearly 70% of those who are on Medi-Cal cannot go to the dentist due to lack of available appointments. The situation is worse when you include those who are uninsured <coughs> and seniors on Medicare for whom there are no dental benefits. The needs assessment also found that across all incomes, 31% of kids aged 1 to 11 have never been to the dentist. And one in four pre-K children have dental decay. Something had to be done to change this. So we brought together a group of stakeholders, including Council Member uh, Cynthia Matthews and 16 other organizations to create the Oral <laughs> Health Access Steering Committee. The goal of the committee was to address this crisis with the perspective that you don't have to be a dentist to impact, um, to improve access to oral health care. The initial report included 12 recommendations and we used those as the basis for the strategic plan. We focused on steps that have the highest impact as far as the number of patients served and we also focused on prevention for children at an early age. 
the top three recommendations emerged and became the basis of the Oral Health Access Strategic Plan, which we'll dive into next. But because of our early work in developing the plan, we were well positioned to take advantage of a grant opportunity that came about to implement the plan. So the good news is that the county has received a million dollar grant um, from state Proposition 56 tobacco tax funds to invest in oral health, and that includes a dedicated oral health staff at the County Health Services Agency. So let's see how we're doing towards that plan. Starting off, we launched a first tooth, first birthday campaign. This is an education campaign that uh, uh, is focused on kids, parents. Um, it's recommended that kids go to the dentist by the time they're one or they have their first tooth. This way we can focus on education and hopefully prevent the decay problem that we saw earlier. In the first phase of the campaign, we worked with the Central Coast Alliance for Health and included articles and information in their newsletters to their providers as well as their um, members. We also uh, did oral health education flyers with First Five's baby gateway packets, which every newborn in the county receives. We're now in the second phase of our campaign. This past summer, we ran online and um, radio ads. The next wave of advertising starts in February for National Children's Dental Health Month. We've also set up a website, a bilingual website with information that includes a list of dentists that um, uh, people can access. These early efforts have positively influenced the Medi-Cal utilization rates and we look forward to continued improvement. The second part of our plan was to reinstate mandatory dental visits prior to enrolling into kindergarten. With buy-in from the state, uh, excuse me, from buy-in from the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, we were able to make this happen, and 3,500 children received dental visit forms in their enrollment packet so far. And what this means is that children need to visit a dentist just like they need to visit a doctor before enrolling in school. As a result, the percentage of our children's elementary school age kids who have never been to the dentist was reduced to half. It dropped from 31% to 15%. Our last goal is to increase capacity. The two community dental clinics um, organizations in town are, are in the county are Salud and Dientes. And we've increased our patient visit capacity by 30% in three years. At Salud, they have introduced oral health coaches and 2,000 medical visits to apply fluoride, schedule dental appointments, and set up good oral health goals for their uh, patients. They're expecting to grow their visits by 15% to 31,000 <coughs> this year. At Dientes, in September, we expanded operations at, uh, to four days a week at our Beach Flats Clinic. This is due to the high need for services in that neighborhood. We expect to see nearly 1,000 patients this year. And we've also grown our outreach program to six new schools. And we expect to provide over 40,000 dental appointments this year. Looking forward, uh, Dientes is partnering with Santa Cruz Community Health Centers and Mid Peninsula Housing in a health and housing hub at 1500 Capitola Road. It's a very exciting project and it's opening in 2021. Dientes new 10 chair dental clinic will serve 7,000 additional patients. Santa Cruz will have an 18,000 square foot medical uh, clinic and Mid Peninsula Housing will have 57 units of affordable housing. In addition, Dientes is exciting about uh, partnering with Santa Cruz Community Health Centers in a new medical dental clinic downtown next to the Metro Center. If possible, Mid Penn would also like to be uh, a part of that project providing affordable housing. Santa Cruz would move their existing Locust Street Clinic and provide additional services to new patients at this site. Dientes would serve medical health center, um, excuse me, health center patients in need of dental care. And the timeline on this is three to five years out. So the goal, um, our third goal includes also another area which is about incorporating oral health within um, a primary care medical visit. This is kind of an innovative thing. 
Uh, and we've worked to have the application of fluoride varnish become the standard of care at well child medical visits for children ages zero to five. To do this, we focused on um, training providers and medical staff. And as a result, there's been a 270% increase in the number of children who have received fluoride varnish in a medical setting. In addition, uh, Cabrillo is changing, training all of their students on medical assisting and nursing programs in this process. So they're, they're ready to go when they enter the workforce. <clears throat> So we've made some great progress towards our goal, um, and so there's still a lot of work to do ahead. But we really appreciate the partnership and the commitment of the Oral Health Access Steering Committee. Together with Prop 56 funding, we look forward to really improving the oral health of our community. So one last thing. Now I'm gonna wear my Deante's hat. The an invitation in front of you. Um, Every February, we have, um, as part of the celebration for National Children's Dental Health Care Month, we provide a Give Seniors, excuse me, Give Kids a Smile Day. We also do Give Seniors, but that's in August. And this event provides free care to uninsured low-income children. Um, so as you, if you've not yet seen our clinic in action, this is a perfect opportunity to come and learn, um, have coffee, and see what we're all about. Thank you. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to be here and sharing where you've been and where you're planning to go and the good work that you're doing in our community. It's exciting to hear about some of the mixed use opportunities coming up as well in terms of. There's, it's very exciting. That is very exciting. I wanted to see if there's any questions. Well, I'll just add the oral health, um, I even forget the name of it, <laughs> um, committee that, that I've served on. Yes. Um, has included other representatives elected, uh, others from public sector, from schools, from the uh, dental profession, from community clinics. So it's a really great uh, collaborative that meets to uh, work with the, the Diente staff and the other professionals to, to move this long range plan forward. And it's been impressive. Well, thank you. I mean, the, the focus of the work has really been on impact. Mm -hmm. like doing things that have a real impact. And that's why we focused on, on kids, because um, if we can get kids and parents to understand the importance of oral health at an early age, then we're preventing all these cavities in the future and dental issues in the future. So thank you. Wonderful. I, I'll just make a plug, because I visited the clinic um, during the campaign to learn more about their work and uh, just make a plug for any council members who haven't been there. The kids, the kids' room is amazing, yeah. and the kids' facility is amazing. So I'm excited too about um, the potential partnership for our community. Thank you with you all, and thanks for taking care of the kids in our community. <laughs> really, thank you. All right, thank you thanks. So that concludes the presentations for this afternoon. At this time, I just have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular agenda. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Jennifer Cameron is our technician for both this afternoon into the evening sessions, and I'd like to thank you, Jennifer, for your work. All council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. And if you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, please, we'd like to receive that information in email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meetings. This then provides us an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of the agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left, and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of the chambers. I will also just take a quick moment to read a few of the uh, rules of procedure for conduct of city council business agreed upon by uh, a city council, um, which include to be respectful, 
to engage in open and honest communication, to be honest and truthful, to address difficult issues, to find areas of common ground, to be open to different perspectives, to give the benefit of the doubt, to be role models of good leadership, and to be considerate of each other's time. So at this time, I'd like to ask if there are any council members um, who are having a statement of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. And uh, to the city clerk, is there any additions or deletions? There are not. So a quick announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public and the community to speak to us about items that are not on our agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. At this point, I'd like to ask our city attorney to please report out on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. There were two items on this afternoon's closed session. First item was a conference with legal counsel uh, concerning liability claims, specifically the claim, claim of Jean C. Gelbart. Second item was a conference with labor negotiators. Um, City Council met with its negotiators and discussed all bargaining groups and including unrepresented uh, employees. There was no reportable action on either of those items. However, um, the liability claim is number four on your, your uh, open session agenda. Great. Thank you. Okay, so before we begin, with, we begin with our action items, I just want to make a brief announcement that agenda item 23 will be heard at a time certain of 3.30 p.m. And this means that we will stop whatever we are doing within the agenda and hear agenda item 23, and then after <laughs> subsequently returning to the item before where we had left off. So that then moves us along to our consent agenda. So those are items two through 11 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is polled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to poll any items? Council I just, uh, so if I just had a question pertaining to one of them, I would have to pull it and then. No, not no, necessarily. Just a quick question. So uh, this is a question from Mark. Before you ask your questions, uh, I'm gonna see if there's any items okay, that Okay, for number six, I have a question. You have a question on number six, okay. Any I have here? a quick question, doesn't need to be pulled. Okay. <clears throat> Seeing none, um, okay, now would be then the time for any comments or uh, questions in terms of items, so we'll go to your, to your question. Thank you. Um, I was just curious with staff, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to reach out to you before uh, the meeting, but I was wondering if I could get the information at some point about uh, how our roads are prioritized for new paving and how that decision's made. Also, in the report, it specifies other utility cuts um, as being a reason for wanting to see some additional paving happening, and I was just wondering who is responsible for those other utility cuts that are referenced in the uh, gender report. And then the last thing is if I could at some point just request a uh, budget um, so that I could understand what the allocations are that we have towards paving and what percentage the 150,000 proposed in item six is. Okay, Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council. I'm Joshua Spangard, Senior Civil Engineer. Um, so what's going on over on the EEO West side right now, specifically on Wyndham Street, is uh, as the report says, pg e has a transmission line project and they did, part of their contract is restoring all the streets they came across. And so Wyndham Street is a concrete street which presents uh, particular difficulties. It's very expensive to repair. So while they're out there, we're just gonna have them do a bunch of repairs for us. And in terms of what uh, the budget, like I'm, we're guessing this is gonna cost about $150,000. Uh, for comparison, our project right down here on Cedar Street is $2.3 million. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question to give you some kind of scale, but yeah. uh, I'd be happy to provide whatever information you. Thanks, so we can touch base after the meeting and everything just for those other future <laughs> things. And just with regards to the other other utility cuts that oh, are referenced? Oh, so sewer, prim sewer and water primarily. Okay. So, uh, I mean, it's the city's responsibility to take care of those. We identify any other, any failed PG&E cuts that are in the road and they have to take care of them, uh, whether it's part of this project or not, that's, that's on them, but uh, basically city uh, water and sewer. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, did you have a question on this item, Councilman? Not this one. Okay, Councilman McCarthy. Is it, uh, the other follow-up, um, is there a queue for uh, street paving? Is there a whole a list of we're gonna do this street and then we're gonna do this street and then we're gonna do this street? Uh, 
Yeah, well, I, I mean, to answer your question, we have, we have, uh, we're about ready to go out with a, with a uh, surface street, uh, surface seal project, which is not the repaving, but is the Cape seal with the slurry seal. Um, we have identified something on the order of, I wanna say one and a half million dollars worth of uh, street work that needs to happen. And that's all predicated on, we have a, a pavement management system that has the rankings of all the, the street uh, condition index, but uh, pavement condition index. And so uh, what we're going to do right now is just we're going through there and identifying all the ones that look really bad on that, on that map that we have and we're putting them all together in one big project. So to answer your question, I mean, realistically, a lot of our projects are uh, more reactionary than anything else because things happen and fall apart right away. But, um, but we do, I mean, we try to get to the worst streets first. And the arterials, anything that's used by more and more people uh, is generally a priority for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, and then we have uh, another question on a different um, Yeah, on number seven, which was the um, uh, notice of completion for the City Hall Annex um, mechanical system upgrade. I noticed uh, you reference here the uh, project uh, and grant funding for a whole list of projects. I remember when that study was done and there are all sorts of things we could do and there's a list. So this it mentions in the report was the big one. I'm just curious to know what's in the pipeline for the others. And I don't need to know it now, but maybe if you can get an information piece out to it, I think the new council members would be probably interested in that. Well, all the things that are queued up that can deliver energy savings for us and we have a grant to do it. I'm, I that. Yeah, okay. okay. So we'll, we'll look for that yeah. potential memo in the future. Okay, cool. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to ask any members of the public if you would like to speak on any item in on our consent agenda or request any item be polled. Be given two minutes. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, Council Members, Gillian Greenside. I hadn't intended to speak, but, uh, and I frankly hadn't noticed item six, what was just referred to. So I just, and since it says, um, a restoration of distressed concrete pavement. I'd like to just express appreciation for that because uh, those, those who've lived in Santa Cruz for a long time, it might be a small item in the scheme of things, but uh, our con the concrete streets are quite beautiful and a lot of people feel that way. And over the last many decades, quite a few of them have been covered with the, uh, you know, the slurry. And it seems a lot. There may be other reasons that I'm unaware of, not, not being an engineer. But if this is a restoration of the concrete street rather than covering it or changing it, and that is the sort of agenda for our few remaining concrete streets, which aren't usually main arterials, I'd like to express appreciation for that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members uh, who would like to speak on our consent ag agenda items? This time, okay. Seeing none, I'll return to council for action and deliberation. Move consent. Okay. Second. Okay, so uh, moved by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay. So the next item on our agenda is um, under general business, and that's the appointment of uh, representatives to the external agencies groups, council committee and task force. Um, without revisiting in depth the conversation that took place at our uh, January 8th meeting, I uh, made some modifications based on input and discussion at that time. And this, these are the recommendations that I have brought forward um, to suggest for adoption. Is there any questions? Okay. Well, given the significant amount of discussion we've had about it, um, I don't wanna um, add too much to that, but um, I would like to move that we if, if we can before your move, if before your motion, I'll just maybe open it up to public comment. Okay. Unless, any public comment? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Are there any other questions before we open it up to public comment? Okay. Sorry, I just disagree. No, 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 no problem. I just want to make sure we acknowledge that process, part of the process. Is there any member of the public who'd like to speak to this agenda item? Okay. Mm. Okay. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll have two minutes. <laughs> Good afternoon, Damon Bruder. Um, from, from what I understand, uh, as mayor of Santa Cruz, um, it, it, it's very much a, uh, an honorary title. There's not a lot of special separate powers that the mayor is given. Um, one of the powers that I do know uh, you have is the ability to appoint people to certain commissions and councils um, as you see fit. Um, that's one of the ways that you actually have a strength to help shape and steer our committee or our, our city separate from just being a council member that you have that little bit extra oomph because you can appoint those people. I feel that um, changing stances um, because someone didn't get what they want um, might show a bit of weakness uh, in the future or a bit of vulner vulnerability in the future. And I feel that if um, minds are changed because somebody didn't get what they want, well, oh well, I didn't get what I wanted either. I'm not a billionaire this morning. Um, I feel that the mayor could get steamrolled and bullied and walked over by the council if she gives up the power to make her choices and stand by those choices. I think in this condition, in this situation, first thought correct. Um, I know that Cynthia Matthews uh, was surprised to be appointed to the Public Safety Committee uh, two weeks ago, um, and but she was more than willing to accept that, even though it wasn't what she asked for and what she wanted. That I feel that that's the kind of council that we need, so people that are willing to take whatever is given them and work with it and learn from it, and maybe next year, the shuffle happens and other people are on public safety or whatever committee. Anyways, I just hope that people can stand strong and not get walked over by uh, a council that might have one agenda in mind. That's all I have. Good, ap good afternoon, Council Elise Casby. I have questions about this and I've, I've looked into these um, commissions and various advisory bodies and I just want to um, express a couple of things that I wanna keep track of. The first is, is that my understanding is that some of these commissions are extremely effectual in terms of their decisions and then what actually happens in the concrete world such as buildings that are approved and I realize these go through a process but um, what I'm going to ask today is that you help the public at this time at the beginning of the year by just giving a little more information and not referring us just to online sources. Some people do not have ready and available access to online sources who might be very interested in partaking in these bodies but also because these bodies interact with other places in government, such as the city hall, such as um, the economic development department to really make things happen. Um, so at a brief look, for example, one of the commissions I was interested in, it seems that I would have to commit through the year um, 2023. And um, I am not able to make that commitment at this time for that long. Sorry, I'm sorry, if you can, and not committee. This is committee appointments that the mayor recommends to the full council for adoption, but we'll get into the commission committees later. So I think maybe you'll be revisiting your okay. public comment. What, what committees are you interested? This is uh, this is on item number 12, which is the recommendation from the mayor to the council for adoption of appointment of re council member rec re representatives to external uh, agencies and governing bodies. And that's not the same thing as the Arts Commission, the no. Commission for Prevention, the Planning Commission, it's over. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, Gillian Greenside. I'm not sure what uh, changes are being proposed by the Mayor, so the, these com comments I'm going to make may be moot. Uh, but since I don't know that, I'll just go on what was shared at the last meeting when this was discussed. And I didn't have a lot of facts at that time, but I was concerned that one council member, uh, council member Glover, uh, got no appointments to, and I'll say there are significant boards and um, advisory bodies and less significant, not one appointment to one of his, um, that he said he was willing to serve on. Another council member got, I think, quite a number. So that did feel an imbalance. I was further moved by council member Glover's 
um, explanation of the makeup of, I think it was the safety committee. And I know that he has been a member of the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. I was one of the co-founders of that commission. And I feel that his presence, based on all of the reasons that he shared last time, uh, would mean that he'd be a very valuable member of that committee. And while everybody is valuable, some people's experience and background, interests, concerns can bring a better balance to the committee. So I hope there is some adjustment given uh, contrasted to last meeting's appointments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other further comment at this time? Okay, I'll bring it back and I'll just quickly say um, for context for those that haven't tracked that one of the things that was discussed at the last meeting was to move forward with the uh, recommendations, but to revisit after conversation the appointments of public safety. Um, so that's why those changes have been modified, which then led to one change on community programs. And then in regards to Measure U, it came to my attention that that working group had already begun with Councilmember Brown. Um, so I, in, firm, in terms of continuity, that's why that recommended change was incorporated. Okay. Councilmember, I'll just make a, a brief comment. Um, that you know, I, I want to say that I my uh, motion that I or two motions that I intend to make, in no way, re, uh, you know, I want to appreciate the work that's been put into this, and I I really understand that this is a challenge, and we don't always get uh, the appointments that we would like. Um, I am really okay with um, getting what I get, and so I'm one of those council members, and I don't intend this to be politicizing or you know, calling into question decision-making and authority. What I am interested in here is addressing some, um, you know, some of the sense that there has, you know, the, the equitable representation and giving new council members an opportunity to serve on these boards and commissions, I feel is extremely important. There's been enough discussion about this that I feel, it, or for me at least, I felt it was worth uh, additional review and kind of and work and discussion with others. And so um, that brought led me to the conclusions that I've uh, have come to. And so I just want to um, put this out there and um, suggest that I um, I want to make a motion that we approve um, the list of representatives um, to external agencies groups and committees and task forces for the calendar year, um, but I'd like to t uh, take two of these uh, commissions separately, and that is um, community programs and uh, a metro board. So I'd like to move uh, approval of the recommendation, and then I, I don't know how exactly, I think I need to do this in two separate motions for community programs. I'd like to um, make it a, a revision and for Metro a uh, revision and I'd like to take those separately so they can be voted on separately. So my understanding is that this had been approved at the last meeting with the two modifications. So I'm not sure if we need to have a separate motion. Is that correct? That you would be then modifying and just then mod we would approve so I'll it. just make the two motions. Okay. Just make the changes and then we would, okay. uh, if the majority of the council wants to change it, they can change it. Correct? Okay. Go ahead, you can okay. just move it. So want. I'll move for um, community programs that the um, uh, appointees be Mayor Watkins, um, Council Member Matthews, and Council Member Glover. For the Community Programs Committee. That's my motion for one, and then I have another motion I'd like to make. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion before we take? <coughs> are these two different motions, or are you putting them on? I'd like to take them separately. So we have a second on that one, but what about for the first one? For the first motion? That's the first, so we don't have so to approve the whole list. It's already yeah. approved. You can, you can incorporate, you could either do it um, one by one or did you have, you want to make two changes? Two changes. I think it's, I, I'd like to take those separately. You'd like to take them separately. Based okay. upon conversations. I'd okay. Like so um, the motion on the floor, which is the first motion by count, by Councilmember Brown and seconded by Councilmember Crone is to remove Councilmember Matthews from community. No. I'm sorry, remove Councilmember Brown from community programs and put Councilmember Glover on community programs instead. And now it's attempt for any discussion. Well, actually it is to remove the vice mayor from the committee, oh, is that leave that you on and leave me on. That's how you have it. 
that's how it, what's recommended is it changed now it? is Watkins, Brown, and Matthews. No. Sure. Yes, that's right. So you're suggesting, I see, take so, you yeah. off. Yeah. Got it. So you in red here were yeah, the addition. I got it. Yeah. I got it. Any discussion? Did you have a I'll be voting against the motion. Yeah. So will so, I. Okay. You want any further discussion? Nope. Okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's Councilmember Brown. Okay, I'm sorry. All those no, please say no. 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 Okay, Councilmember Brown, Council Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Councilmember Crone, and Councilmember Glover uh, voting in support. Uh, Councilmember Matthews, uh, myself, and Councilmember Myers voting against. Okay. Um, so I would also move that um, Council Members um, Myers and Crone be appointed to the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Second. So the motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover to appoint Myers and Crone to Metro. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Need discussion? I am going to speak strongly against that. Um, <laughs> I've served on the Metro board for just a little over a year. Um, we are going through some really significant um, discussions with Metro right now, not only on services, but on our uh, relationship and partnership on the Pacific Station. Um, I think I can really contribute a great deal of continuity and understanding of issues at stake and the strategy <coughs> really in a fairly short term moving forward, as well as the other operational and budget issues um, that Metro is dealing with. Um, Prior to my uh, coming on last year, I took a place that Don Lane had occupied before he termed out, and um, other council members serving on the Metro Board prior to that were Don for most of his tenure on the City Council and Cynthia Chase for most of hers. And um, that is uh, uh, an assignment involves um, people from other, just for those who don't track, um, other public sector, uh, designees as well as some um, um, individuals from the general public. Um, it was very important to the city's interest to have people who had a real sense of continuity of the evolution of the issues facing Metro and the, the city's um, partnership projects. So I frankly would like to stay on that um, um, board. I, I think a really um, would play a key role in, in what moves forward there. It's not a matter of ego, it's a matter of understanding the, the context and, and the projects on the table. Just a comment. Um, in just my short research of if I was appointed to this board, um, looking uh, at the Metro's um, past agendas, as well as learning the, the projects in the pipeline um, and the importance of continuity, um, I, and, 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 and most importantly, respecting the mayor's uh, ability to appoint people to um, these external and internal committees. Uh, I just want to go on record that um, I'll, I won't be supporting the motion. Uh, I understand the need for uh, our council members to serve not only our community, but also to be representative on these commissions and committees external to the city. And um, I think, um, the mayor has done a good job of trying to find um, some compromise as well as um, bring, uh, uh, you know, to, it, it has responded to um, some of the concerns brought up at our last meeting uh, regarding these. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to support the motion. I feel like um, Council Member Matthews is, is necessary to this uh, board and should be able to continue her work that she's uh, initiated on it. And I, most importantly, like I said, I just want to respect our mayor's process and uh, her careful consideration of all of our requests. So. Council Member Brown? Just have a quick follow-up. Um, just to, to comment I, and clarify, my intention here is in no way to, um, again, call into question or, or be disrespectful of the mayor's prerogative in this case. 
I just, like I said before, in, you know, in response to what I saw as, a, you know, an imbalance, and it, there was significant discussion about that um, in representation, I felt it was important to try to address that in um, a small, you know, in not a small way, but in, you know, with some of these appointments. And so I'm not, and I'm not in any way suggesting that Council Member Matthews' uh, participation and representation on the Metro um, is, it, I have any problem with that. I just feel like at this point, I am weighing all of the factors that go into our decision making about this. And on balance, I think it's important to provide some additional representation from other council members at this time. Council member Crone in this case is a Metro Transit rider, has been for a long time. Um, he also served on the Metro District in the past. Um, and so I think he has some qualifications and some direct experience that um, lend themselves to making decisions um, and participating in the Metro process. So I just wanted to clarify that. This is not about questioning authority or qualifications. It's really about balancing that with the equity question. Yeah. <clears throat> so I appreciate uh, some of the motions that have been made so far and the intention around them. I think it's important to realize, at least from the way I perceive this, is that it's not an issue of disrespect in any way to the mayor or to the process, but more has to do with and what I perceived to be an apparent effort for representation and equity in what's going on. And, you know, as we heard from the community member that they didn't wake up as a billionaire, so they don't always get what they want. I think that's a very unequal comparison to try to compare wanting to frivolously wake up as a billionaire someday and to not doing it compared to running a campaign on specific issues, being voted into office, and then being uh, surprised when that representation of those people and of that perspective that was elected is not represented in the appointments. So I will be supporting the motion as I'm the second. Well, I, I appreciate the support, and um, you know, I will say that um, <laughs> students are underserved in this community, and the the, the, the transportation system on campus, I, which I'm there three, four times a week, is a mess. And I have been in touch with bus drivers, been in touch with students. There's a lot of good ideas that they've given me, and I'll take that to the metro. So I, I really f I feel pretty strongly that um, I would give good representation to this body as well as uh, our constituents. Okay. Mayor Matthews. Just one, one more thing I just want to put it on the record is that I think it's really important to acknowledge that we are, what we're doing is a democratic process, which I think is super important and one of the things that makes the country great. Um, we may not agree 100% of the time, but it is important and from my perspective to acknowledge that dissent is a form of is patriotic and we are trying to uh, figure out a process that works for everyone through conversation in a transparent way. So thank you. Okay, unless there's any further discussion, we'll go ahead and call the vote. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, uh, second by Councilmember Glover to have Myers and Crone serve on the Metro Board. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. 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 So that fails with uh, Councilmember Brown, Crone, and Glover in support, and Councilmembers Matthews, Myers, myself, and Vice Mayor Cummings against. So the uh, appointments will remain with Myers and Matthews. I just want to make sure that we, if I can, I just want to make sure that we um, are also acknowledging that. Um, or maybe it would serve to have a motion to accept the changes for Measure U Implementation Working Group. I also wanted to make a motion if possible. Um, just given the fact that um, I've received some public comment regarding the fact that public safety is completely made up of men, yeah. And knowing that um, it's really important for women's voices to be heard when it comes to public safety, um, I personally would like to step down and from the Public Safety Committee and offer um, that Donna Myers uh, be appointed in my stead. Would that be something of interest to you? <laughs> <laughs> or other female? Or other, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I definitely see the, the, the need to have um, a woman on the, on the board and if, if no, one, no other women on, on our council are interested in serving in that, I'd, I would be 
I'm not raising my hand. Okay. I have a comment. <laughs> um, I would be happy to accept that. Okay, so I'll just, go ahead. if I could, um, I think procedurally, well, just to step back, uh, this whole agenda item um, is um, globally a case where the mayor recommends trying to incorporate a whole lot of different issues, uh, make his or her recommendation, which are then um, confirmed by the council at large, and we've had some adjustments here. But I don't think it's really appropriate to do kind of horse trading. I'll give this up and give it to you, because that's not, that deviates from your role as making recommendations. I think <laughs> it's appropriate if you make your ob observation and maybe we bump this off one more for the mayor to come back with her recommendation. I'm happy That's to just that. how it strikes to me rather sure. than yeah. dealing cards around the table. I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to do that and I'm happy to continue to do that and revisit that again in terms of the makeup because I did to notice that mm -hmm. it's all men. And as I think you can see, it's very difficult to get the representation and interest um, where, it sh where everybody wants to be. So I'm happy to do that again if the majority of the council sees different, then they have the right to change that. So if that being said, my understanding is to have me revisit the composition of the public safety and to look at replacing uh, Vice Mayor Cummings with a female uh, council member. Is that correct? So I'm clear on my ask? Yes? Okay. So then um, if maybe I could entertain a motion to then ratify the Measure U implementation mm -hmm. working group to now incorporate council member Brown. So correct? Move. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll second that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Okay, that passes unanimously. Did you get this? So were you taking Vice Mayor Cummings as a, a motion for you to revisit? Because we never got a second or a vote. I'm not, I'm, I think he's, did you withdraw your motion? And I'm taking it as direction to return. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So the next order of business is the advisory body appointments and reappointments. So before we begin, I would like to make a few announcements. For each um, commission, I will begin by calling for nominations from each council member, starting, to, starting from my left, but will rotate the council member giving the first nomination. Only new nominations should be called. So if a council member has already nominated an applicant, then that nomination should not be called again. At the end of the nomination selection period, the city clerk administrator will take role a roll call vote to determine appointments or, re or reappointments. The city clerk will then tally those choices and determine a majority vote. The nominees who get the majority of votes are the ones who will be appointed or reappointed. So we, before we begin, I'd like to call on members of the public who would like to speak to us on any of the commission reappointments or appointments. And now is the time for members of the public to comment on agenda items 13 through 22. So all of our commission and, re and appointment and advisory bodies. I would, hi council, my name is Elise Casby and I'm just, I'm just here to sort of comment in on the public process for these commissions. As you know, I've become somewhat of a regular fixture here at city council since about 2013. Don Lane put that out on a Facebook at one point. And yet, even so, um, my ability to kind of understand how the various governmental departments and bodies work together is, is it's not easy sometimes, especially when you're interested in kind of getting a picture of a lot of different aspects of government as I have, such as the Metro and how it relates to city council and so forth. So what I'm just, what I want to ask for is, for there to be some kind of a fair, like a, a day of, of outreach to the public and that it be held very close by, like at the Civic Center and that the students be um, invited to it and that there be extensive outreach to various people in the public to try to understand especially this aspect of government, um, because I think it's a way that people might be able to join city government without having to run for office, which is an enormous prospect. So the reason I'm asking for this is, for example, I've been looking at these bodies from a bit of a distance for a long time, and I've come to the city hall main office and so forth. 
Um, my activism is in certain areas of interest that has a lot to do with the community, as I'm sure you all know. And my interest mainly often has to do with working to get community participation here, um, so more than understanding exactly how government works. So I, for example, see that some of these, uh, you have to commit through the year 2023, which I would not be able to do at this time. So I'm hoping that these questions can be taken seriously and that maybe we can resolve to bring the public Thank in. You. Thank you. Are there any other speakers who'd like to address the council this time? And this is for items 13 through 22. Okay, seeing none. Let's begin, and I just want to remind um, the council that you won't need to have a second for your nominee. You can just state the names, um, and that's not part of the process. Are there any questions before I begin? I want to clarify, sorry about this. We're going to take each of them in turn. So um, I'll give you all my list for, you're not going to start with me for every single one. No, I'm going to rotate. <laughs> just so I understand. Sure. Just so I understand. Yeah. So a nomination is one name, correct? When you say. But if, if there's. X openings, you can suggest X names. Exactly. Oh, you can. Okay. For, the, for the appropriate amount Great. of openings. Thank you. I'll just say in advance, this is sort of a strange process <laughs> for the new ones um, joining us at this time. That's what sure. I have to ask at least. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll begin with the Arts Commission. There is one possible reappointment with a term expiration of January 1st, 2023, and three vacancies, two with the term expirations of January 1st, 2023 and one with the term expiration of January 1st, 2020. So the appointment appointee with the least amount of votes will get the shorter of the three terms, essentially is how we're working with the Arts Commission. Okay. So at this point, may I please have a nomination starting with Councilmember Brown. As always, we have a very qualified and uh, exciting uh, list of applicants. And so I um, am at this point just going to highlight and nominate two that stood out for me, although I think there are many um, on this list who would be very capable of representatives. Um, Janina Larenas and Maria uh, Krisha Vinigas. Can you repeat that second name? Uh, Maria uh, Krisha Vinigas. MK. MK. Okay. MK. I'm sorry, you're right, yeah. correct. MK. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Yes, I'd like to nominate Mary Tartaro, who's currently serving uh, and is interested in reappointment. She's been very active, um, and uh, with that many new appointments, I think would give some good uh, continuity. She's been very involved in some of the projects to date. And I'd also like to nominate Allison Garcia. Vice Mayor Cummings, any additional names to those that have already been nominated? I would like to nominate uh, Sean Swain McGowan. Uh, mm -hmm. Just. For the record, he's been someone who has done a lot of work in the community with doing a lot of community outreach, um, and he has been working on some major projects in the city of San Francisco, and I think his talents and abilities would be well served on this commission, and that's my only recommendation at this time. Great. Okay. I have no additional names to nominate. Council Nor do I. Mr. McLever. Owen Thomas. Council Member Cronin. Uh, nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so at this point, we'll go through again, correct? I'm looking at you, Bonnie. I'll, now I'll do the roll. Now you'll the, do the roll. The okay. Vote. Mm -hmm. um, Allison Garcia. Council Member Brown. I'm sorry, do I go through? You're, now you're probably now, now, Or do we go down the line and just say who our choices are? We could go down the line and say our top four and then yeah. go through there. Does that sound good? Is that easiest? What's, what's, what's the least cumbersome for you? For you yeah. Okay. 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 So we're, okay. we're naming our, our, our choices. Out of the four. nominees, okay. who are your four? And then four? she'll tally. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. Council Member Brown? Okay. Um, my four, Janina Larinas, um, and Shelby Negas. Alan and Alan Thomas. <laughs> Matthews? Allison Garcia, Janina Larenas, Sean McGowan, and Mary Tartaro. Vice Mayor Cummings? Um, sorry. Janina Larenas, Sean McGowan, 
Mary Tartaro, and Owen Thomas. Okay. To buy for are Allison Garcia, Jania Larinas, Sean McGowan, and Mary Tataro. My four are Allison Garcia, Janina Larenas, Mary Tartaro, and MK Vinny, Vinny, <laughs> <Vinny> I guess. <laughs> uh, Janina Larenas, Sean McGowan, Owen Thomas, MK Venegas. And then Venegas? Venegas. Councilman McCrown. Uh, Janina, Sean, Owen, and MK. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a tie um, between Mary Tortoro, Owen Thomas, and MK. And there are the three with the least amount who would be, so the three. We need two more out of that three. Out we of need those three. two out of, that, out of those three. Okay. So let's go through again and list the two. Okay. So between Marie, Mary uh, Tortoro, Owen Thomas, and MK, Vinegas. Owen Thomas and MK Vinegas. Okay. Councilmember Matthews. Um, Mary Tartaro and MK. Okay. Vice Mayor. Mary Tartaro and Owen Thomas. Okay. Uh, mine are uh, Mary Tartaro and MK. Uh, Mary Tartaro and MK. Lover. Owen Thomas and MK. Owen and MK. I'm getting a tie again. Okay. So oh. can we just, can I just confirm, um, Sandy, you have Owen Thomas and MK. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings, you have Mary Totoro and Owen. Um, Councilmember Matthews, you have um, Mary Totoro and MK. And, um, you already said it, Vice Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings, you have Mary Totoro and Owen. Uh, Mayor Watkins, you have Mary Totoro and MK. Councilmember Totoro and MK. Is that right? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, Councilmember Glover, you have Owen Thomas and MK. And then Sandy So Mary Totoro is reappointed, and we have a tie for Owen. Okay. <laughs> we'll go around one more time. Hold on one second. Okay. That's what I had. I had um, MK oh, with five okay. and the other mm -hmm. two with right. four. Right, that's what I had. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mary Tataro and MK. Okay. Okay, great. And so MK would have the uh, appointment to 2020, correct? All right. We have a discrepancy. <laughs> okay. I had four for Tartaro, four for... Thomas and five for Venegas. That's what I have too. Yeah, which totaled up to 14, which was So there would be each. one more vote if that is indeed the case. <laughs> for the last For the last one, yeah, right. okay. Right. <coughs> do, we, do we have what we need or we need to? No, there's one more tie. Oh, there's yeah, one, one more tie. tie between, between Owen Thomas and Mary Tataro. Okay. We'll do another round. MK. That's Owen. MK's Owen, 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 and Owen and Mary. Mary. Um, Owen and Owen Mary. Mary. No, no, no. One. Yeah, only one vote now. You either get one between, between Owen and Mary. Mary. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Owen. Oh, my turn? Yeah. Uh, Mary. Owen. Mary. 
Mary. Owen. Owen. Okay. Still on Mr. Flynn. Okay. There's no one at all. <laughs> now you see what I mean. <laughs> it's right. always hard. Okay. <laughs> so can I just can I just clarify that it was Janina, Owen, and MK that were the finalists? And Sean. And Sean, yeah. Cool. Thank you. So next we have the uh, Board of Building and Fire Appeals. And there are six possible reappointments with terms expiring January 1st, 2023. And nominations can come from Councilmember Matthews. Oh, I get the easy one. I <laughs> nominate the whole slate. <laughs> okay. Any additional nominations? I don't think we can. Uh, exactly. Okay, so I think <laughs> we're uh, there. Um, <coughs> we need a motion by to- consensus. By consensus, do we accept the six? Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Next, we have the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, please. Mr. Request, if we could slow down sure. for the <laughs> nomination vote. Can I ask a clarifying question? Absolutely. For the um, Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, are we continuing with the procedure? Sorry, procedure for the, there are, I, my understanding is we each have. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Correct. I will ask uh, those who have uh, openings if they want to state their nomination. Okay. And then we will go through and um, accept, confirm. confirm the nominations. For the, for the, for the commission. And alone one. Mm -hmm. So you have three of the nominees for the new council members and then one vacancy that you would do the nomination selection for. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so at this time, Councilmember Brown, you have a nomination with a term expiring on January 1st, 2021. You will have an opening. Yeah. Councilmember Glover, Myers, and Vice Mayor Cummings also um, have nominations for direct appointments. So I'll begin with Councilmember Glover. Can I have your nomination? I'd like to nominate Krishna Lakhine Williamson. Councilmember Myers? I'd like to nominate Brooke Newman. Councilmember Brown? Okay. Um, Ann Simonson. And Vice Mayor. Um, I would just like to ask, and I know that there's a lot of people who have been interested in this um, appointment, but uh, given the number of applicants and um, um, the charge of this commission, I would want to see if we can maybe extend the application process and allow for more members of the community to apply to this position. For the Under your direct appointment. Yes. Okay, no problem. So then we'll confirm the three with one vacancy, correct? Okay. Oh, so you mean leave? Leave Vice Mayor Cummings would like to leave his nomination open for more applicants Defer to it. apply. Defer, Defer. thank you. Okay. So uh, we have uh, Councilmember Glover nominating Krishna. Um, Councilmember Myers <coughs> nominating Brooke and uh, Councilmember Brown nominating Ann. So, so I will move so uh, approval of um, those who've been um, nominated by the respective council members deferring the decision on Councilmember Cummings. Motion by Councilmember. Second. Okay. Uh, second by Councilmember Glover. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Great. Okay. Now we have um, our downtown commission. <coughs> so there's one possible reappointment and one vacancy, and both of the terms will be expiring on January 1st, 2023. So starting with uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, may I have your nominations? Can I just clarify? I, I, my understanding is there are two vacancies now with the withdrawal of, um, or the not res res initial resignation that we received? Or I think there's one reappointment request and one vacancy one request. Vacancy. So there are two openings oh, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this just one or? One vacancy and one person seeking reappointment. And the, the uh, Matt Farrell is the, uh, in, is the individual interested in reappointment. Gotcha. Sorry. No problem. No problem. So you'll have an opportunity to nominate uh, two people. Uh, nominate Matt Farrell for reappointment and Brett Garrett. Okay. And I will nominate, in addition, Linnea Holters. 
my nominations have been made. Yeah, nothing to add. Yeah, mine too. Okay. Additional nominations. And additional nominations, Council Member. Okay. So um, we'll start with the top two, beginning with Vice Mayor Cummings. Uh, my top two selection will be Matt Farrell and Brett Garrett. Okay. I uh, am Matt and Linnea. I'm Matt and Linnea. I'm Brett and Linnea. Matt and Brett. Mr. Brown? Um, Matt Farrell and Brett Garrett. Matt and Linnea. We have a tie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who is the tie between? Um, Linnea and Brett Garrett. Okay. And Matt's appointed. So Matt would be reappointed. And now we'll take another vote for <coughs> between Brett Garrett and Linnea Holchers. And we'll begin with you, Vice Mayor Cummings. Uh, Brett Garrett. Okay. Linnea Holchers. Linnea Holchers. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Brett Garrett. Brett Garrett. <coughs> Linnea. Brett Garrett. Okay. okay, we will now move on to the Historic Preservation Commission. And there is one possible reappointment with a term expiration of January 1st, 2023 and one vacancy with a term expiring on January 1st, 2021. And I will start with nominations from Councilmember Myers. I would like to nominate uh, Tracy Bliss and uh, William Schultz. Okay. Um, Ross Eric Gibson. Okay. Any additional names? Nothing. Any additions on this side? We make comments. <laughs> I wish I had made comments. <laughs> Previously, my nomination has been made, but um, I think it's important to look at the full range of talents that are represented on the commission. And uh, uh, Tracy's a known historian, uh, Jill Michaelak, who serves on the committee already, is a, a solid local historian. Ross also is known in that field, but I think what we're lacking now is someone who has kind of that direct, we, we have people, um, who have experience in historic preservation policy, but I think what we're lacking is someone who has that kind of um, practical uh, experience of what it means to do historic preservation in the field, in the community. And Bill Schultz, as a local contractor, I think brings that to the mix. Once, any additional comments before we go through? Okay, so we'll uh, go through starting with our top two and beginning with Council Member Myers. Uh, I, my vote's for Tracy Bliss and Bill Schultz. Glover? Tracy Bliss and Ross Eric Gibson. Tracy Bliss and Ross Gibson. Tracy Bliss and Ross Gibson. Um, Bliss and Schultz. Bliss and Gibson. And I am Blitz and Schultz. So it's Bliss and Gibson. Okay. Great. All right. So did you say it was Bliss and Gibson? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay, Mayor, if I can just say, since yeah. we're moving on to the Parks and Rec Commission item, we did have another, um, we have another vacancy that we will put on the agenda for next um, meeting for the 12th. Okay. Um, so just okay. something to keep in mind. We will okay. use these same applications for that appointment. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, so for um, Parks and Recreation Commission, so what we're discussing today is uh, one possible reappointment and one vacancy with both terms expiring January 1st, 2023. And I will begin with nominations from Councilmember Glover. Altaria Hatton and John Scott Norris. Okay. Julian Greenside. John? Nothing to add. Matthews? Uh, Maggie Duncan Merrill uh, for reappointment and Ron Goodman. Thanks. No further appointments. And I would add uh, Rena Dubin. Uh, my my appointments have uh, actually I will. Um, did you nominate Goodman? Yeah. Okay. That might have been might have been uh, made. Okay. <coughs> so um, we'll go through with uh, Councilmember Glover listing the two. Altaria Hatton and Don Scott Norris. McCrum. Julian Greensight and um, Don Shot Norris. Julian Greensight and Don Shot Norris. Uh, Matthews. Maggie Duncan Merrill and Ron Goodman. Okay. I'll Tyra Hatton and Julian Greensight. Maggie Dunton Merrill and Ron Goodman. I Maggie Duncan Merrill and Ron Goodman. Tie. Four-way tie. Four-way tie. Mm -hmm. So that Maggie Duncan Merrill, um, Ron Goodman, Julian Greensight, and John Norris. Okay. So we'll go through again. <laughs> okay. And we'll start with uh, Council Member Clover. Top two. Top two. Don Scott Norris and Jillian Greensight. Don Shot Norris and Jillian Greensight. Don Shot Norris and Jillian Greensight. <laughs> Maggie Duncan Merrill and Ron Goodman. Um, Greensight and Norris. Ron Goodman and Maggie. Goodman and Duncan Merrill. Sorry, um, Mayor Watkins, who are your two? Maggie Duncan Merrill and Ron Goodman. Uh, uh, Duncan Merrill and Goodman. <laughs> Julian Greensight and Don Scott Norris. So we'll move on to the Planning Commission. At this time, I will start with nominations from Councilmember Crone, and there are two vacancies, and they both have terms expiring on January 1st, 2023. We're starting with it's Planning Commission? Planning Commission, two nominations. Yes, um, I would like to nominate Andy Schifrin and uh, Miriam Greenberg. Nothing to add. Matthews? Uh, Mike Silvey, please. Nothing yet. Rena Dubin would be mine. My might have been added. Okay. Okay. With the nominees, um, we'll start with the top two. Councilmember well, Crone. Oh, sorry. Councilmember Glover hasn't. Oh, apologies. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, nothing to add. Okay. Uh, Miriam Greenberg and Andy Schifrin for Planning Commission. <laughs> Miriam Greenberg and Andy Schifrin. Uh, Schifrin and Sylvie. Schifrin and Greenberg. Schifrin and Dubin. 
Schifrin and Sylvie. Schifrin and Greenberg. And it's Schifrin and Greenberg. Okay. So at this time we have the Sisters Cities Committee. We have five vacancies, three with term expirations of January 1st, 2023, one with a term expiration of January 1st, 2022, and one with a term expiration of January 1st, 2020. As a reminder, the appointees with the least amount of votes will receive the shorter term. And at this point, may I begin again with nominations from Councilmember Brown. Brown? Brown. Oh, did I mean? Nominated the first. I, I, I don't think that, that Councilmember Glover got to nominate. Yeah, you nominated. I think, I think it's good. Yeah. We're just rotating through. We're back to you, Councilmember Brown. Again, um, qualified folks, and I'm just trying to review my notes here. Um, so, Dennis Etler, Andre Kitkev. I'm not doing these in particular order, sorry. One, one by one. Okay, so Mar Marta Beckwith, Chandra Duffy, Dennis Etler, Andre Kitkev, and Wood. I'm sorry, the last one. Oh, Anita Wood. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. Any uh, additions, Councilmember Matthews? Yes. Um, it, I'm not sure exactly who's been nominated when by, uh, but Isabel Tunser and Anita Wood. Could you repeat the list of people who've been nominated mm -hmm. currently? We have Marta Beckwith, Chandra Duffy, Dennis Etler, Andre Kitkov, Kit mm -hmm. Isabel Tenser, and Anita Wood. Are there any additional nominees? I don't think so at this time. I don't have any additional nominees. I don't either. No additional nominations. Um, Etler, Kitkov, Tunker and Wood all were nominated, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. So going back to Councilmember Brown. Mm -hmm. So quickly. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay. So Marta back with Dennis Etler, Andre Kitkev, Isabel Tunser, and Anita Wood. Mm -hmm. so um, Marta Beckwith, Chandra Duffy, um, Andre Kitkef, Isabel Tunser, and Anita Wood. Chandra Duffy, Dennis Etler, Isabel Tunser, Anita Wood, and Mark the Beckwith. Marta Mart Beckwith, Chandra Duffy, Andrew Kitkev, Kitkev, Isabel Tenser, and Anita Wood. Uh, Marta Beck, are you ready? Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Marta Beckwith, Chandra Duffy, Andre Kitkev, Isabel Tenser, and Anita Wood. Marta Beck, oh, sorry. Oh, wait. You're good? All right. Marta Beckwith, Dennis Etler, Andre Kitkev, Isabel Tunser, Anita Wood. Beckwith, Edler, Kiktev, Tunser, and Wood. I, I would like to um, make a suggestion. Um, Chandra Duffy is the one who's asked for reappointment. She's been of all of them, the most involved for several years on the Sister Cities Committee has been invaluable. And I would just put it out there if someone wants to add a vote. Pardon? Um, she lives outside of the city limits. She's but she not, is. She's not on the committee. Last year, she was nominated. Oh, excuse me. I, right. I understand that. <laughs> she is not up for reappointment, but she's been. She's been active for a long time, waiting for an out of city slot to come up. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I just put it out there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do 
Do we know what the tally is at this point? So we have Marta Beckwith, Isabel Tensor, and Anita Wood with terms expiring in 2023. Ray Kuchev with a term expiring in 2022. We have a tie between Chandra Duffy and so um, we'll go through between those two, mm -hmm. say the one uh, choice, and we'll start with Councilmember Brown. Chandra Duffy. 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 Etler. Etler. All right. So we will move right along to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. And there is one possible reappointment with a term expiration of January 1st, 2023, and one vacancy with a term expiring on January 1st, 2021. And may I please have nominations starting with Councilmember Matthews. Uh, Phil Boutel and Sean Orgel Olson. Okay. Vice Mayor Cummings. No further suggestions. No further suggestions. I'd like to add uh, Bruce Sawhill, please. Dana Bagshaw and Steve Schnarr. No further suggestions. Any additional suggestions? No further suggestions. Okay. Back to Councilmember Matthews for Boutel and Orgel Olson. Boutel and o Orgel Olson. Same for me. Same for me. Mm. Bagshaw and Snyder. First one? Bagshaw. Bagshaw. Dana Bagshaw. Uh, Phil Boutel and uh, Sean Orgel Olson. So it's Phil Boutel and Sean. Oh, I, I got, oh sorry, about that. sorry. Um, Dana Bagshaw and Phil Boutel. So it's Phil Boutel with the longer term and Sean Orgel Olson. The last, but certainly not least, is our Water Commission. And we have one vacancy with a term expiration of January 1st, 2023. And I will start with nominations from Vice Mayor Cummings, correct? Mm -hmm. Sierra Ryan. I have no addition. No addition. No addition. Acclamation. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, okay. Well, thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, Council, for going through that process. It's never easy when we have such a committed community willing to step up and serve. So I want to thank all of our applicants for their willingness to serve. You make our jobs very difficult. <laughs> um, at this time, we have about, oh, maybe five minutes. We'll take a quick break and return at 3.30 for our time certain agenda item um, in regards to the ADUs. Oh, wow, look at that. Wow. Yeah. Affecting it government. Is <laughs>
Okay. Okay, we'll reconvene now. Um, so now we will begin at the um, public hearing, which is item number 23. And as a reminder, uh, the order will be a staff presentation and that will be followed by questions of staff from the council. We will then open it up to public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. And I will go ahead and turn it over to staff. Thank you, Mayor Watkins and council members. I'm Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development here. And um, we're very pleased to be presenting this to you today. Um, the uh, city embarked on a significant outreach effort in 2017, and that culminated, culminated in a series of recommendations that um, were then prioritized last year by the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee that consisted of uh, Councilmember Brown, um, then Councilmember Watkins, and um, Councilmember Chase, and <clears throat> then Councilmember Chase, I should say. And um, the facilitation of ADUs was one of the top priorities from that, that exercise. Um, Specifically, the community readiness um, scoring was particularly high for these particular changes. And we went through some specifics and we had an opportunity to um, really vet a lot of the proposed changes with the community. And we're pleased to be uh, presenting these changes uh, to the council today. The, uh, the city has long been recognized as a leader in its accessory dwelling unit policies. Um, back in the early 2000s, the city uh, received national recognition for some of the um, policies and programs that we had in place. And while all of the changes that we have before you tonight are not groundbreaking, we do have some very progressive policies here. For example, our allowances for categorizing ADUs into conversion ADUs, which offer a, a number of benefits. And so, um, we're going to go through uh, the proposed changes and we um, will uh, try to tackle those in an organized manner. It's a uh, fairly detailed topic and <laughs> as you all know in having reviewed the material, um, but for the benefit of the public, we do wanna um, go through some of those changes briefly and if the council needs any more details, then feel free to stop us and ask. And so with that, I will turn it over to Sarah Fleming and Sarah Noisy, our senior planner and principal planner in advanced planning. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, it's been a bit of a process getting here and I'm just so excited to finally get to present this material that we've been working with the community to create for the past several months. I'd also like to thank the community members that were able to make it today and have stuck through um, this process as it has um, had some, um, hit some challenges along the path. So we'll get started with a little bit of background. As Lee mentioned, um, the city of Santa Cruz has had an award-winning program for ADUs. Um, we were um, rec recognized nationally shortly after the amendments um, were made in 2003. Our first ordinance came into place in 1983 following the first state law that um, created at the time what were called second units. We've also done amendments recently in 2008, 2012, 2015, and then in 2016 in response, in 2016 in response to um, state legislation. All those other times, those were um, locally initiated uh, amendments to our code. These prototype plans that you see here um, were released in 2003 and certainly generated a lot of um, publicity for the program and interest from local residents. Um, so also, as uh, the planning director mentioned, the majority of the proposals that are included with today's ordinance um, amendments are come from the um, housing blueprint subcommittee <coughs> recommendations. So these are recommendations that were generated out in the community and heard during the housing voices process and then prioritized by the subcommittee as um, objectives that we should be pursuing. And then I'd just also like to highlight this comes, this chart comes from um, a white paper by the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership about affordable housing. So policy changes that really could really improve affordable housing in the Monterey Bay region it was published January of last year. And it identifies ADUs as um, 
having a significant effect on the affordability of housing in a, in a region. And so we do feel like the, um, the direction that came out of the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee was well-founded in evidence. Um, and the community is also um, aware of that and, and supportive. So the community outreach that we've done on these proposals um, in sort of a variety of uh, Iteration. So, so our earliest uh, our earliest community outreach was in March of 2015. Um, we were this, the accessory dwelling unit proposals were part of a larger uh, community meeting focused on the housing blueprint. Um, and as you can see here with the green dots, uh, please don't try to read what it says on the um, on the boards. The pictures are far too small for that. But you can see that in general, there was overwhelming support for a lot of these proposals. There are a few here that we can clearly identify as being more controversial, and we see more red dots on the um, on the boards. And we will; those are issues about um, short-term rentals, about removing owner occupancy, and about parking requirements. And legitimately, there is community concern and interest in those issues. So we'll get to that. Um, in July, we discussed ADUs with the community um, at an informational meeting about the work that was happening in the advanced planning section at the time. And um, we did take a, a, a small amount of input at that meeting, but more, more than anything, we were trying to get help people be aware of what the work that we were doing and how they could be engaged in the process moving forward. Um, at that time, you know, we were hearing concerns about just cause eviction. And then again, we heard more concerns about parking and owner occupancy, the owner occupancy requirement on both sides, um, talking about the desire to legalize existing structures and then some also some specific questions about fire sprinklers and then we had some recommendations about how we can um, reach out to the community in the future once we have new codes in place and sort of strengthen our um, the program of ADUs rather than the policy and regulations of ADUs. So then once we had drafted specific language um, for the ordinance, we held a community meeting and September of last year, there was an open house focusing on um, soliciting written comments from the community. And um, we really wanted people to explain why one of the policy proposals was right or wrong for Santa Cruz or right or wrong for their neighborhood or for their parcel. And we got extremely thoughtful and detailed comments. I hope you've all had a chance to read through the comments we got. At that meeting alone, we've, we received over 100 comments. We've since then received another probably 200 pages of comments that represent probably, you know, 175 individual comments from folks. So um, the community has been very engaged and overwhelmingly these folks are supportive of the of most of these proposals. And there are a few that are controversial and we'll get to those shortly. So since that time, since that last community meeting, um, I've been doing my best to keep folks <laughs> up to date via email. I'm sure there are some people who are ready to block my email address because I keep writing saying, we got postponed again. Um, and yet here we are. So the last time I was happy to be able to email them and tell them we had a time certain, which guaranteed we would be heard today. So um, we've also been keeping our information on the website up to date. And then um, I also drafted a, um, a summary of all the proposals and really put them in lay, lay terms and set them in the context of what was the, um, the status quo, because there was some sort of information that was flying around about how, what, what sub, the, the degree to which we are proposing changes that was a little bit inaccurate based on not understanding where the status quo was at the time. So I believe that was very helpful to folks. So here we go, into the policy proposals. I've broken these down into three categories in the same manner that they are broken down in the staff report. Um, and we'll go through them one by one. So category one is are things that are required by the state law. Category two will be our land use policy proposals, or I'm sorry, category two is our site standard, development standard proposals, which are more sort of specific zoning standards. And then category three are the larger, bigger picture land use proposals about how we choose to use land and what our values are as a community in terms of um, creating housing and balancing competing needs. So category one, changes that are required by state law. Um, we are required to remove um, our current standard re that requires um, a parking space be created for an attached ADU. So that's an ADU that's either attached to the home, attached to a garage, attached to another legal structure on the property. Um, state law preempts us in that arena. There's an asterisk there because our current proposal is actually to go a bit further than that, but we'll discuss that piece later under land use proposals. Um, we are also required to remove the minimum parcel size. So currently we limit um, ADUs to being on parcels that are 4,500 square feet or larger. We can no longer maintain that requirement. Um, we also need to allow ADUs to be built by right, which means they only need to apply for a 
um, a building permit. There's no zoning permit. There's no planning design review in all zones that allow residential use when they are built on the same parcel with an existing or proposed single family home. So there were a few multifamily zone districts where we had not previously allowed the creation of ADUs and we are adding those um, <laughs> to the list of zones where you can create an ADU with a single family home. Um, we are removing requirements for use permit and public hearings. So um, the current code only requ requires um, a design permit and a public hearing for um, ADUs when they're built on substandard parcels. The substandard parcel is one that is narrower than 50 feet wide or smaller than is required for the, by the zone district. And um, because we are not allowed to um, apply any discretion to ADUs, or we have to have a ministerial process, we can't hold public hearings and um, require use permits. So we're removing that standard that applied to, those, to that subset of ADUs. And then finally, um, we are, this one's a little complicated, I'm sorry. So currently, the, so the state law in 2016 created an allowance for ADUs that are built above garages. It said that the setbacks for an ADU above a garage, we can't require anything more than five feet from the side and rear. Um, at the time, we, the way we wrote that into our code was that we set a date and we said if your garage was built before the date of this state law, you can take advantage of five feet side and rear. If your garage is built after this date, you have to meet our setbacks for a two-story structure, which would be five feet from the side and 10 feet from the rear, typically. Um, our attorney disagrees with that interpretation, and so we are taking removing the date. So any garage built at any time, an ADU built on the second story above that would be eligible for these five-foot side and rear setbacks. So category two, site and building standards. So these are the specific zoning standards um, that apply to development on a parcel. So the proposal is to, um, the first proposal is to increase the allowable rear yard lot coverage from 30% to 50%. So currently the code um, for all resident, all single family home development allows no more than, that no more than 30% of that rear yard lot area be covered. The rear yard lot area is the area that is the width of the lot and the depth of the required setback for the primary structure. So um, on a residential parcel, so the, the setback for the primary home. So for example, an R15 parcel, so single family, 5,000 square foot, typical um, parcel size, that setback is 20 feet. So a typical R15 lot is 50 feet wide by 100 feet deep. So that rear yard setback area is an area that is um, 50 feet long and 20 feet deep. That's the rear yard setback area. And our code requires that no more than 30% of that area be covered by structures. And what we're proposing is that um, when there's a detached ADU proposed on the parcel that we allow them to increase that coverage area to 50%. Um, we're also um, proposing to change the way that we define what a conversion ADU is. So um, the planning director mentioned that conversion ADUs were creating category for that in our code. That's in response to some of the state law provisions of um, 2016 and 2017 that really carve out a special category of ADUs when they're created from any existing legal structure that says they do not have to pay certain fees and they do not have to meet our zoning site standards. So if we're, if there's already a structure in place that may exceed um, some zoning standard, if they wanna convert that to an ADU, then we must permit them to do that so long as they can bring that um, structure into conformance with, our, with the building code. So um, we're actually recommending that we go one step further to update the definition to allow the full reconstruction of those structures and also to allow modest expansions. So currently, we only allow folks to reconstruct 50% of a structure in order to, um, to still qualify as a conversion ADU as using an existing structure. The challenge that we run into with that particularly arises as we are trying to legalize some of these units that have been created without the benefit of permits. Um, Applicants get into a situation where because the cost benefit of avoiding those connection fees is so large that they are trying to figure out how to build a structure and only change half of it and really they're <coughs> rebuilding the whole thing because it's old, the lumber is potentially substandard and we're trying to figure out ways to accommodate them. We wanna keep these homes on the market and yet we are obligated to make sure it's safe and durable housing that's created. So it's, there are just situations where it would be um, reasonable to allow up to the full reconstruction of a structure within that same footprint. And then additionally, we're also recommending that we allow 
modest expansion, so up to 120 square feet of new floor area to be added to a structure and up to two feet of height. And this, again, is to try to um, facilitate the use of like older structures um, where sort of, you know, the impact to neighbors in terms of, you know, sight lines and um, perception of privacy is already in place to reuse that footprint area to create housing. Um, we think that's a good use of our time and a good use of space in neighborhoods. The third one about changing the green building standards. Um, so Santa Cruz has a green building program that already takes construction, requires that construction meet a higher threshold for green building than um, is required by the state, which is already higher than other states in the, in the nation. And additionally, uh, the standards that are in place today are more energy efficient and more environmentally conscious than um, than were in place when the majority of our housing stock was created over the past decades. So what we're talking about changing here, um, the uh, ADU amendments that came through in, um, I believe, 2015, 2015 or 2016, with the best of intentions, added an additional um, threshold of green building points that were required to create a new ADU. They had to, um, for conversion ADUs, they had to achieve an additional 15 green building points than would be required for other types of residential construction. Um, and for new construction ADUs, they had to meet the threshold for priority processing, which is really a very high threshold. Mm -hmm. And what we heard from the community and what came up through the Housing Voices um, report is that this was really sort of a, a disincentive or, or a challenge for homeowners as they're considering creating one of these for a family member. Um, and we, the, both the um, Housing Blueprint Subcommittee and staff kind of worked internally and discussed, you know, what's the right threshold to set? We set this as one of our priority actions and then staff took it to our green building program and our, um, and our planners. And it seemed that creating parity with the requirements for single family homes just made sense. That's already a very high standard and creating an additional threshold for ADUs just didn't seem to match our priorities of creating housing units and facilitating that process for homeowners. Um, Number four here, changing the ADU size. So currently attached ADUs uh, are subject to two size thresholds and they can be larger than, you know, and it's sort of the smaller of either one applies. So they're either allowed to be up to 10% of the parcel size, which is the size limit otherwise for all ADUs. Also, they could be no, lo no larger than 50% of the size of the primary home. And um, we don't really see a good reason for maintaining that standard. We should just, we're recommending that we allow all ADUs, regardless of how they're constructed, to be the same size limit at 10% of the parcel size. And then finally, this is something that staff heard from, we've heard from a, several different applicants, and it's just a tiny little thing, but um, could create a lot of convenience for folks that are living and using these ADUs. We're proposing to allow interior doors between attached ADUs in the primary home. The classic example of why you would want this is that you have literally your mother-in-law living in the unit and um, she wants to use your laundry room and because we don't allow a door between the units, she has to carry her laundry outside through the rain, <laughs> you know, uphill, whatever, um, and through the front door and into, to use your laundry room. And so we think it's reasonable that compliant with the building code, um, it, we could have a door that connects the two units so they can share facilities, share a garage, share a laundry room, share a storage area, things like that. So category three, land use policies. These are the um, issues that are a bit more um, controversial. I'll go through each of these. I'll have a set of slides about each one. But just really briefly, the overview is that we're considering proposing, um, or I'm sorry, we're proposing allowing two ADUs on certain large lots, allowing temporary short-term rental activity in order to incentivize ADU development, um, eliminating the parking requirement for new construction detached ADUs, and then modifying the definition of owner occupant to include immediate family members. So we'll start with the with policy number one, allowing two ADUs on large lots. So um, we wanted to, in analyzing this, we wanted to sort of um, take a cautious step into this arena. So our suggestion or our initial goal was to sort of identify that largest 10% of parcels. Um, as maybe a good place to start and explore this, uh, this new kind of policy. So what we did here was we mapped all the parcels that would be eligible to create an ADU based on zoning. So this is everything in the city that carries a residential zoning. Yes, including De La Viega Golf Course carries a residential zoning. 
The next cut is to um, identify parcels that are eligible for an ADU based on existing use, because let's remember an ADU has to be built alongside a single family home, either existing or proposed. So this is a map that shows all the parcels that have existing single family dwellings or an existing home and an ADU. And then the next step we took was to um, uh, um, to filter out those that were too small. So we, um, we identified, we did a rough calculation based on our GIS information of the developable area on each parcel. So um, that excludes areas that are in um, floodplains and over 30%. And one other thing that I can never remember, but so there's, there are three factors that determine what's not developable land. So we pull those out and then we look at the size of the parcels and these are the parcels that are over 10,000 square feet. So you can see this is, you know, about 11,000 parcels are eligible for ADUs. And we have about, we have over 1,100. So it's a little bit more than 10%. Um, it's about like 11 and a half percent, I think. Um, parcels that might be eligible to build two ADUs. As you can see, they are in every neighborhood of the city they are concentrated in certain neighborhoods, and that is certainly something for your council to consider. Um, we had a number of comments, um, both from the, during the um, public open house and since then, that have commented that we should actually choose a lower threshold than 10,000 square feet. Um, so we did this same sort of analysis at a couple of different thresholds, and um, those were addressed in this policy <laughs> alternatives attachment. Um, that was attached to the staff report if you wanted to look at how that might impact the number of parcels that would be eligible for this. And um, finally, what we're proposing is that in cases where two ADUs are permitted, um, the size of those ADUs be a total of 10% of the parcel size. So you still get your ADU size and you can decide how to distribute that over two ADUs if you choose to. So, in, so on a 10,000 square foot lot, we wouldn't have two 1,000 square foot ADUs, we would have to 500 or a 600 and 400 or however the homeowner might choose to um, distribute that amount of uh, built square footage. Um, the advantages here, this promotes not only the creation of more housing, but of more small housing, which is really, if, when we look at our numbers, small housing units are what's really missing in our existing market for singles, students, seniors. Um, and so this might be a way of allowing that to happen in some of these neighborhoods where there's potentially space for these other units. So policy two um, about short-term rental activity. So let's just remind ourselves that the short-term rental regulations were finalized in April of 2018 and that properties with ADUs were specifically excluded from being eligible for short-term rentals. Reasonable people might ask why we are now suggesting it, given that we just went through this process and just made a decision about it. Um, it's a very good question to ask. So um, the thinking here, and you know, and again, this comes from, this was an idea we were instructed to explore through the housing blueprint, so that's sort of <coughs> the nexus of us bringing it here. Um, we do think there's some evidence that it could incentivize the creation of these housing units. Once housing units are exist and they're on the ground, they're durable for decades. And so um, the proposal as it's currently drafted would allow a brief period of three years of short-term rental activity for all ADUs that are newly completed as of January 1st of this year. Um, we think this could help some homeowners um, recoup some of their costs. These are very ex um, expensive to build. They're not built by developers, they're built by private homeowners, many of whom have never um, even pulled a building permit before. They've never remodeled their homes. This is their first foray into, um, into building something. And quite frankly, there's a lot of sticker shock involved. I think that typically these cost between 200 dollars and $450,000 to, to create, depending on how they're built and how they're finished and how large they are. Um, and so, um, our thinking is that allowing some period where um, a property owner could, uh, could enjoy a, lar a higher rate of return on their investment might help some people who are cautious or not sure they could afford it without that to come f off the fence and create an ADU, which will then be available in our community after that. And I just, I, um, I found one piece of data on this that I just would like to share with you. Um, when we're talking about ADUs, people like to talk about Portland a lot because they have a very progressive and um, uh, successful ADU program. So the Turner Center for Housing Innovation out of UC Berkeley um, wrote, did a paper that came out in 2017 sort of analyzing um, a bunch of the different reforms that had been implemented in Portland and the effect that those had had on the um, production of ADUs. 
And um, I, I will call your attention to the, the change in 2010, the SDC fee waivers, so SDC are those, um, are their system development charges, so that's most of the development fees that apply to um, residential development in Portland. When they did that fee waiver, there was a bump, an, a, you know, not insignificant bump in production um, from creating that. And then we see that STRs are officially allowed, short-term rentals are officially allowed in ADUs starting in 2014. And the change in production is notable. So we would just offer this as one data point <laughs> that there could be a lot of other things that are going on that are not shown in this graph. There are certainly things in the financial market. There are things in the private sector and the construction trades that are happening in Portland around this time that could also be contributing to this. We certainly don't have every exhaustive piece of information, but I would just offer that this is one of the reasons we're suggesting this. Yes, it's a balance of um, priorities for your council, but I just wanted to provide this piece of information. So number three, um, eliminating parking requirements for detached ADUs. So state law already preempts our ability to require parking in many cases. Any ADU that's attached to another legal structure on the property, any ADU that's created by converting any legal structure on the property, any ADU that's in with, within a half mile of transit, which for our purposes in our code, we define transit as um, the metro station downtown, um, or within one block of a car share parking space or any, U that's late, any ADU that's located in a historic district. So we can't require any parking for all of those ADUs already. We can require um, one space per new construction detached ADU outside of a half mile from the transit center and more than a block from a um, car share vehicle and not in a historic district. So that's the, that's the um, universe that we're sort of discussing here are those ADUs that exist outside of those areas. Um, we currently require one space, and we're suggesting that we remove that requirement and just allow all ADUs to be built without requiring any, any additional off-street parking be created. Public Works um, Department has raised some concerns about that, about overcrowding in certain areas, and specifically during street cleaning and trash removal days, that this might be a challenge for them. Um, we. Um, we also have obviously heard from a number of members of the community about concerns, specific parking concerns in, in their neighborhoods, and obviously this is the kind of policy that would not hit every neighborhood <coughs> in the same way, and there would be a varying impacts in different places. Um, we do, the city does have a residential permit parking program that might be appropriate in some of these neighborhoods, and that, that program is available to any neighborhood that wants to opt in. They need to get 67% of the neighbors to opt in um, on a street segment, and then they can um, enter into the permit parking program. So the last um, land use policy that we're gonna discuss today is about modifying the definition of owner-occupant. So um, all the proposals that I've discussed before this one are really focused on increasing the production of ADUs. We are, I wanna be very transparent that it is our goal to increase production of ADUs, um, increase production of housing in general, and this set of proposals is very focused specifically on increasing production of ADUs. This policy, I don't really see as focused on increasing the production. This is more about a providing an accommodation to our existing um, ADU owners who went through our process of um, get it to get a permit and are now bound by their land use agreement and required to basically live on, on the property um, in perpetuity should they want to maintain the ADU. Um, the concerns that we hear from folks are, you know, these homeowners, they built the ADU and they have one of their children living in it and then the homeowner has to enter assisted living for some unknown amount of time. Um, we have an allowance in our code that gives them up to three years to waive the owner occupancy requirement and then we have, um, we do monitoring on that and we have um, the, the city councils uh, just a few months ago adopted, you know, an afford affordable rent um, requirement associated with that program. Um, but it gives them only three years to sort of resolve whatever may be going on and have either the, you know, family member that's still living on the property be added to the deed, or have the property owner move back onto the property, or then they have to, or their other two options are to sell the property to another owner occupant, or to remove the ADU from the property, which is not an outcome that I think anyone wants to see happen. So um, changing the definition of owner occupant to allow immediate family members, so parents, siblings, spouses, adult children, to take the place of an owner occupant and 
um, maintain that same level of property management, because really this owner occupancy provision is about property management and about maintaining <coughs> responsible tenants in a neighborhood of single family homes. Um, we think that is a reasonable step to take. It's a cautious step. We're not suggesting at this point that we allow grandchildren, cousins, second cousins, you know, we really want to keep this narrow and focused as a first step into this arena. Um, but we do think it creates some flexibility and al will allow properties to be held by local families for a longer period of time and potentially create um, more stability for any tenants that might be living on those properties. If the property owner can move out and have a, one of their adult children move in, the tenant can stay in place. So um, that's, our, that's our reasoning behind this proposal. So, right, and I have this animation. So for example, if Maria here owns the home, then all of these folks are potential eligible owner occupants under this proposed definition. These two guys would be eligible in you know, eight to 10 years when they're adults. Legally, they would be able to take over that responsibility. So those are all, that's all the stuff that's in the proposed ordinance today. And then we have a couple of other sort of informational items that I'll just go through kind of quickly. Um, so some cost savings. We did have some direction in the um, housing blueprint to consider ways to create cost savings for property owners. Um, some, several of the policy changes would create those cost savings or would create some cost savings for, for um, people building ADUs. Removing the parking requirement lowers parking, lowers construction costs. I have um, one applicant who calls me frequently to talk about this and, and her quote to add one parking space to her property was $25,000. So that's, you know, she has to move part of a retaining wall, she has to repave, she has to widen her curb cut, there's permits associated with each of those pieces. It's, you know, it's not a small thing to add a parking space. So changing that standard would um, relieve her of that cost. Um, we made some sort of inter some internal changes to the way that fire sprinklers requirements are are, um, are regulated. That will also lower construction costs. That comes from the state law, and we've just applied it in a little bit more of a broad way um, recently through a policy change. Um, expanding the definition of conversion ADUs will allow more ADUs to qualify for those fee waivers, which is a savings of um, eighty about between eighty two and eighty four thousand dollars. Or I'm sorry, eighty two and eighty four hundred dollars. Pardon me. <laughs> don't get don't get that excited. <laughs> um, and then finally, also removing that use permit and public hearing requirements um, will lower the costs and the timeline um, for folks. So public hearing, uh, app, a public hearing application, I think, is about like twenty three hundred dollars, twenty four hundred dollars um, to cover staff time and, and noticing. So um, that would be another you know, savings for some folks. And then also, finally, included with your package today um, is, an, is a resolution that would <laughs> lower the general plan maintenance fee by 50% for ADU permits. And um, just to offer some perspective, that's not a huge savings. It's something we're able to do right now, um, but it's you know, between $450 and $750 for a typical ADU applicant. Um, <coughs> there would be you know, a, a resulting reduction in contributions to the city's general fund, but we think it's um, a worthwhile contribution. It's you know, between $15,000 and $35,000, depending on how many ADUs are constructed in a given year. So um, lastly, we were hoping to get some discussion and direction from your council about the question of lifting owner occupancy, um, either in exchange for an affordability commitment from the property owner or simply lifting the, um, the requirement wholesale. We were, again, this comes out of the housing blueprint subcommittee recommendations was to explore this. And um, we explored it and we came up with um, a proposal which we then took to the public workshop in September. And what we heard back from folks who were had recently built ADUs or were in the process or were considering building ADUs is that the proposal we had come up with was not at all going to create any housing, any affordable housing. Um, it was, you know, we, what we were recommending was that, um, you know, we require that the, the unit be rented at, um, the very low, or I'm sorry, yes, the very low income rate at 50%. And um, the rents that you're allowed to receive for that are so low that no one would be able to cover their costs of construction because costs of construction are high, as we've mentioned. Um, so 
it just became clear that we weren't gonna be able to solve that issue in, a, in addition to solving all the other issues that we, I think, did solve pretty well um, at, at the same time. So we sort of set that aside, we made this a discussion item, and I do think this is an issue, there are pros and cons to changing the um, owner occupancy requirement. <coughs> pros, it keeps rentals on the market, it eliminates the incentive to build without permits. I mean, this is something that I heard from a few folks who had permits is that <laughs> they wouldn't recommend that people get them because we have this legalization program that allows you to be non-owner occupied and allows you to accept a Section 8 housing voucher, which allows you to collect essentially fair market rent. So you could get, get 18, I think I put the number in the staff report, it's like 1850 about for a one bedroom apartment, whereas the affordable rent that we would require people charge was like $750. It's a very, I mean, it's a big difference. So, um, you know, I was talking to one gentleman who had this, who has his ADU, has had it for 15 years, and he was just adamant that he would not recommend people get permits because we always come back and give leniency to people who haven't gotten permits because we're so interested in keeping housing on the market. So. We're trying to create some parity there. I think that's a reason, that's a worthy goal to try to create parity between people who got the permits we want them to get and people who are providing housing but not getting permits. So, you know, we want all of those housing units on the market. Um, so another pro, increases the number of units rented because you could allow both the house and the ADU to be rented if the owner wanted to move out of town for a while. It could increase the production of housing units and create flexibility for owners. Again, this is about allowing people to be able to move off site, hold, continue to hold the property, things like that. So that said, obviously there are cons to this. You know, one of the primary ones that I was concerned about was about um, creating speculation among our, in our already tight and competitive single family home market, particularly at that lower end of single family homes <laughs> that might be available to first time <coughs> buyers. If we just wholesale lift <coughs> owner occupancy with no conditions, I mean, those could just all be purchased by corporations. They put in an ADU, they rent it, you know, with a Section 8 voucher, and like, it just gets, it becomes impossible to buy into the housing market. So um, I am very concerned about that. There are also obviously for neighbors property management concerns and then implications for the stability of a neighborhood and the character of the neighborhood. That said, I think there are solutions to many of those challenges, and I think it's a conversation that the community would like to have. So what we're um, requesting at this point is simply direction from the city council. Should we pursue this with the community? Should we do our research and look at these other cities who don't have owner occupancy requirements and see how it's going for them and discuss that with the community and come up with some kind of recommendation? I mean, there are options we could pursue. Um, maybe there's a period of owner occupancy required. Maybe we require it for five or 10 years. And then after that point, then we allow people to you know, move off the property and rent both units. Maybe there's, you know, there are a whole host of solutions I think we could explore. And so that's really what we're hoping to hear from you today. Should we continue exploring that or is it just a complete non-starter and we should save our efforts for other things? So after today's um, city council meeting, next steps, um, what's not shown here is there will be a second reading. Um, should something get approved today, <laughs> um, there would be a second reading of that ordinance. Following that second reading, we would take it Oh, I didn't update the dates on this, sorry. We'll take it to the first available meeting of the Coastal Commission after um, February of 2019. Um, and then mid to late 2019, we'll be back with um, some policy items about junior ADUs and other um, sort of small alternative housing types, sort of trying to make sure we have the right mix of options in our code. We're also gonna be doing further work on lowering fees and costs, so both um, lowering costs through looking at what is required in, when you're building an ADU and then lowering fees specifically, um, maybe on certain types of ADUs, certain fees aren't required, um, things like that. And then if directed, we would then also be um, looking to bring back the owner occupancy research and item. So this is our formal recommendation. You can read it on your staff report. I won't reiterate it. <laughs> um, and then this is more of a suggestion than a recommendation, but for ease of discussion, your council may wish to break the motion into separate sections. The Planning Commission did this and it worked pretty well. So look at the state law amendments and make a motion and take a vote. Look at the site standard amendments, take a vote. Land use amendments, take a vote. Um, and then do the resolutions at the end and then the, or, uh, I'm sorry, do the resolutions and then the discussion of owner occupancy at the end. Just um, 
that's our suggestion in terms of how you might frame your conversation this afternoon. So, that took a long time. <laughs> We're ready for any questions. <laughs> well, thank you for your presentation and for your patience with this item, along with the community members who've been tracking it. I know it's, I think this is the fourth time it's been brought before us. So I, I just wanna thank you for um, your patience with us and for being here today. At this time, I'd like to ask the council if there are any questions. I know this is a very um, dense item with a lot of components. Um, so I will open it up to questions and then after we conclude the questions, I will open it up to public comment and then back to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, questions from council members? I just have a couple. Okay. Does anybody else have any? I do, but after you. Um, you might have mentioned this, but I'm just curious, how many ADUs do we have right now in the city? We currently have um, just over 450, I'd say before, between 450 and 475 that are existing with permits. Okay. We also, um, based on assessor's use data and our um, code enforcement database, we have a, a, around another 400 that exist without permits <laughs> that are currently um, on deck to work their way through our legalization program. Okay. And you mentioned um, one of the state laws that we would need to come into compliance with was the garage on the second story setback. But I'm not seeing that in our materials. Is that, is that, is that did I capture that correctly? I just, I uh, didn't well, quite so let me just, that when you um, just. So let me ask you, did you, um, did you pull the staff report from a prior agenda or did you pull it from today's agenda? Uh, it was whatever was in our binder as of last Friday. So, okay, if, it, if, okay, then it's, um, somehow page numbers got lost on this, I apologize, but it's sure. at the bottom of page three under, you know, state law requirements, and then it says E, allow all AD ADUs built above garages to reduce side okay. and rear Great. setbacks. That's all I need, I just yeah. wanted to, I'll read it. Thank okay. you. Um, those are, yeah, those are the ones I had for clarification. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Excuse me. Additional questions, Councilmember Brown? My question is actually about something that is not in these recommendations, so I'll wait until. Councilman McGlover? Just a clarifying question. With the development of ADUs, do they count towards our arena development goals? Yes. And then is there a difference in the marker rate ADU development to the affordable rate development of ADUs and per pertaining to the arena goals? Yes, so if an ADU is developed and it carries a deed restriction for affordability, um, currently the only way that happens is via our fee waiver program, which requires that, that those units be restricted to low or very low income, which is, so low income per the city's definition is set at 60%, a household earning 60% of the area median income, and very low is set um, at a household earning or 30%? I believe it's 50. Okay, earning 50%. Let's go with 50. Um, and so it, it, those are counted in those categories as, as per, their, per their deed restriction. Otherwise, other ADUs that are created um, based on the size are either counted as market rate or, or moderate income housing. Just simply based on being smaller, we know that they rent for just a little less than like, I mean, less than a single family home would rent for, so. And then just with, uh, I really appreciate the slide that you showed about the uh, Portland switch when that development really took a, uh, an increase. My question there is, were there any other policies associated with that um, allowance of the short-term rentals that required affordability or was that just, because I'm also concerned with just allowing short-term uh, rentals that it would then restrict for three years potential housing and then they would go back on the market as a uh, market rate instead of affordable. So Portland doesn't restrict them based on affordability. They actually have a really just liberal wide open policy right now. So the one, the one difference between if you're building it as a short term rental versus building it for long term housing is that um, that fee waiver program, they have that SDC fee waiver. That fee waiver only applies if you're building for long term housing. And if you're building for the stated purpose of doing a short term rental, um, you have to pay the fees. So that's sort of the only distinction they make. I imagine there's some way that they capture folks that do one and then the other and want to maintain both, but um, I don't know all the details of their program, but they don't have any um, restriction on affordability. 
Um, so uh, the development standard B on the staff report, but specifically talking about the green building requirements. Uh -huh. So just for people that may not be familiar with it, can you explain the point system? Because it's my understanding that it would make up a 15 point difference um, as opposed to what's currently required. It would reduce that by uh, 15 points. So just what does that look like with regards to green building requirements? Does that mean less solar panels, less water conservation? Yeah, so um, so the way that points are assigned um, through the green building program is um, based on the size, based on the square footage of development, they're, they generate um, a, um, they generate a point total. And I think, and the numbers that I have given you about like, you know, a, um, a single family home is required to get 20, an ADU, um, conversion ADU has to get 35, and new construction has to get 45, those are the minimums. Mm. So based on um, square footage size, those numbers could would scale up. But um, every, there are just the whole, there's a whole catalog of green building options that someone could add to their property. They could build a greenhouse with recycled windows. They could choose an extremely efficient water heater. They could put on solar panels. They could put on more solar panels. They could, you know, insulate to a higher degree. They could put in different windows. They could replace windows in the main house. You know, there's just, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into that. And um, what we're recommending is that the already high standard that applies to single family homes is sufficient for ADUs. And that the, the additional point value that was being required of ADUs was um, inhibiting construction. And so that's really what we're, um, what we're talking about. We're still gonna be building really green buildings. Everything new that is built is gonna be greener than anything that was built 20 years ago, which our install base, our existing housing stock is much older than that. So. Um, we felt like this was a fair place to land to sort of balance those goals of ecological consciousness and the need to create housing. And as you might know, I'm a big stickler for the environment, but also for affordable housing. So do you think it's feasible to provide that 15 point exemption for green building standards with the requirement of affordability on the unit? I mean, we always need to sort of think about balancing these, um, balancing these different standards. I mean, I think that would, it would depend on um, the level of affordability that we require, you know, because there are costs associated with green building sometimes, um, and there are foregone, um, you know, income opportunities associated with choosing to rent afford at an affordable rate. Um, that's something your council is gonna have to balance in terms of what are the values and what's the priority. Anything to add? No, I would agree with that. It really is going to, uh, I think, a, a big impact will be if you do decide to go in that direction where you set that affordability level. Because as we heard before, in some instances, um, that affordability level has um, been a disincentive when tied to other to other things for, for uh, people who are looking to build. And if they can't make it pencil, then they're, they're probably not gonna build the units. So we have to ask ourselves, or the council has to ask ourselves, but we have to ask ourselves as a city, where, are, where, where do our values lie in terms of making that decision? Good choice of words. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you for the presentation, uh, Sarah. Um, and also for the patience, because this is the third time around, I guess, or maybe more. Fourth. Um, I, I like that, <laughs> that last one, where do our values lie? And I, I just wanna say, um, I think keeping families intact and keeping them in Santa Cruz are, are really important in all of this and giving people better opportunities, more opportunities to stay here. And I just would like council to reflect on what we're doing here. I've ne this is amazingly complex stuff, um, looking through all these. Uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of issues come before council before. There's a lot in this document and I, I just, I. Um, my hat's off to you for, for taking it on. Um, my main issues are about parking, owner occupancy, uh, fees and fee waivers, um, like the conversion a, uh, ADUs that you're talking about, and um, again, giving uh, folks uh, a hand up, a loan program. If, there's, if, if you know, and you, you put up that one slide with had about 12 cities who um, currently, uh, have have lifted the, or maybe it was eight cities, the owner occupancy. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you've done any other um, 
homework or, or investigation into uh, parking because it just seems like parking. there's parts of this that could really set up a nightmare in a lot of neighborhoods for parking. Uh, I'm just thinking like, okay, a two bedroom, you might get five students in there, that's five cars. Um, I know that I, I, I offline I asked you if there's um, any chance of, you know, can we limit parking? Can, can, you, can you deed restrict uh, the number of cars a unit can have? I know you, you said maybe the city attorney would have um, an idea about that. Um, but how would we, in your experience, like what places are handling, you know, how is the parking handle, handled in a lot of these places? I mean, or especially a beach town like ours. I don't know if there's, yeah, Pacific Grove maybe or, uh, is on that list, Marina. So I haven't done any research specifically related to ADUs and parking. Um, you know, quite frankly, the state preempts us in most cases. We just have this one opportunity where we can still require parking. Um, what I will say is that um, in general, parking for residential development varies widely between jurisdictions. It's very site specific. I mean, some, in some jurisdictions, it varies between neighborhoods, depending on what's there and how large the lots are. Um, I think it's hard to make, you know, just a general statement about how um, different places handle, um, you know, handle parking specifically around ADUs. I mean, I guess the part of my response is parking is a much bigger issue than just ADUs, right? You know, today we're talking about what are the parking standards that we're going to continue to require for ADUs. Um, and we know that there are certain neighborhoods that are highly impacted when we don't have the right type of housing built with the right kind of um, infrastructure and parking, then we get these impacts, like you mentioned, with you know students in a two bedroom. And you know that it's a two pronged issue. We have the issue about parking, and then we also have the issue that you know students are living in a two bedroom ADU because there isn't there aren't other housing options available for them that might work. So we want to be careful about again balancing the production of housing and the cost that's associated with creating off street parking. Um, as we, you know, as you guys make this decision, that's the balance that you're going to have to strike. So, um, specifically to your question about can we deed restrict the number of cars that can be associated with a specific address, I would like to consult with our city attorney on what his opinion is on that. Yes, and that that question was posed to me uh, late this morning in between a bunch of meetings with you all. Um, <laughs> my initial reaction was that. Um, even assuming that we could write a deed restriction to uh, just to say a, only a certain number of vehicles can be owned by the occupants of the unit um, as a practical matter, I don't know how that's enforceable. On the other hand, you could restrict the number of parking permits issued to uh, a specific address and that might be one way to try to get at the topic. And we do do that through our permit parking program. We limit the number of um, permits that are issued to a, an address, and we issue the same number of permits regardless of how many units exist on that property. It looks like we haven't. Yeah, I'm Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. I was just going to say that one same point, but the areas where we don't have a permit program, like we're in the coastal zone, we can't get a permit. I mean, that's pretty difficult to get a permit program. So areas where there's already ones existed, we do have that limitation of, of five permits that are issued. Um, three residential and two guest permits that we allow per parcel. Okay. Do you know if any of those cities you put up have um, zones for ADUs? Like this, this area is pretty good for ADUs, maybe this area is not. Like so we talked about with short-term vacation rentals, the same thing. We didn't go that route, but that was talked about. So the state law requires that anywhere you allow an a, a single-family home to be built, you have to allow an ADU to be built, unless there's some extreme um, you know, limitation on water or fire hazard. The, the, the ability for a jurisdiction to limit the places where you use a, are, can be built is very limited. So, um, you know, this is a list that I was able, this is not an exhaustive list um, also of cities where owner occupancy requirements don't exist. Um, but each one of them is probably gonna have a different set of standards, a different set of requirements. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any of them that, that tie it to affordability, but um, there are, they do handle it in a, in a number of different ways. And then I will also add, there are some of these places where they simply don't build a lot of ADUs because they have other types of housing that they're building instead and there isn't that same push and demand on the, on the market. So it's, you know, 
we want to look to other places and gather that that data, but then we also need to have our you know our local lens on on Santa Cruz being the unique snowflake that it is, and really thinking about what's going to work here. A couple more quick questions: mm -hmm. thirty-five to forty-five are built per year. Is that steady over a certain amount of year, or you expect thirty-five to forty-five to be built a year after? When um, you know, typically, that's been our our experience in the past. Uh, you know, a really high production year has been fifty. Um, you know, we're expecting that our production will increase as we continue to make these changes, and then especially if we can figure out ways to lower costs for folks. And um, there, the sprinkler thing is over now, right? It's like the house had to have, a, if the house had a sprinkler, then the ADU wouldn't have to have a sprinkler, but now neither the house nor the ADU has to have a sprinkler? So, so the, the thing that changed was we had, um, the state law um, says that if there's no sprinklers, um, existing or required for the primary home, you don't have to put a, um, any sprinklers in the ADU. We had previously had a policy um, that stated that unless, yes, that was the case, you don't have to install um, sprinklers unless the ADU is attached to a garage. And then if it's attached to a garage, you still have to install the sprinklers. Um, it's the opinion of the city attorney that that does not comply with the state law as it's written. So we have changed our policy and we'll be back, this fire will be back to change that ordinance in the future. There, will, there are different construction standards that then apply to those spaces that are attached to non-habitable space without a sprinkler system. Um, but it, the sprinkler <laughs> system is a, you know, a costly endeavor to install. And so um, it's now not required unless it's already existing or required in the main home. Last question is, um, expand, you, you, you had up there, um, quote, expanding definition of conversion ADUs lowers fee costs for more properties. Could you explain that? And um, when I go out into neighborhoods, people would like to convert their ADU, but uh, with, which they already have it and it's maybe it's not permitted currently, and they're um, wondering what kind of permit relief they can get if they want to pursue the garage conversion or some other structure that they might have built over time or was mm -hmm. built before they even got there. Right. So um, so our our legalization program does require folks to get permits. So if if we have if we have structures that were that should have gotten a permit and um, circumvented that process, they are required to to um, meet the standards that will allow them to be issued permits. What this would allow us to do, um, this change in, in um, the definition of a, co of a conversion, um, is that it would allow those structures to, to be more easily brought fully into, the, into compliance with our building code. Because as it is now, they're trying to limit and only change 50% of the structure. And there are cases where you just, you know, in order to really bring it up to code, you have to change 65% of it and all of a sudden you're triggering these fees and so now it's like, not only did I get busted for having an illegal ADU, now I have to do all this really expensive construction and I got hit with this big extra fee. So we're just trying to find ways to expand that to like balance, again, balance those needs. Like we wanna create housing that's safe and adequate and durable over time. A lot of that is contained in the building code and bringing things up to building code and that's why we require permits and people to get building permits. And at the same time, we understand that some of these things that are required are burdensome and costly. And so we're trying to find the right way to kind of balance those effects and impacts on all parties. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And then uh, I'd like to just add one thing just to, um, for the sake of clarity. So conversion ADUs currently are also exempt from the uh, water and sewer connection fees that Sarah referenced earlier, and that's about 82 to $8,400 per unit. And so when you expand the definition of conversion ADUs uh, to allow uh, full reconstruction within the footprint, uh, what that does, and with small expansions uh, for mechanical water heater, things like that, that allows more of those conversion ADUs to qualify for that fee exemption as well. I Thank thought you. the state already exempted them, yeah. uh, the water, is that only yes, for attached it, it, or what, detached? What Sarah's saying is that it will allow more projects to qualify for those fee exemptions. That's right. Yeah. Because you're changing the definition. Changing that definition locally. So um, Councilmember Myers has a quick follow-up question with fees and then uh, Vice Mayor Cummings will have a question and then Councilmember Brown. Okay. Uh, with the reduction of fees with the conversion units, um, that could be, that could add up pretty fast in terms of an impact. Um, is that, where, who pays, where, what does that do to the other fees that may be put on new construction? Are those gonna go up? So I'm just aware of, you know, if we're removing a certain type of housing uh, or giving that exemption, um, it still costs X amount of dollars to 
maintain or service. provide service and keep pipes clean and things. So I'm just, I'm curious if we're just sort of moving the, if we're mo gonna have to move that requirement to new construction, which could include affordable housing as well. So I'm just kind of curious how we handle I mean, that. I have a, an answer, but okay, and you'll fill in. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so yes, that, I mean, that absolutely is um, one of, the, and that's one of the things that we're thinking about in terms of um, you know, further fee reductions and potential cost savings for applicants is that that's something we're really thinking about or like, you know, what are the impacts and how will that, you know, sort of shortfall or change in the way the fee structure is applied? How will that affect other types of development? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, so that's definitely something we're conscious of. In speaking with the water department and public works related to sewer, um, the the way that fees are applied, so, so let's talk about water because they actually have a really robust fee study. So the way that fees are applied is based on, you know, a fee study that has, you know, three tiers of um, housing types for which they apply um, connection fees. And um, they're actually looking, considering changing the structure, the way they do fees to go to like a unit, a fixture count model rather than a per unit count. Um, and I think part of that will result in cost savings for many different types of projects, not just ADUs, um, but also homes that may be, single family homes that may be smaller or more water efficient. Um, and so I think that that's something that they are thinking about and considering. And um, I don't think that given our current level of ADU production at you know 50 or fewer units per year, that it's an outsized impact that would be felt by other types of development. But Lee, do you have anything to add? No, you summed it up really well. I would, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I would just reiterate that we have been coordinating with the water department on this and the changes, the future changes that Sarah was referencing are things that we may be bringing back with the uh, later set of changes that were referenced um, in Sarah's earlier presentation when we're revisiting those fees. And uh, I would certainly agree that um, given the, the budget of the water department and the costs associated with this, um, not to mention that many of the ADUs that are already going through the process, they take the steps to um, qualify for the conversion. This would just qualify additional properties. So even the 35 or 45 ADUs that we produce, you know, some percentage of those are already qualifying for those fee reductions. This would just offer additional opportunities for that. And so in the scheme of the overall budget, it um, isn't something that would likely have a significant effect on any Thank other you. projects. Thank you. Vice Mayor. So I have a couple um, just concerns around, and I know that um, Council Member Glover brought this up before, but just around. Is it, are these questions or just overall statements? Uh, it's a mix, so I can. Maybe just direct questions, then okay. we'll open up to public comment, and then we'll come back for deliberation and okay. statements. So if you have any specific questions for staff, this would be the best. Time. Okay. Um, what defines new construction in terms of ADUs? So um, the way the ordinance is drafted now, new construction is basically anything that can't qualify as a conversion. So it's basically you're one or the other. You're either you know creating new square footage where no structure existed, or you're using primarily some kind of existing structure and you're either using it as it stands, rebuilding it to some degree, expanding it very slightly by no more than 120 square feet, um, or you're not, you know, or you're building new square footage where there was no structure and no lot coverage prior to that. So that's the... So does there have to be an increase in square footage in order for it to, to be considered new construction or could someone just renovate and like remodel the entire interior and that be considered new construction? That's No, that wouldn't be considered new construction. That's a conversion, what you just described. Yeah. As long as it's within the existing footprint with the modest expansions that are allowed of 120 square feet uh, and two feet in height. Yeah, so if you exceed those thresholds, so like you're con someone's converting their garage, Here's an example. So there's a 400 square foot garage that's on a 600 square foot parcel or 6,000 square foot parcel. And they start designing their project and they're like, this is great, I'm gonna convert my garage. It's gonna be so convenient and so affordable. And then they start designing it and they realize, you know what, it would be really great if I could add a bathroom here. It would be really great if I could pop out, you know, I, if I could add a, maybe I could even fit in a second bedroom or like a private bedroom instead of building a studio. And all of a sudden they've designed a 600 square foot. So they've taken that 400 square foot and expanded it by 200 square feet. We would call that whole thing new construction under the way the code is written. Um, if they could keep that expansion under 120 square feet and so build something that's, you know, 520 or less 
then they would qualify under the code as a conversion. And again, that's as written. However, it is within the purview of council. If you feel that those numbers should be potentially modified, that's uh, you know a point of discussion for the council to have if that's something you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Brown. So, just trying to tease out my uh, concerns versus questions, and so I'll just I guess I'll just ask the question. One. Um, is a question about um, the for further consideration portion of this um, agenda report and um, the uh, expression of a uh, timeline for coming back to us with some of those. Um, I'm just wondering, um, and I um, appreciate really all the work that's been done and the patience. I want to reiterate that because I think it's really important. You have been, um, uh, you know, very, very patient <laughs> in um, showing up and then and preparing all of this. Um, but I'm wondering, there is one area that I um, am wondering about actually coming back to us more quickly, um, and that's the, um, some, uh, uh, the, the ability to build ADUs, and we're talking about production, incentivizing production, and um, I am wondering, because I don't really see this being a major concern, so I'm, I'm at, the question is, why not bring us a proposal to allow ADU to be constructed in the uh, in zones that have multi-resident permits. So, you know, I mean, that those areas where you could build an, you could technically build um, a multi-unit um, uh, construction rather than an ADU. I, it seems like a simple thing to, to in, in the in the scheme of incentivizing ADUs. I'd like to see it here. Um, we don't see it here, and so I'm I'm just wondering if you could talk about that. Sure. So, um, you know. Uh, it's not here because it wasn't in the HBS report. I mean, it wasn't something that came up early enough in the process to be included, unfortunately. <coughs> so, I mean, it's just, it's a matter of balancing our workload. You know, we have um, a number of other things that are falling to our section shortly. And um, that, you know, adding the ability for, uh, so, so let me just clarify, I believe what um, Council Member Brown is referring to is that currently our code does not allow the creation of an ADU on a parcel that has a duplex or a triplex or multifamily housing. Um, that is something that's allowed in some places in the state. The state law gives us sort of the leeway to allow that. Um, it doesn't meet the traditional definition of an ADU, but, you know, given that we're considering allowing two ADUs on a parcel with a single family home, it becomes a bit of a semantic argument and, you know, fair enough, let's consider it. Um, so it, it, it's a matter of balancing, you know, in terms of our workload and preparing for that, that is a, an issue we would need to go, we would need to do public outreach and have a meeting with the public. We need to go back to the planning commission and discuss it with them and then bring a recommendation forward to your city council. So I think the shortest timeline possible for to achieve that would be three to four months. And what we're talking about instead is packaging, should the rest of the council agree to make that part of our direction, packaging that with some of these other um, items that we're already planning to come back with on more of a six to nine month timeline. And then maybe just a few final questions then we'll open it up to pu public comment. Can I just ask a sure. quick follow-up question? In terms of how might that affect the workload to bring that back more quickly as a, as sep as a separate item, given that it seems to be a simple. Things that seem simple Straight are never forward. simple. <laughs> but I'll just I'll just add okay. that you know in la in the land use arena there are there are always consequences and trade offs and balances to strike. So it may be that it's very simple. To be quite honest, some of these policy changes that we're suggesting today I thought would be very controversial and haven't been. So we could be surprised. I mean, there also there are some things here that I thought were you know slam dunks and they've been very controversial. So I just it's hard to say. So maybe it would be faster. You know, maybe it would be on the shorter end of that timeline, but um, you know, there's there's scheduling and there's um, you know, getting folks to come to the meeting. Lee, do you have thoughts on that? Go ahead. Hi, thanks. I just wanted to clarify um, a couple things. One, um, we are adding that in multifamily districts, if there's a single family residence, an ADU could be added. And so I wanted to clarify that for the audience, just in case there was some. Um, uh, misunderstanding there. And I believe what you're talking about is if they're multifamily, like a duplex, for example, could they add an ADU? <laughs> and one of the things that we want to explore with that, and, and certainly we don't think that that's a bad idea, but we also want to explore in some instances, it may actually prolong a uh, uh, 
less, uh, fewer units on the property, let's say. So a property may um, be ready for redevelopment, ripe for redevelopment, ready to combine with an adjacent parcel. And you know, between those two parcels, you maybe could get 10 units, for example. But if that property were to invest that <laughs> duplex that may be you know, heading towards the end of its lifespan and ready to redevelop, were to invest in an in ADU, that could prolong three units on a property where we would be hoping to get substantially more. And so that's one of the things that we want to uh, discuss with the community and potentially come up with some ordinance language that would recognize that situation and, uh, and acknowledge the equivalency of an ADU in terms of some of the benefits that ADUs provide with uh, regards to whether it be parking or um, the connection fees, but also uh, perhaps reference the benefits of the ADU, but not call it an ADU such that there could be some discretion from a decision-making body as to whether or not this is really the right place to invest in just an ADU or if really we should be doing a more substantial redevelopment of that property. So that's one of the things that we want to explore and um, we're happy to do that. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to do as part of this next phase. Thank you. I do have another quick question related to the um, land use policy um, C, which I'm sure will uh, engender lively, robust discussion later, but uh, in comments. But I just have a quick question related to um, the, you know, the parking requirements. Were we, my understanding, so we are um, being asked to eliminate all parking requirements for ADUs, which um, is, is different than what the state law requires we do, and I get that part, but I'm wondering, Given that the recommendation here, or the, the discussion suggests, um, you know, uh, residential parking permit programs as a, as a way to kind of address those concerns, if I can get clear about the ability, so I, I'm, this has come, I'm trying to not express the concern, but the, um, <laughs> <laughs> the um, you know, great. this is, the, we're essentially privatizing streets um, for, you know, allowing residential permits um, to be uh, distributed to, you know, the, for, for residential zones, but there is some, um, you know, I'm just not entirely clear if there's some ability for, uh, the general public to continue to park for two hours. So some zones have two hours. So we've got Washington Street that now has no um, public parking, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Mean, we can talk about that in terms of semantics, but that's really essentially what it's done. Yeah. So I just want to clarify where that, how that fits into this kind of general discussion about, um, well, we can have the residential parking permit program should a 60-ish percent of the residents want it. Yeah, I'm, th I mean, that's definitely a concern. Creating a, a parking district on a street segment is not um, you know, something that neighborhoods <laughs> undertake lightly, and each one is really tailored to the neighborhood and the, and the impacts that they are seeing and feeling. Typically, um, up until now, the permit parking program has been focused on neighborhoods that are experiencing impacts from outside influences. So it's been you know, areas that are around the boardwalk and areas that are near the university and areas that are near downtown. So it's not, um, as it's currently designed, it's you know, it's not focused on regulating parking for residents in the neighborhood. It's really focused on regulating parking for folks that don't live in the neighborhood. And um, and each, all of those standards are, um, are applied, you know, really uniquely. I could imagine that in um, these residential neighborhoods, should we, you know, should that become necessary to expand into these residential neighborhoods as a result of one of these choices? Um, maybe the um, the parking standard for for visitors to that neighborhood, in some places, maybe it would be that you're allowed to park for 24 hours instead of the standard 72, or maybe in some places it's that you, you know, there's just no overnight parking, but you can park all day for however long. You know, there would just be a whole variety of solutions to that. Which, so just a quick follow-up question, which would be determined through the through the permit application through process. The permit application process and the, not come back to council. For the part yeah, for to establish the district, they would come up with the you know the and I'm speaking a bit out of turn here because I have not I mean maybe Mark Dettel is here and he can speak to that. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna invite Mark Dettel. This isn't really to a simple one, but I'm just trying to no, they they would come to the uh, Public Works Commission and we would um, they, they say they would request that, we'd give them an application, they'd fill it out. We would then do a survey of the neighborhoods and if we got two thirds supported of that street segment for the 
permit parking and they're not in the coastal zone, then that would go into effect. Now, it depends, like you say, there's a variety of what does it look like, right? It could be um, two hour parking, it could be no parking um, without a permit. And we have a variety depending on what the need of the neighborhood is, so. And they would have to craft that before we went out and surveyed, so. It, it, there is some staff work involved in that, obviously. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Right. The, the other thing to consider is on trash day and when we go to pick up, where do we put our, um, our, our trash cans as well as the trash amendment coming for the stormwater um, issue where we have to keep trash out of the stormwater. So we may, we may have to have no parking on your, on your street sweeping day. That may be coming down the road. Where do we put these cars then? So that's the other consideration. Okay. Any final uh, questions before we open it up to public comment? Yeah, just, just a few and then I promise it'll be over. <laughs> uh, so just coming back really quickly to the short term rentals, is it feasible from the staff's perspective to offer instead of three years of short term rental, uh, one year of short term rental or three years with the um, perpetuity of affordability? I mean, just because if we're, I mean, we, three years to before we even get a one bedroom on the market so that they can recoup their costs, three years of short-term rentals, you know, might. Um, yeah, I mean, so so if there's another threshold that the council agrees would be more appropriate, um, you're welcome to, you know, make that motion and make a change here. This, um, the three years is actually, um, different than the initial staff proposal, which was two. The planning commission felt that three years would be, you know, actually, you know, result in some, some amount of cost recovery for um, project applicants. Um, you know, using that in, in in exchange for affordability. I mean, again, the the thing is about a, you know balancing how how are we enticing construction, and then how are we meeting the needs of our affordable households and. Um, there are places, because ADUs are built by um, novice homeowner builders, novice builders, homeowners, who really, this is gonna be the biggest project they ever undertake in their lives. Um, I, those same incentives and disincentives, they're, they're just much more sensitive to disincentives. It's not, um, it's not the same as if you're you know, building 100 apartment apartments and you know you can require that a certain threshold be affordable um, it's just the the sensitivity to cost is much more severe with homeowners thank you okay. any final questions? yes yeah just to so for, uh, mm -hmm. that same kind of question for people that have enough uh, capital to build a second ADU because when you build on property it increases your property value right. as a whole right so for people that are building that second ADU from staff's perspective is it feasible to mandate that second ADU be affordable um, I mean, that one I think is a little bit more palatable to me. Again, you know, those units, let's remember where there would be two, they would be small, mm -hmm. you know, based on the way that's written now, those would be small units. So um, so the, the costs associated with construction are higher per square foot on smaller units. So it's a little bit different, but um, you know, to me that, that doesn't, strike me as unreasonable. The only thing I would say is that um, it's important to be mindful that when uh, people are trying to get traditional financing, often the, the traditional lenders will not uh, consider the future rental income on an ADU as a part of what they're looking at when they're, pr when they're providing financing. So um, that would be something to weigh when you're thinking about if people have capital or not. Um, again, that's something that we would love to see changed in the big picture, you know, but that's, that's definitely um, uh, far beyond the, the, the purview of, of this item. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah. And then the last thing um, is, I know we had spoken previously about the authorization of ADU development in multifamily zoned areas. Yeah. Uh, is there, and then I know you had responded with the concern of for future, if there wanted to be future development for more housing in those right. areas. Is there a way that we could work an agreement process through the landowner in the city so that we would know what their plans for development were or if they were never planning on develop the property, then, you know, because the next person can come and buy it and demolish the whole thing? Right, so, um, yeah, so it's not so much about regulating. It's about, you know, in terms of like, if they put in an ADU, we wouldn't let them build something else. It's more about like the cost and the investment that's been in place in the property. And as you mentioned, adding the ADU increases the property value. So this is the issue that um, Mr. Butler was just speaking to about, you know, if we add investment into a, into a use that maybe has, you know, is functionally obsolete, you know, it's, 
you know, a 150-year-old duplex, then really it's, it's ripe for turning over and joining with the neighbor <coughs> parcel and building 10 units. Um, doing the, a major investment of installing an ADU raises the value of that property significantly. So that's now, that property is now more difficult for a developer to purchase and combine with the neighboring parcel. So we've just made that process harder for creating those units. Um, and so, so it's not really about, you know, having an agreement. You know, it, one thing I would say is that if we do pursue that, you know, allowing ADUs on parcels with existing multifamily, that we um, ensure that they are located on the site such that they don't preclude future development of that property to its maximum allowed density. You know, I think that's something we want to make sure at a minimum we preserve that on the property. So on the ground, we can see that there's, plenty, there's enough space for both the future required units and any parking that would be required for those units. Um, you know, it just, the other thing to sort of keep in mind is the reason that someone would prefer to build an ADU rather than build um, multifamily housing. I mean, let's think about that. Why can't we just make it easier to build multifamily housing? You know, it's yeah. about the, the, the concessions they get with an ADU, they get, le they get um, reduced setbacks, they get a reduction in parking. You know, so there's all of that kind of things that we're considering when you think about like our housing program overall. I mean, that's really the questions we should be asking ourselves is given that they are zoned for five units, why would they want to build an ADU instead of a triplex? So. Thank you. Wait. All right, thanks. I think at this point. Sorry, I have to ask a follow-up okay. question now. One final up, and then I really want to open it up to <laughs> yeah, I really, I just, I'm sorry, I just I can't help myself. So, I, I mean, I, all of that is understood, but I do want to ask the question, um, what, why ought the city to make it difficult for a private property owner to make that decision? I mean, in general, we leave it up to the property owner to make that decision, and my understanding is what, what we're kind of doing here is um, making it difficult for, say we have a property owner who um, does want to do this as an alternative, who lives in a multi-residential zone, mm -hmm. um, and now finds himself unable to do that because we think multi-unit um, is um, a higher best use for the land. That is a private property owner who may not be turning it over and hopefully isn't, um, who is prohibited from doing that. So I, why, why not allow them to do that? So let's that just, decision. let's recall that the purpose of an ADU, the, the, the reason they're created in state law and here locally is to add density to places where you cannot otherwise add density. Right, so we're adding ADUs to single family neighborhoods because they're otherwise built out at, at one unit per parcel. And so that's just fundamentally different when you're talking about fam the parcels that are zoned for multifamily use. You know, w they already have the density, so why, what does an ADU do for them? You know, sort of when you, when you take a step back and think of it and you're not looking at all the details of why someone would want that, because I do understand, you know, those concessions are real and cost effective for someone, and I get it. Um, but that's, you know, that's just, that's part of the consideration. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to get a sense of how many people in the audience are interested in speaking to this item. Okay. So we'll uh, allow up to uh, 90 seconds per speaker. And if you can, please line up to my left. Okay. So if you're interested in speaking on this item specifically, the ADU idea, I, item, you'd have up to 90 seconds. Are you, are you interested in speaking? Yeah, okay, come right up. Hello, I'm NateAlex.Kennedy at gmail.com, 346-9888. Uh, what I gotta say about this is everybody wants to live in Santa Cruz. This is such an awesome town, but nobody can afford to. And so what I think we really need to do more than just ADUs here, we need to let people build bigger. I think we should change the building code so that somebody can build at least 10 stories before they even have to come in here and get permission to build even bigger than that. Uh, the whole parking issue that's come up, what we need to do is make it so that probably the ground floor, but also basement levels, if we put up a 10 building story, a uh, 10 building story and we have uh, like two or three levels deep going down into the basement, all for parking. That's how I think the parking can get taken care of. Um, uh, I suppose. I got all that out really fast. Um, <laughs> now I'm, well now I'm just trying to think of what to say for the last uh, 25 seconds. Um, 
<laughs> I'll, I'll just close with this. I, my email, my phone number is uh, readily available. So Drew, Justin, and Sandy, and Chris, I would love to talk to all of you guys, so please give me a call when you can. Uh, I understand you're really busy these days. Um, that's that, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. I have a concern about the um, conversion ADUs and exempting them from any setbacks. And I understand there's, I wasn't sure about the state law consideration, whether that was just for the fee exemption or whether that was for the setback. And I understand the, some policy issues, but um, for example, my neighbor has a, an existing garage that's about six inches from the side yard setback. In fact, his rafters are on my property and um, I don't have any problem with him building an ADU there, but that's really too close. Like he has to come onto my property to do any main, maintenance or if he's gonna rebuild it, he's gonna basically have to come onto my property to build it. So I, I think uh, you should take that into consideration and especially take that into consideration when you, if you're gonna allow an additional 120 square foot expansion of that. <coughs> so maybe you could like have a minimum setback, even if it isn't the five foot setback, if it's like a two foot setback, at least, you know, they'd be able to maintain their property and build their property from their property rather than, you know, me having to give them an easement or me having to have my whole backyard exposed for the six months to a year that it takes them to build it. So just one minor concern. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Uh, Affordable Housing Now supports this package. Uh, uh, we really like the package, in fact. It's a great mix of incentives. Um, and the major reason is that ADUs can and have supplied a lot of new housing in our community uh, that we desperately need, both affordable housing and workforce housing. Um, and secondly, uh, there's a usual package of things that ADUs offer that other kinds of construction don't. One is that they, they are affordable by design. They're gonna be smaller. Um, and even if you have two on the same lot, each of them together is gonna to have to be smaller in order to meet that requirement that's been listed. Um, secondly, it spreads out uh, growth in our community into lots of different neighborhoods rather than fighting over, battling over one particular big project in one area. So this makes every neighborhood contribute to the solution. Um, and then important part is it doesn't require taxpayer subsidy in order to accomplish. And finally, what's really key here is that we have a lot of seniors in our community who would like to stay in the community, but they don't need a three bedroom house. They can build an ADU, live in the ADU, and then a family can move into that house. And family housing is really in short supply. Thank so you. we support it, but we do ask you for one Thank thing. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I try to keep it consistent okay. for equity of voice. I it's, appreciate it. You're welcome to submit your comments, but your time is up now. Okay. So we'll have the next speaker. No more. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome okay. to submit your comments to our clerk and we can rotate them through. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, my name is Micah Bosner. I'd like to build an ADU, but I, I'm in a duplex because the city wouldn't let me build an ADU two years ago, so I had to make it into a duplex. And now I can't build an ADU because I'm no longer a single family home. Um, so it's a bit odd. Um, I, um, the reason that staff said that we have ADUs so that people in other zones can build units, I would, I would disagree a little bit. It seems like the reason we create the ADU program as a county and as a state was to make it easier for sm small-time property owners like me to add housing. Ironically, in my zoning district, people don't have that many concerns about parking and setbacks and whatnot, but it's harder for me to build something in a multi-residential district where everyone expects there to be building than it is if I lived in a single family district. That's really weird and it doesn't help the city because you're stopping people like me from building ADUs. I think there's two or three of us that might build an ADU if we could. Um, I'd like the council to have that come back sooner than later. Like if it came back in four months, then some of us might build an ADU this year. If it came back in seven months, we'd have to wait for another you know, 15 months because of the, the way, you know, you can't start in the, in the winter when it's raining. So um, four months would work, but nine months would really mess me up. Um, 
the, you know, a lot of these rules are really Byzantine and I hope you address this one. Um, I also care a lot about the other stuff and I think a lot of it's pretty good. Just to point out, 25% of people in Santa Cruz don't use cars to get around. When you require parking spots, you're penalizing people that don't drive and that's bad for Thank the you. environment. It's bad for our global Thank warming you. policy. Okay, next speaker. Good afternoon, my name is Mark Primack. Uh, 90 seconds, I'll just uh, offer a reality check. The city has not been innovative in ADU since 2003. It's been regressive for the last 12 years. You've lost more safe ADUs in that time than you've built. So um, I think it's really important that you take the stance, not that you're innovative and you wanna add a few improvements, but that you're way behind the time and you need to catch up. So for instance, the state made it really clear that uh, uh, an ADU that was located within a half a mile of a bus stop did not have to have on-site parking. Uh, it's an embarrassment the city has construed that as a half mile of our metro center. And the state again will remind you that probably within the year and, uh, and get you into conformance. Um, we really need to look at how we create affordable housing through ADUs. Uh, the city has lobbied to keep building codes strict and, um, and uh, prohibitive for uh, small units. You need to take the other approach and look at how you can streamline and ease those requirements. Green building requirements uh, uh, came into effect in Santa Cruz before we had Cal Green, before we had a state that was committed <coughs> to uh, net zero. Uh, and so what we have now is another layer of bureaucracy. It's a, a, a vanity piece the city has, our green building Thank program that we you. don't need. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my name is Bill Cook, I live in Santa Cruz. Um, I've lived here for 40 years. Uh, I own a duplex. Uh, uh, we added an art studio to the limits of the uh, current regulations uh, about 15 years ago. Um, the, the intent is to increase density. Um, uh, I, um, I appreciate the work that's been done. I think we need to uh, go further. We need, uh, we need to include multi-residential uh, residences in, the, in consideration. Uh, in my case, I'm not able to uh, make the art studio a, an ADU uh, specifically because of density. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Daryl Darling, <clears throat> I just wanna be sure that you're very care, very cautious about living, uh, lifting uh, entirely uh, the family uh, requirements. Uh, we obviously, the difference between Santa Cruz, <laughs> a gentleman referred to this earlier, uh, the difference between Santa Cruz and uh, and a desert island is that uh, they're both confined. Nobody wants to live on a desert island. Everybody wants to live on our island. We're circumvented by or circumscribed by the ocean, the uh, mountains, the hills, the forests, the agricultural land that we don't want to uh, expand into. Uh, so we have to be selective about the purpose for each of the, our uh, housing uh, requirements and liberalizations. The ADU has an ideal application for keeping families in Santa Cruz intergenerational and the uh, and family is, a, is an ever ev uh, evolving uh, definition. Uh, so as the last gentleman, or the, uh, an earlier gentleman said, uh, it's primarily uh, the need to keep families intact in Santa Cruz who are already here. Thank you. Our next speaker. Mayor Council Members, Gillian Greenside. I've been to all of the hearings since 1983 and the five subsequent ones on this issue. And at every one of those slew of public hearings, staff 
and council always stated that this program of ADUs had to balance the impact of ADUs on single family neighbourhoods with the desire to build more housing. And this is the first iteration where that is barely mentioned. The balance has gone. The goal, staff said, was to um, uh, provide, uh, the, increase the production of ADUs. And I would say that the state has given you a direction and it would simplify everything if you just went with what the state is requiring. Going further than that is throwing the neighbourhoods under the bus. Removing parking is just going to be a nightmare. Uh, Single, um, sorry, short-term rentals. Do you think somebody after they've got the big bucks from short-term rentals is going to rent at anything than the highest they can get? And the statement was made that affordability is a disincentive. ADUs are not affordable housing. If affordability is a disincentive, you should go cautious on this and not liberalise or change the um, requirements Thank that you. throw the neighbourhoods under the bus. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker. Hi, Robin Cunningham. Um, I am an ADU owner and I agree with uh, one of the statements that she just made actually that ADUs are not affordable housing. Anybody who's built one or who has purchased a residence that has one, it's pretty clear. And I guess the purpose of the study was to figure out how to incentivize people to build more housing. And you talked about how um, putting restrictions about um, um, affordable rents and whatnot were kind of deal killers. In addition to that, any uh, serious restriction of rent control or just cause <coughs> eviction will have the exact same effect. And if what you want is more housing, um, you have to really pay close attention to that and not be in the trees about that. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, okay, next speaker. Mara Kelsey, I live in uh, the Seabright area, and I really thank Sarah for her clear communication and writing up this uh, ordinance. I have several concerns. One is about short-term rentals. It was a very casual conversation that jumped it from two to three years. I really uh, have a lot of concern about that. I would say two is a max. That's my opinion. If you have short-term rentals, you really must have parking. There's no two ways about it. They're not riding their bikes. <clears throat> two, uh, parking, if you have two ADUs, parking at least one more space is important uh, according to this, uh, you know, you have to do it according to the state law. But I would recommend keeping one more. <coughs> Three, <clears throat> owner occupancy, I feel is very important. Lived in uh, Live Oak for 21 years on a corner. Five <laughs> ADUs were built around us eventually. <clears throat> one was, uh, two were legal, one had an owner. It was a nightmare. Drugs, fights, cars, <laughs> noise, prostitution. You name it in these five units around. I think owner occupancy Thank is you. vital. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, Doug Putnam Pike. Uh, I live up on the west side. Uh, lived in Santa Cruz for decades and decades. Um, we're actually in the process of a trying to build an ADU. So I think the new rules that are coming out are, I think, really an incentive. Uh, particularly off-street parking is, for a lot of people that I've talked to about ADUs, that's a deal killer if you have to like tear up your front yard to take care of that. I think setbacks are helpful as well. Um, I think just the whole process that the uh, housing subcommittee went through was really helpful. You know, the, I went to several of those meetings. I think you got a lot of the input from the community and I think that input is representative of uh, what people want to see in the city. So that kind of process for other housing activities, I think would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, next speaker. And before you begin, are there any additional speakers in the audience um, who want to address us on ADUs? 
Okay. Okay. So I'll have you at some certain point line up on our left. Okay, go ahead. Congratulations, Mayor Watkins, for becoming mayor and our new council people. My name is William Kingsley. I'm a long-term resident of Santa Cruz. I just want to uh, voice my opinion regarding ownership of ADUs. I think it's very important that we try to maintain ownership of the local people. And I do agree with some of the changes that have been made allowing short-term rentals and allowing owners to move out for a while and then come back and still regain their property. The question I have about that is regarding um, how it interfa interfaces with the, some of the just cause uh, issues. And I don't know that as, I don't see that being resolved in this, um, uh, these, um, this ordinance. Also, I had some questions that are more just related to understanding the standards. Um, there's, uh, Sarah Noyce explained my first question, which is I didn't understand how they defined the rear area of a yard, but I think you took care of that for me. And then in the zoning incentives, they explained that uh, that was not going to apply. It says, um, in sections 24, 16, 140, number five does not apply if you are um, uh, limitations. Let's facing see an alley? Yeah, mm -hmm. right, facing an alley, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I wondered what the constraints were. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Next speaker. Hi, my name's Elise Casby. Um, I just wanna run through a couple of things. First of all, we're failing in our paradigms. We are absolutely not addressing the fact that we have 12 more years to address climate change in a very, very effective way so that climate change, and it will affect this community in a ferocious way, is, is we, we are not exposing our future children and youth and, and ourselves to just an increased, uh, horrible effects, the worst effects of climate change. We do have an opportunity right now to address it. So ADUs are not affordable, and for the most part, they are not environmental. Not only are we gonna have, if you reduce, if you take away what the state is requiring, the extra parking spot, you're gonna have a lot of building traffic coming in, con contractors, developers, plumbers, people bringing their cars in. What I'm trying to say is we need a paradigm shift, and if we don't have it from government, we are not gonna get it, so government will be failing us. ADUs are not affordable, short-term rentals are more traffic coming in all the time. These people who are making gargantuan profits from their unrent controlled apartments should be able to afford the parking spot. And also, we need to really think about not only keeping families in the neighborhoods, but keeping all the singles who've been push, being pushed out, as our 2014 Smart Solution study showed, 70% of people born here are losing the ability to live here. We need single Thank people you. housing. Thank, Thank you. you. Eminent domain. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Hello, City Council. Uh, I'd just like to um, give credit. That was a good report and presentation. There's a lot to unpack in that. It's pretty dense. Um, I'd just like, I could comment on a few things, but i just keep it brief to a few things. Um, or a lot of things, a few things. The, um, the owner occupied requirement, I actually own an ADU, I'm an ADU owner, and um, the owner-occupied requirement, I actually really believe uh, strongly that it is a good thing for the, for the ordinance, and um, to lift it entirely, I do not think would be advisable, uh, essentially, for the, essentially for the cons that were listed on that slide. And of the other places where they have lifted it, I would consider only one of those would partially pique my interest in actually living in, just as a comparison. So, um, and uh, the other thing with the parking, my ADU was actually built, and actually has a garage plus one off-street parking spot, and curr currently there's tenants with two cars, and neither of them park their cars in the parking spots. So just as a one data point on that point, so, Essentially, if you do require these parking spots, you're turning over land that could be housing people for housing cars, essentially. Yep. Thank you. Okay. 
Good afternoon, council members. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg. I really appreciate your considering these ADU uh, uh, options. Uh, first, I wanna say that in terms of allowing short-term rentals, I'm uh, totally opposed to that. I think it's counterproductive to the goal of what kind of neighborhoods we're, we're trying to build. I think we're trying to build neighborhoods that uh, have more long-term uh, residents. I, I, I am uh, very appreciative of consideration of of changing the, the uh, Owner occupied uh, requirement. Um, not all, not all um, owners are the same who don't happen to live on the property. Uh, perhaps the uh, the um, affordability requirement would be a good one to assure that a landlord who did not live there really cared about the community. In case in point, my. Son-in-law who grew up in Santa Cruz, bought a, um, a home, built an ADU, had uh, his mother live there for a number of years. Now he's uh, living over the hill for a period of time, will come back at some point. Uh, the situation right now is there's two, two uh, residences on his property and one of them is vacant. One of them has to stay vacant and uh, that doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker. <laughs> Hi, Trisha Davis. I live on the west side. I purchased a house two years ago. They had an ADU. Um, my daughter will go to UCSE next year, and I thought it would be perfect. And then I received a letter from that the ADU was not permitted and have been dealing with the process for the last year and a half, and it's very unpleasant. Um, I'm hoping that if you can make a decision, it would be quickly because I'm now trying to sell the house because I've done all of the plans and studies and um, uh, it, I'm thousands in and need to make a decision whether I can move forward or need to sell and I'm gonna take a huge loss, um, which is sad needing to put two daughters through school. But um, so I'm hoping, so I, don't, I don't know what the time frame is. I, I, I've watched this issue get pushed out meeting after meeting and <laughs> I'm just hoping that, you know, you can make a decision quickly. I, I want to live in the house. I want to not rent it. I want my daughter to live in it. It seems like there's a huge use case for, you know, people with parents that need to stay, you know, in that house. So I think that it could, it could if it would be easier to legalize these ADUs, people would do it. I mean, it was a rental for 17 years before I bought it. so. Now I'm kind of stuck with this. Um, and so I, I understand all of the, the pieces, but I, I wish that it could get easier. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker. And are you also in line to speak to this item? Okay, so I have you as our last speaker then. Okay. Hello. Um, I feel whoever thinks our council is a circus is extremely disrespectful. Um, I am totally for ADUs because I have lived um, in places where, you know, landlords have relinquished by separating, you know, circumstances, you know, going out with your bare feet, trying to do laundry, stepping on stepping stones, and you're getting shocked to the system or whatever. But at the same time, I also feel that the overlaying um, of properties should be more of a, you know, get to know your neighbor better then, you know, oh, I'm sitting there thinking about killing them. Like, what kind of, you know, hypocrisy is that? Like, I've had a lot of people around my land, and I'm a free spirit, so they all respect that. And, yeah, um, I consciously told um, anybody if my dog came through, you know, be nice to my dog, it's not a wolf, you know what it looks like. I don't care what circumstance you think it is, even if it was a wolf. So, same thing, you know, we all respect the moon, we all get the same energies. Let's live in peace, please. Thank you. All right, last speaker. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, as I have said before, I think that the city should have a program similar to the counties where people would be able to either legalize an existing ADU or uh, build an, a new one with no fees as long as there's an affordability uh, 
attachment to it for 20 years. I mean, you could look up the county's program and it's sort of like a loan that they don't have to pay back for the fees as long as they keep it affordable for 20 years. And at the end of the 20 years, if they've, if they've been affordable that whole time, the loan is forgiven. Um, I also think that having the owner occupancy provision is a disincentive to building and that if people live locally and the adjoining neighbors have a way to contact them, that that should be good. Or if it's managed by a local company, that, that also the neighbors have a way of uh, contacting, that that should be good enough for anybody. That uh, The other thing is I think there should be an outreach to units that have been closed down over the last eight or 10 years to those landowners okay. so that they can Thank you. legalize Thank you. their units Your once time again. Is up now. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes public comment for this item. At this time, I'd like to bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation, and I see that you have the recommendation before us. Um, so perhaps to uh, manage the conversation, we'll start, if it's fine for the council, with going through the state site and then land type um, considerations. Okay, so that was different than what was up earlier. Yeah, so this is the state law amendment. I see what you're saying. Okay, so we're gonna start with the state. All right. That's what, I mean, don't let me jump ahead of you. No, 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 I appreciate it. So you're helping, you're helping even drill down further into state law. So if we, if we can, we'll start with that. Is that work for the council? Okay. Okay, so any um, comments, action, motion, et cetera? Around? See, I would move that we approve the um, recommended uh, amendments as per state law. Second. Okay. So motion to approve recommendations um, one through five for state law made by Councilmember Brown, seconded by a Councilmember Glover. Any further discussion? On I have that? just a quick question. Uh -huh. So I'm looking at the uh, ADU policy goal sheet this one here, <laughs> and that has four items that fall under state law directive and Correct. this has five. Yes. What am um, I missing? That's the, garage the, 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 the piece the garage about one. the setbacks above garages was added. I, I apologize. I the have an old sheet. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I didn't update it. I failed to update it. Okay. So um, this was added at a, at a date after, sometime after the first time I it's, tried it's to come okay. to council. You've answered so. my question. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion before we vote on state law? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go to the next one, thank you. Okay, so um, now before us is discussion around some of the site, site standard amendments. Um, you can see listed here one through five. Um, so I'd like to open it up for action discussion. Just a couple of questions that folks asked, um, like the minimum setback, like how often would that happen where somebody's in somebody's yard building their ADU or having to ask, ask for access and what if the access was denied, I guess, or are they gonna charge an easement fee? So, um, we're, yeah, so, so the gentleman's comment was about, um, you know, conversion ADUs and if we can require a different setback than the built, the existing structure and the answer to that is no the state preempts us in this way we um we have different structural requirements the building code is different when you're within um i, I believe it's five feet of a property line you have to build a firewall there um we don't allow you know if that structure that the gentleman was referencing that's within within six inches of his um, property line if they were to reconstruct it we wouldn't allow the eaves to um extend over the property line they would have to be corrected um but we can't require that the structure be moved or rebuilt at a certain setback that's beyond our control. But you don't foresee like these sort of neighborhood battles where people are going at it, you know, because well, I'm not gonna give you access to my driveway because, you know, I don't want your ADU built or your... You know, neighborhood con neighbor conflicts are sort of inevitable, I think, in anything that we do here in, in Land Use Arena. Rule number one is to be a good neighbor. Um, and I think that's something that's just unfortunately beyond our control. 
And Mr. Kingsley asked about facing the alley. Uh, what are the constraints? What, do you want to um, so, so if an ADU faces an alley or the Monterey Bay Scenic <laughs> Trail, um, it has to meet the required setback, which is three feet for a single story ADU. And otherwise it has no um, rear yard lot coverage requirement. We are not proposing any changes to that section. I guess also like, uh, how can we get, you know, we're hearing about affordability and somebody said um, you, ADUs are not affordable housing and how, is there a way of, you know, getting them to be affordable? Um, somebody brought up the 20 years, um, you pay a loan back. Uh, more or less, what's the ballpark of fees that we charge to build an ADU between what and what? Depending on, I know, square footage and... Yeah, it depends on square footage, depends if it's, you know, a conversion versus not. But I, I'd say the ballpark is somewhere between the low end, probably six or $7,000, um, anywhere up to, depending on, you know, is it going to involve an alley? Is it going to involve a sidewalk? It could reach fifteen to $20,000, um, you know, which is not insignificant. Um, typically, I think when you compare that to the cost of the construction, uh, the sweet spot to land in, in my opinion, is between five and 10% of the total construction costs. And I think we're in that ballpark. I think obviously there are things that we could do to reduce those fee burdens and to reduce some of the, um, you know, conditions that we apply to some of these projects. And we're gonna continue to work on that. And we welcome any specific ideas that you hear from constituents or that you generate on your own. We would love to hear them because um, we are working with all the departments to think about the best way to reduce costs and reduce fee burdens. And th thanks. Um, do you know if any of the cities mentioned so far have any loan programs where you, the yeah, there are a few, there are a few. I mean, so far the ones that I've read about have been kind of pilot programs. There are a couple different tools out there. So the county has, as the gentleman mentioned, um, a forgivable loan program. They have that's currently in a pilot program phase. It's a it's a loan of up to forty thousand um, dollars that is offered in exchange for um, housing a income qualified household at a reduced rent for a period of up to of at least 20 years. If they want to buy out sooner than that, they pay back the loan with interest. Um, <laughs> if they see out the 20 year term, the loan is forgiven and they don't have to pay anything back. Uh, you know, that the, the key with that is identifying the funding source. The, the, the county has a funding source for that through their um, affordable housing impact fee program. Uh, the city doesn't have a fee like that. The, the LA had a pilot program where they built, um, they built the pilot program was to build two to three and rehab up to five, um, rehab legalize up to five existing ADUs in exchange for an agreement from the property owner that they would house a homeless individual or household. Um, and they've closed applications for that. And so, you know, we'll have to wait and see kind of how that rolls out. But, you know, they got a grant from the Bloomberg Foundation to do that. And it's, you know, $75,000 grant to someone to build an ADU to house a homeless individual. You know, they had a million dollar grant and they could do three of those and then five of another program. You know, so it's, it's the thing about all these funding programs is that, you know, they don't create as many units as we wish they did. Um, if I can, I'm just going to interject if I can, just in the interest of going through these items and then other areas where we can allow for further direction or exploration, I think we can have maybe that conversation. But for what is before us, I'm wondering if we can kind of tailor our action and deliberation in regards to the five before us. Is there any comments? Go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I'm prepared to move the section of items uh, that have to do with development standards. And I'll notice that a couple of those do have to do with reducing costs. Um, eliminating the extra green building requirements and um, allowing modest expansions for fee exemptions. And then we'll do later with eliminating the general fund impact fee. So there are some things already, actions we're taking that have to do with reducing costs. So uh, just tell me the numbers on the um, information sheet that I should be talking about. Or I guess it's I'll these, use these, these right five. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I mean, that would slide. That's right. easier for me. Three, four, five, six. Have that information sheet well, there's here. six items here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> again, I'm sorry. So this this lumps together those two, the two um, the two conversion. pieces about ADU a conversion ADUs. So allowing which are oh, listed see. separately okay, on this sheet. Separately here. Okay. Yes. So allowing full reconstruction and allowing modest okay. expansions. Okay. Given that, then I'll move the package of uh, items that have to do with revisions on the development standards. Uh, moved by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Council. Oh, I'm sorry. I, well, I want to. Um, I'd be willing to second with uh, uh, 
possible amendment, so I'm going to ask the maker of the motion if there's a willingness to. Do you want to do? Yes. Do, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so um, on for item one, rear yard lot coverage, the increase from 30 to 50 percent um, with in, with um, uh, affordability in perpetuity, and also with number four. Um, ADU size allowing uh, ADUs to be attached ADUs to be 10% of lot size in return for affordability. I'm at this point not willing to make that amendment. So is there a second for the motion as presented uh, by Council, Ma Council Member Matthews, which is to uh, move forward with the recommendations before us? Second. second. Okay, seconded by Council Member Meyer. Okay, question? Yeah, uh, so I just would encourage my fellow council members to really think about how we can work around the issue of affordability and ensuring affordability, whether it be if we are reducing the costs, as uh, was pointed out by council member Matthews around the green building standards, then shouldn't there be some kind of handoff uh, from the property owner to then ensure that the cost of that unit for rental will be in some way affordable, uh, at least for some amount of time, and looking at some of the other ones too, because we are not only in a housing crisis, I do want to emphasize that we are in an affordable housing crisis in Santa Cruz for working people to be able to stay here. So just want to put that out there and see if there's any uh, con ideas from my peers. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, and then I'll, okay. Why don't you respond? I'll, I'll, I'll we'll just do. respond. There's a lot that we're doing in this action, and it has taken a good deal of time if you go all the way back to the Housing Blueprint Committee and all the outreach on the ADU issue specifically, the staff work, and um, certainly there are issues of affordability, a lot of other issues that people have raised here, and there will be continued staff work on this issue. And by moving forward with this, I think we're doing something, and the affordable issue can come back to us. This is not going to fill the... Uh, all the potential for ADUs in the next year. We, this will be really an incremental change. And my own instinct is to go with something that has been given a great deal of thought and public review and ask that the affordability issue come back to us in the next iteration of um, study and recommendations that the, that the staff is going to bring forward to us. So just to clarify, what I'm hearing is to move forward with this, knowing that there could be further direction to how the staff could look at increasing affordability and bringing that mm -hmm. to us in the future time. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Brown and then Crow. Um, I just wanted to say for the record that I agree very much with the fact that there's no affordability kind of built into this and that um, makes me a little bit concerned with um, moving forward on so many items. I, mean, I think that there are definitely pieces of this that I think um, should be acted on today, but then I also think there are pieces of it that um, may actually need more study in terms of affordability or thought on how we can um, keep some of these units affordable. I also was going to um, make a comment before because I was n noticing that there's potential for conflict um, around um, allowing for like older buildings that um, would normally be expanded upon or built on um, and the idea that people may want to consider tearing those buildings down, reconstructing because in doing so they'd then be, they'd then qualify for the short term rental program to my knowledge and so I could also see a loss of units due to the fact that people might take older ADUs on their properties, tear them down, build new ones in order to qualify for the short-term rental. And so that gives me concern around um, actually losing some of the housing that we currently have. And that when we get to that item, we can discuss it. Um, uh, the reason why I brought it up is because it, it, it's in conjunction with what oh, we're with discussing right now. Okay. No, yeah, I mean, I'll make a general comment as well. I, again, appreciate the work that staff has done. Um, and I, so I have, uh, and I don't think it, these are insignificant changes. I don't think that suggesting that we wait and consider affordability in the future is an adequate response to the concerns. Um, so I would like to see the, the decisions that we make today include um, affordability and perpetuity. And for that reason, I mean, I mean, really what we're essentially talking about here is um, 
providing opportunities for uh, landowners to increase their property values, and there is no public benefit being asked in return. And that is just a principle that I'm, um, and this is something that I, I, you know, this is not a surprise to those of you who were staffed to the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee. I made these, um, I expressed these concerns at the time, and I will continue to express them here. And um, so I am not willing to, I'm not gonna vote in favor of the motion as is. I'd like to offer uh, this as an amendment um, and that we can vote on in advance. Okay. Maybe, um, Mr. Condotti, are you? I just, I want to um, just point out that a substantive change proposed by the council has to be referred back to the Planning Commission for a public hearing before the council takes action on it. So if you were to move forward tonight, you could also direct that those provisions be referred back to the Planning Commission for a recommendation. Okay, maybe I, maybe if I could offer that we go through each individual item and if there's some that would you prefer that we don't reach consensus on, that we refer them back to planning to incorporate consideration of your concerns. And then just to follow up on that is that the Planning Commission is required to ro report back within 40 days after the date of the council referral. So it's it's not just kicking it off into outer space. You would, you would have a very fairly short window of time to get a report back from the Planning Commission. May I just ask a follow-up question then? Um, so uh, procedurally, that is our only option because I, given the recommendation that's come before us at the Planning Commission, I don't expect to see a different outcome um, even with changes being made to the Planning Commission. So. Essentially, we're just we're simply delaying the decision about that. Is that is, we don't have any other alternative to just yeah, include I just, the I, I just, affordability requirement. I'll just read this section of the municipal code. It <laughs> says that a substantive change proposed by the city council must be referred back to the planning commission for a public hearing. In such a case, the commission shall report back. Actually, says shall report hack to the city council on the <laughs> online <laughs> within 40 days after the date of the council referral, where action cannot be taken within 40 days by the commission. A longer period of time may be requested. And the council may grant an extension. Another follow-up question: um, to, <laughs> Given the complexity of this, would the um, uh, cleanest uh, way to do this be for me to uh, offer an alternative? motion entirely rather than an amendment. So, I mean, I'll just propose an alternative motion now, which we will vote to vote on and then come back to the Be original Before motion. you do, I just want to ask a question, which I don't know, we might have? be satisfactory. Did you have a question? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I didn't recall if we had a second, but I think we did have a yeah. second. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask the staff in terms of uh, adding affordability to the short list of things to be brought back to us, um, what you consider your timeline for on the, the other issues to be covered here? So the, the other things that we are, you know, currently working on and, to, and looking at, you know, fees and looking at junior ADUs and other, um, other housing types, that's in the six to nine months timeline. So that's, you know, late summer to fall of this year. Um, and that would be going through planning and then to us. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so community process, so staff work internally, working with departments, community process, um, planning commission public hearing, city council public hearing. And I would like to add too that that is our current work plan. Um, we know some things that have been on the recent council agendas and that are coming up on future council agendas that may modify our work plan uh, given the staffing resources we have, specifically around um, the uh, tenant pr and landlord protections that we've been talking about. So uh, that is falling to our team as well as at least it seems that that's the case now. So we'll wanna be mindful of that when we're thinking about workload and what's coming back when. I mean, I would be happy to include direction to staff to include affordability considerations uh, as they bring back the next iteration of uh, housing <coughs> possibilities to us. Um, I don't know if that would be satisfactory I to you. I offer a, a yeah. suggestion that might work for both of you. Um, you. What you could do is find these points on which there is consensus and agreement and adopt those tonight. And the points where your council believes there is um, 
we could legitimately analyze adding affordability, we could put those off and analyze those for a future <coughs> agenda to be combined with some kind of an mm -hmm. affordability um, accommodation. I think that might be a clean way to do it because we could get some kind of ordinance passed tonight for folks that are in process and waiting for some of these things. Um, I do know that, you know, I've, I've been contacted by a number of uh, people who are currently building ADUs and I do know that the 30 to 50 percent is, um, is significant for them in terms of their project. So um, that's just information for your council. And again, if I can just wrap up on this point, um, I am concerned that uh, without a little more work, we don't know to what extent an affordability requirement becomes a disincentive to do anything. So that's why I would like to have a little more work on. And we have another whole category of items, the land use policy items, which are also actions taken to, uh, I don't even agree with all of them, but to make ADUs uh, uh, more buildable. And that's another whole category of things that should have a, an affordability consideration applied to it, I should think. So um, for all of those reasons, I would like to go ahead with all of these are in some way uh, a concession, an agreement to make ADUs more attractive to build. So I'm just going to let my motion stay the way it is. Okay. Councilmember Brown. Okay. Did you? Sorry. Okay. Councilmember Brown. I'd like to make an alternative motion that um, we approve the site standard amendments um, as recommended by staff with the exception of um, items one and four um, and, and that um, those be deferred uh, for uh, further discussion around uh, the feasibility of affordability requirements for um, in perpetuity. Is there a second? Second. Uh, alternative motion was made by Councilmember Brown and seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion on, is that? So you're moving approval of two, three, and five? Two, three, and five. Go ahead, Council Member Cummings. Uh, could you explain what, what, by leaving those two out, what, would, what that does? What are you asking or, me to explain? Or, or staff, or, 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 because, you know. Need to explain that. Yeah. Sure. So um, as I understand Council Member Brown's motion, she would um, tonight recommend tonight that your council approve items two, three, and five. Those to be, you know, brought back for a second reading and then approved into an ordinance and go into effect in 30 days. And that direct staff to um, go back and do some more work on figuring out how to add an affordability covenant that is tied to items one and four. Um, so that's figuring out you know, what's the level of affordability, how do we operate affordability in perpetuity on private, on specifically on single family home property, you know, all sort of sorting out all of those issues and to come back at a future date rather than having those issues postpone the entire ordinance. Do you have something to add? You, um, Thank you. I would just, um, on number one, with the increase from 30 to 50%, that is a rear yard coverage, coverage requirement. And one of the things that we debated um, was whether or not we should make that increase. You know, there are trade-offs there with, for example, um, increasing impervious surface. However, one of the um, concerns <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the concerns that we heard from the community was uh, the two-story units looking down into a backyard, for example. And so, uh, having the 30% requirement may actually um, uh, encourage people to do that two-story unit that um, has raised concerns from some of the neighbors, um, and they may choose to take that route rather than going with the affordability. There is some cost associated with two-story construction that's more expensive than single story, but that would be something that the um, individuals would have to weigh as the cost of the two-story construction versus the affordability requirement. So again, just a, a point of consideration and a little bit more background as to why we got to that recommendation of going to the 50% is really to address some of those neighborhood concerns about two stories looming over their backyard. I just had a question about, um, you said that some people are waiting for, on this, like we just passed the state mandated, how, how does that change? How is, I'm assuming that's pretty helpful also in, the, in this process. Um, if we took a step back and 
you know, I mean, I, I don't see a lot of, the hallmark of, of this ordinance for me sh should be about affordability, and, and it's not. And I, I just think that um, I appreciate Councilmember Brown's uh, motion because I think we're injecting, you're seeing concern up here that it's, it's really um, important that we achieve some affordability here, sure. uh, not to, uh, you know, inhibit the market, yeah. but that people who live here um, and can't afford, you know, and I'm, I'm not very interested in, in short-term vacation rentals either, or short-term rentals. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm wondering if at this time we want, did you have a, a, a I'd like to make a friendly amendment to, uh, to the substitute motion, and that would be to include number three along with one and four to be a request for staff to come back with a feasibility report on the ability to include affordability covenants. I'll second that. I'll, say, I'll accept it. Sorry. Yeah, make sorry. the motion. Yeah. And you're the you were the second on the motion. Okay. So you you agree? You'll accept it. Can you just repeat that one more time? One and three. Yeah, just to add three to uh, Councilmember Brown's one and four. So it'll be one, three, and four from so the site standards. Okay. We'll do a clarification question, and then we'll vote on the substitute motion. Okay. So, admittedly, I'm new to the council. I'm I'm trying to catch up on um, sort of where this fits in the overall housing blueprint process, um, as well as trying to acknowledge and achieve affordability as well. What I worry is that we are moving, uh, we are dependent on single family homeowners to take the step to try to build an ADU. And um, uh, many of these people are not gonna have the resources to build the ADU and then also make that ADU an affordable unit. So I worry a little bit that we are using a program which was meant to actually increase our housing supply, and by having more supply, hopefully we would also um, realize some affordability benefits as well. Um, and we're now making it into an affordable housing program. And uh, I don't know that, I don't, I'm not saying that's the intent, but I think we're sort of mixing objectives <clears throat> And I think we have three objectives that came out of the out of the blueprint process. One is to protect our existing supply. M one is to get more supply into our system and a variety of housing types. Um, and one is to, to deal with the affordability issues. So I just wanna make that comment. Um, I won't be able to support the motion because um, I feel like this is a very um, proactive way for us to put more supply into our system and we're gonna we, we may hamstring the results of that. So that's just that comment. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So let's let's go ahead for the in the interest of moving the item along. I think um, we'll go ahead and take a vote on the substitute motion, which is to essentially um, remove uh, items one, four, and five. Pardon one, me. One, three, and four. One, <laughs> one, three, and three. four. And four. four, one, three, and four for uh, further uh, exploration for affordability and uh, move forward with items two and five at this time. So all those in favor of the substitute motion, please say aye. 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 No, all those opposed? No. no. So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, no. Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings uh, in support and Matthews, myself, and Myers um, against. Okay, so let's move on to the, uh, okay, this is the time now for us to take action and deliberation, thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to the last section, okay? Yeah. Mayor, this, yeah. can I ask really quick, did you do a vote on the first motion? No. It was Not a yet. substitute okay. motion. That passed. The first. Um, I have another <laughs> motion for the um, state law requirements. Oh, that we did. That we, did, we voted yeah. on that. Yeah. Yes, that was, yeah, yeah, that yeah, passed yeah. unanimously. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so the final um, items for us for consideration include, this is the final set, correct? Okay. Yes. Um, one through four. So now is an opportunity for action and deliberation. Council Member Matthews. Uh, do we just say how we feel about these? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, or some yeah. comments and if that's okay. Time is First. clicking here. Right. Are there any items, maybe the better question, or are there I'm, any I'm that... I'm 
not in favor of two ADUs on large lots. I am adam adamantly opposed to short-term rentals as an incentive for ADU. I think it absolutely goes against the intent of ADU uh, legislation. Um, I could entertain the eliminating of parking requirements. I'm ambivalent about that. And in terms of modifying definition of the owner occupant to include members of immediate family, I'm in favor of that. Okay. I mean, so I don't know how others are, but. I'm wondering if any of these items, any, if it, just to get kind of a consensus on the council, if the council feels at, any, at this time prepared to move any of these specifically, one through four. And if not, then. Four, definitely. Okay. So do you want to make a motion to move? Um, make a motion to uh, approve item four as listed on the PowerPoint. Second. Okay, motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Vice Mayor. I have a, a few issues with the definition of owner occupant and um, the terms on which the owner shouldn't le be living on the premise. Um, I think that it would be good if there's clear language. Some of the concern that I've been hearing um, is that if someone, you know, maybe gets sick or has to take care of a sick relative that they may have to, or they need to go out of town for whatever reason, for work, what have you, and they need to leave that site, that they would want to be able to continue renting that out without being on, this, being on site. The issue I have with that is that if that's an undetermined amount of time, then people can say, I'm leaving because of X, Y, and Z, and then they can leave for 20 years and there's no owner on site in terms of owner occupancy. So I, I feel that um, there should be language that's clear stating how long another person, or if it's not the owner, how long the owner can be off site in order to um, rent it out without being there. That's just I, I agree with you on that, but I think that is not the issue in number four. Issue in number four is simply the definition of what an owner occupant <coughs> is. It includes their immediate right. parents right. or children. I, uh, that's my understanding. Okay. That's right. yeah. so it's a, a little bit um, different in that. Right. If, I, if I could offer just um, Vice Mayor Cummings, we do have a provision in the in the ordinance where if a property owner is going to be absent from the property just entirely, um, they they can apply to the city. They submit an application. It's reviewed by City Council. City Council can approve um, an absence of up to two years and allow rental of both units. In that case, one of the units must be rented to a low-income household. And um, then there's a one-year extension that can be granted at a staff level of that two-year approval. So we do have a program like that. And then this, what's here on the slide is about modifying the definition of owner-occupant to allow a family member to stand in. Okay. So that's the motion, if um, I understand, is to move forward with number four, um, made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by uh, Councilmember Glover. Um, Further discussion on that? Yeah, I have, you know, I have some concerns about this because I believe it's a bit of a slippery slope, um, and it does um, allow someone to be to be defined. It redefines owner occupant. I mean, that we're we're talking about this as a as an insignificant change, but I believe it actually is because it's allowing uh, non-owner and non. Um, um, you know, the, a, a property owner that's not the occupant, that's not the actual owner, to be. Uh, on the site, and so I think that is something that we ought to have further discussion about. Um, so the, my understanding is it's immediate family, essentially. It would only be immediate family. Who? Yeah. So, but it, this is. I mean, it's. It's. I guess on my, the point I'm trying to make is that it's. Um, it really get, provides an opening for some manipulation of the um, okay. definition of owner. I'm, I can't support that. But what if they put um, the person on the deed? Would that be a compromise if they put the family member that's, on the deed? That's currently in the code. That's just mm -hmm. Anyone who's on deed at 50% is considered a property owner. And so, part of the logic... So would the, excuse me, but would the family ahead. member have to be on the deed then or not? Um, the way that the proposal is that they would not have to be on the deed. The, the property owner would not be um, compelled to add a, someone to the deed to their property. Um, in order to allow them to occupy and manage the property in their stead. They would have to be re related by, you know, marriage, blood, adoption, 
step what, what would be wrong with um, adding them to the deed? If they're so there, family. Are, there, are some, there are some reasons that, that property owners may choose not to do that. <coughs> Yeah. Hmm. There, are some, there are some reasons that property owners may choose not to do that. One example that we've had recently is a property owner, um, elderly couple who owns the property. One of their children lives on the property, but they, they have three children. And their intention is for that property to stay in the family moving forward and to be equally distributed among their three children. So they are not inclined to just simply add one child to the deed. So that's just one example that we've encountered. Um, but I, I think that there are similar reasons. Folks. And it still doesn't get around the issue that Mr. Smedberg brought up about, um, you know, son-in-law, no, nobody's occupying that place right, right. now. Right, yes, exactly. He's not allowed to rent both units. Okay, so shall we move with the, okay? Yep, okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to move with this. So I think, you know, all those in favor with moving forward with number four, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Yeah, I, yeah. I second it, but I've, after listening to the conversation, I'm Okay, so that fails um, with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Glover, Councilmember Crone not supporting moving forward at this time um, on number four. So I'm, I'm hearing that in general, the council is not prepared to take any action on items one and through three in addition to four at this point, correct? I'm not hearing a motion. Uh, move forward on any of those. Yeah, I'd make a motion similar to the other ones to take items one through four of the land use amendments to find out if there are ways to incorporate uh, affordability covenants in the two large ADUs, the temporary short-term rental agreements, uh, or striking that completely, and then looking at parking requirements and how we may be able to incorporate uh, alternate forms of transportation benefits or uh, incentives as opposed to requirements of a parking space, like the owner may be required to provide a jump bike pass or a bus pass to the tenant for transportation. Is there a second? Second. second. Chris. Okay. I'm not in favor of moving forward on the short-term rental thing, period. Is there consensus from the council to not move forward with exploring any more into the short-term rental? Uh, option of staff time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go ahead and remove that as uh, an option to further kind of explore. Um, so there's a motion by Glover, seconded by Brown. Crone. I'm sorry. Speaking by Crone um, to further explore items one through one, one three, one, and four. One and three, and then yeah, and four with regards to the concerns that were brought up by the council okay. about the issue of definition and. Slippery slippiness. Okay. All right. Is there any further discussion at this time? Councilmember? Murphy? I just want to clarify. Um, I thought four was pretty straightforward, but uh, in referring that for further discussion, is that one also to be linked to affordability? No, I don't see how That's that immediate would family. be relevant. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, that would be separate. So one and three would be to look for affordability covenants that could be included in it, as well as alternative forms of transportation incentives, and then four to address the issues expressed around the definition of owner occupant and what that okay. pertains. I, I do have a really quick suggestion. If we could m move forward on owner occupancy, get information, it may be that people's concerns are set aside between now and the second reading, and then we could move forward. So, Thoughts from I anyone else? that out there. Is it, are you offering that as an amendment to the motion? I think that would have to. You can make a friendly amendment to, to accept one, that. A, a second motion. Oh. Or maybe the motion would be, let me see, referring, what make was it, one and three. three for further work linking it to affordability and accepting and move forward forward with number four pending clarification prior to the second reading. We can always delete it at the second reading. I'm seeing nods, fellow council members. Okay. Uh, As a make I will I will accept that friendly amendment to okay. my motion. Okay. Did you I catch that? No, I have some questions. Okay. So I'll watch the video. It's fine. It's, no, so essentially, what <laughs> understand where we're going with this? No. Uh, I, well, so I understand the motion you've just made. What I don't understand is what you want on number four. <laughs> leave it. Leave it as is. Just leave it as is. Yep. And for those no, no slippiness. Okay. Then we could 
get, get them the They'll information they in need the between reading. now and the second reading. Which, and those questions have been asked tonight, and I missed them, or they're going to they come to me in an email? Yeah, for the clarification. I see. I'll be in touch. Great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Quick question. Where would the, um, the issue of the ADU in the multi-res, where would that come into any of this? Like, if we wanted staff... We wanted staff to um, speed up the, you know, getting back to the council within. Uh, Let's just. No, no, I'm just saying where we would it fit in. We'll, we'll later. later. Let's finish up this okay. one and we'll wrap this one up and then we'll move forward with that. Okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So then, lastly, is on direction. These resolutions to adopt. Okay. And I. I talked okay. to staff um, previously on this, and I think, tell me if I've got the right language, adopt the resolution to submit the ordinance amendments for coastal and adopt the resolution to approve. Oh, and so number one would include the language, additional language, including the amendments made at this, this, this evening. Yeah. So you'll move that? I will move. Adoption of the resolution to all these co codes, including the amendments made this evening, uh -huh. and adopt a re resolution, et cetera, reducing the general plan maintenance fee. Okay. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. That passes unanimously. So now before we close the item, can we use this opportunity to. Right, so this is now the opportunity for further direction. So, Councilmember Cohen, I'll, I'll turn to you because this would be the opportunity for you to. Yeah, I mean, if we could look at that issue of putting an ADU in a multi-res because it doesn't, on the face of it, make sense that you can't. Um, I'd also like to have staff look into some incentives. If we're, if we're lifting green, um, um, green building requirements, <coughs> is there ways that we can infuse and incentivize uh, ADU builders to um, build green, such as installing even, you know, solar on the roof? I mean, that would be a, a start. And, and, or, and also, um, the third thing would be a loan program. Uh, can, we, can we come back with a loan program and figure out how other places are doing it? We heard one um, example tonight. So. Uh, so my understanding is that for the incentives for um, green building, that was already delayed, correct? Okay, so that will be coming back with that consideration. Um, so you're asking for staff to explore the loan fee deferral type programs. Yeah, how, how could we build that in and, and, and provide loans for folks? Okay, and then, and I'm sorry, and the third? Multi-res, um, multi uh, ADU in a multi-residential. Okay. Uh, is there any other discussion? Well, I'm just, if I could clarify, um, Council Member Crone, is your request to, I mean, was that to ask staff to um, report back to us on the pursuit of the county, the county strategy that I believe Mr. No, Graham. not necessarily, maybe to go a little wider than that and figure out if other places have, have done something um, through some sort of fee structure that created a pot for people to draw from who maybe make under the median income, which we learned is 87,000 for a family of four. Okay. Is there any other input? I just had one I'd like to add. And then um, one of the things I was wondering if we can maybe find a way to track um, the applications coming in to identify which of the um, modifications was the incentive for them specifically so we can help identify what we're seeing um, the biggest movement in terms of production or interest in production. So it could be, I don't know, a survey or some way to kind of get some data around how are we yielding the impact that we hope to see. Um, I think we're more than able to do that. Uh, any sense of the time frame you'd like us to look at, considering that we're averaging somewhere between 35 and 50 a year? Is there a threshold or a number that you'd like to see as a statistical? I think we could look at baseline data in okay. terms of average, and then once these modifications are in place, we can look at who is now applying to have an ADU, okay. and if we could even further ask why it was that they are 
seeking this at this time, what was the, one of those modifications that actually made the difference for them? It sure. could be helpful for us to understand sure. where we saw the biggest result from these types of policy changes. I think for that to be valuable, we'd want to look at it over a course of maybe six to 12 months. Absolutely. Okay. No problem, okay. no rush on that. Um, and then additionally, I have one other, and that's to um, think about the age in place and the, the incentive around trying to increase the opportunity for families to um, rent. And if somebody is thinking about building an ADU um, to age in place, that we can incentivize them renting for families, knowing that that's a huge need for our community and was identified as one in a previous report. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so that actually dovetails with a program the city already has, an existing okay. program with um, Habitat for Humanity called right. My House, My Home, yeah. which the intention there is to serve um, low income senior homeowners to be able to construct an ADU on their property. Um, and the way that the um, financing for that is structured, it's really tailored to seniors who are going to be owning their home for less than 30 years um, because of the way that the loan gets repaid. Um, but so there is some work that's already being done uh, on that to address that issue of aging in place and providing, you know, um, living accommodations for caretakers. Right. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other council members? I have another just clarifying question related to Council Member Crone's comments. Um, are in the so direction um, to regarding the, um, the further eight, um, housing blueprint subcommittee recommendations to be analyzed and returned to us within six to nine months is I believe the window that is being dis discussed here. Y you're in wanting to include um, clarification or um, permission of ADUs in multi residential districts as part of that, or you want that to come back at a, more quickly? I think it's pretty clear that you know, we're gonna miss a season if, you know, I think it should come back to us sooner. I, I, I yes. just wanna, yeah, I agree. And I just wanna make sure that we capture that in the recommendations made to staff now. What's a reasonable time frame? Three months, does that work or? Be realistic I, I, about your work program. Yeah, again, it really does have to, it depends on the work pro program. Uh, to be very candid with the council right now, our team only has two full-time staff um, pro project managers, and we do have a pretty intensive workload from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee. About 65% of that workload, 75% of that workload falls to uh, this division, as well as the new um, stuff that we're talking about with our task force for tenant and renter protections. And so while I want to be as proactive as possible and get things back to the council as soon as possible. We have to be really realistic in terms of our staffing. So I think some direction on expectations from you guys in terms of priority would be really helpful. Okay. Okay. Just make a quick comment on that. Um, you know, I, I read all, all of the public comment over the last um, many, many months and many, many efforts to, um, and, and I know we did receive both uh, oral comment today and also a letter regarding that, but um, I would prioritize that a little lower than some of the other things um, that uh, we're requesting of you. I'm not completely clear exactly what we're requesting at this point, but um, based on everything that I've seen, um, as well as the comment I heard from the planning director, um, understanding how this fits into our larger housing strategy and not responding, responding to just you know um, a specific need. I think, again, we are... Um, we're missing the bigger picture, and uh, I'd like to see us kind of be thoughtful and um, understand what our planning staff has said, which is, you know, we need to look at our housing program as a whole. And uh, so I would I would rank that pretty low in our list of, of new things to look at. Okay. All right. So. Uh, quick comment. Um, in terms of prioritization, I'm, I, I, I completely understand that. I, um, my understanding, though, is this is not um, simply an individual request, although it has been expressed to us by one um, property owner. So um, w with that, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting that we make this a high priority um, in response to one property owner alone. I'm looking at that situation, that, that type of case overall. Um, is it possible to find out how many, um, I mean, not in terms of interest, but how many how many um, parcels that might affect? Um, I don't wanna overcomplicate this, but I, it is a high priority for me, um, given that at least three ADUs might get built if, if we don't delay on this. 
Um, so is this, is your question specific to um, wanting staff to research um, 80, the feasibility of ADUs in multi-residential districts that are not solely tied to a single family home? I have a comment okay. to add on this. Sure. So um, there is a chance that we could be preempted on this by state legislation. There was legislation last year that failed <laughs> to pass that would have created exactly this provision. Um, that same legislation has been reintroduced and is making its way through the legislature. So. What I'm cognizant of as, as staff is not um, doing a lot of work and a lot of outreach to put something in place that within six months is then, super, is then created by state law when we could have just waited for state law because we'll be back making those other changes that state law is doing. So let's just take a, a broad view of what we're gonna be doing on ADUs over the next 18 months, right? So we have um, stuff we're already working on, junior ADUs, with the fees, all of that. We have a we have new direction now on um, things to look at that were in this package to tie them to affordability in some way, shape, or fashion that makes sense, right? So we're gonna be working on that. And then also we're following the state legislation. So far there's I'm aware of only one bill, but I am sure there will be more. So whatever passes at the end of this year, we are gonna be coming back in January to adopt. So we're we're looking at a minimum of three amendments to this program over the next year, which that that's a significant portion of, like that's a significant amount of churn, I, I guess is what I'm saying, and I'm I'm hesitant to add another piece to that when it could be rolled in. That said, that's my, that's that said, though, in the in the interest of transparency, I do want council to understand that just like with any legislative bottle, body, there's no certainty or guarantee that right. any of that stuff will be passed at the state level. Okay. So um, yeah. it, you have to weigh, does it make sense for us to do something that now that may already be passed or may, this is the same quandary that we were in this time last year. Mm -hmm. We were talking with the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee about bring, how, how swiftly do we move in advance of state legislation? Do we wait? Do we not? Uh, these, are, these are things for, for you guys to deliberate. So in the interest of time, do you want to make a motion? My, this is just uh, general yeah, direction. I'm do, I, is, will this now require, if, should, do I need to make a motion about it? I thought this was just staff direction. It's staff in direction. terms of the, the prioritization, I would just make the point that if this is already something that is going to potentially be coming back to us um, and preempted, preempted by state law, what's the, I'm just gonna you know, ask the question, what's the harm in doing it in advance? In this case, I think it's a priority enough for, for when I'm asking myself that question, it's enough of a priority to do that because it doesn't lead to additional work in the future if we've just already done it. I, I'm just gonna say that same thing. I would tend to agree. And okay. I think that we should, I think it, we should pursue it. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. I'm really sensitive to what's being dumped on the staff to do and I think at the very least, um, you've heard the concerns that the staff takes direction only from an action of the council as a whole. So if that's to become a priority for staff work in the near future, that should be adopted by a motion of the council as a whole. I'm gonna put the ball back in you guys' court. You've heard a lot of things people wanna work on and you have your work plan. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so. Could we come back at a future meeting with with a report on all the stuff you've got? Maybe okay. this is our goal session, our sure. retreat, but uh -huh. yeah, let's see what you guys have on your calendar. And we could do the prioritization. And, and then we can do the prioritization and give direction Makes sense. as a council as a whole. Okay. As, as a, I mean, I think Councilmember Brown was asking about coming back to us with how many properties are affected by this. I mean, that, that's something I would think that we could, we could get that information. I think, I, you know, mean, if you're, if you're asking for a data point, that's something we can provide this week. Is that, that, is that that's the, not a problem. The data point? A data point is not a problem to create. Uh, to coming back with an ordinance amendment, um, there is just, there is process and churn and hours of staff time that are associated with that, regardless of how small or large that amendment may be, it really, that affects such a small portion of the work that we have to do to create it and bring it back to you, which I know you understand that. I just, you know, in in, in light of, we're gonna be bringing back other recommendations um, in the context of having, you know, other workload and other priorities, we're just sure. asking for some clarification. You wanna be clear on what you're asking? Is it just on the data point or is it well, for the, the data, data point? Well, the data point will affect my thinking about this. So, so okay, I think so we'd like to get point. the data point. Okay, so in we could return with the data point or share that information. With I think we could. I think we could do that if council is comfortable with that um, via a informational memo or something of that nature. That will give you more information um, to give us future further direction. On the other items, however, I think it's really important that we do do our due diligence. We do do our 
outreach to the community and get a sense from them on how they're feeling about some of these things, and that does take time, especially with the other priorities. So I just wanna communicate, please don't feel that we are um, not interested in doing the work, it's just that the resources are limited and all of this is so important that the clarity from <coughs> the council on priorities is really, really helpful. So I think we're Thank you. Good. Okay, at this point, I think we, yeah, oh, go ahead. No, okay, yeah. I think we're good. We got it. I think we're at a place of consensus at this time. I thank you for your work and time and thank the community for being here and, and expressing their interest in the item. At, at this point, I'd like to move on to the next item. I think um, so one more thing. We, we have one more. Well, so uh, from the staff perspective, and please let us know if we missed this, but I don't feel that we got clarity or closure on this particular item. We, really what we wanna know from the staff perspective is, is this something you'd like us to continue to pursue or is it a non-starter? Um, there are options with this. Uh, there, we've, we've reached out a little bit to the community, but we did feel like we needed a little more more um, conversation with council on the direction. Um, so I think just a little clarity on this would be really helpful. Okay. Well, in light of the conversation I think we just had, as well as the other conversation around owner occupancy, I think it'd be fine to postpone a uh, major outreach around this at this time, personally. Is there others that feel differently? I feel like um, <laughs> this might be an item to consider if we're able to provide some, you know, guidelines for affordability around housing. So, you know, allowing there to not be owner occupancy given different types of ownership and different types of like levels of affordability, I think is worth discussing and bringing forward since that's such a big issue, since affordability is a big issue. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I was gonna say. Okay. I, I so we'll tie it to the affordability. affordability. Okay, great. Thank you. Great, and, definitely. You know, just on the record, I feel really strongly about keeping the owner occupancy. I think otherwise it's just city's just wide open for sure. Okay. Land land, land rush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same here. I agree. I'll go on record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, I will move us along to the next item, which is item number twenty-four. Can we give make a motion prior to I'm gonna open it up to um, um, when he's ready, Mr. Kandati. Tony, for item number 24, the second reading of the ordinance. Yes. Did you want to introduce that item or, I'm sorry, was uh, it Lee? The planning director has a brief uh, PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. Good afternoon again, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director, and I'll go through this quickly, but um, uh, for clarity with the public, there were lots of changes last time um, at our last meeting, and just wanted to go through those. So uh, the first reading of an interim just cause eviction ordinance was approved at the last meeting on the 8th of January. There were various changes, and there was also direction to bring back recommendations related to a community process, and so that'll be at one of your upcoming meetings. And um, quickly going through the interim just cause eviction ordinance um, and paraphrasing here uh, sets forth reasons for allowing evictions as failure to pay rent, breach of lease, except for the end of the lease term or addition of specified replacement or additional tenants um, that are meeting the criteria identified in the ordinance. Um, nuisance and criminal activity as well as failure to give access can result in an eviction. Um, also repairs requiring temporary vacancy um, would um, uh, be a reason for allowing an eviction. Owner move-in under certain limitations can do that. Withdrawal of the unit from the rental market permanently. Actually, that's withdrawal of all the units on the property from the rental market. And um, there's some specifications there in the ordinance. And then um, one that was added at that last meeting was uh, landlord reoccupancy within one year if that landlord had occupied the property for at least a year um, preceding that. There were a series of changes um, from the ordinance that was presented on 1-8, and so I wanted to just call those to the public's attention and to the council's attention. <clears throat> one was an exemption um, for 
um, properties where in on a, a property with a single family residence, a duplex or a single family residence with an accessory dwelling unit, if the landlord lives on site, then that property would be exempted from the just cause eviction provisions. The expiration was changed to uh, one year from the effective date of the ordinance or upon council's future action on the issue of um, the just cause eviction and tenant, uh, other tenant protections. And then um, there were various changes to allowances for new tenants. There were some provisions that referenced the word partner and that was changed to registered domestic partner. Um, there were some references to the maximum number of occupants based on a housing code, those were removed. And then there was a requirement for um, a new uh, tenant who is not a family member or a registered domestic partner to um, submit an application to the landlord. And the landlord um, could not deny um, based solely on the lack of credit worthiness and solely was added to the um, uh, ordinance provisions. Um, then um, nuisance and criminal activity. Um, there was uh, language added to include uh, the, the nuisance or criminal activity were affecting adjacent neighbors. And then there was a provision that spoke to um, if a resident, if a tenant had been living there for five years, then there were additional protections for that tenant in terms of uh, preventing evictions. And that five year resident criteria was removed from the ordinance. So that's paraphrasing, but it captures the, um, the categories of changes. And that concludes the presentation. We're available for any questions you may have. Okay. So my understanding is that this is the second reading. So with the second reading, any major modifications to the proposed ordinance would constitute a first reading, correct? Any substantive changes made this evening would require it to be brought back for a second reading at a future meeting. Okay. At, okay. A, at a regular meeting. At a regular meeting. Okay, any, uh, any questions? Question for um, Lee. Um, so it, this might have already, you might have said this, but the 62 and over and disabled was to also taken out, right? The 62 and over remained in the ordinance. There was a provision, so you, you had sent in a question um, that came in from a, a member of the public, and there is a provision that was added, and I'll, I'll circle back up to that, and it is, oh, it's, it's here, so landlord reoccupancy within one year following occupancy for at least a year. Um, so that partially addressed the, the question that you were asking, but the, the provision related to um, the additional protections afforded to individuals who are 62 or older who, or who are qualifying as disabled, that provision remained in the first reading and is presented to you this evening as part of the second reading. Any additional questions by council members at this time? I have a question for Tony. If we wanted to make um, a, a separate motion, would we be able to do so before public comment or make comments um, about this before our direction forward prior to public um, comment? Really only a motion to table uh, any substantive action that the council would take tonight or to, or to schedule a uh, another topic for discussion at a future meeting, but any substantive action that you would take tonight on this ordinance would require public comment before you um, before you take that action. Your motion. So I would like to make a motion to table with some comments, kind of just like explaining that. Okay, so you can move that. I, you're making a motion to table. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. So there's a motion by Vice Mayor Cumming, seconded by. Councilmember Myers to table the item and now discussion can ensue. Okay. And I think tabling has no discussion. Tabling has no discussion. Is that correct? Is that correct? Um, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we have a discussion about uh, specific actions that I anticipate uh, Council or Vice Mayor Glover is going to recommend be brought back for consideration at a subsequent meeting and then following that um, entertain the motion to table. Okay, so for the second reading of this, you're suggesting he express his interest in? Yeah, as I, yeah, actually, as I'm thinking this through, um, the council could give further direction since calendar is the next item on your agenda. I think I feel yeah. more comfortable yes. with that. So, so you could table this item and then the council could give direction to bring back for consideration at a future regular or special meeting uh, a number of uh, items that I think 
I anticipate council member, or vice mayor Glover will Cummings. <laughs> Cummings. <laughs> I'm just Are curious because me, I know that there's just some. Just give me a couple of months and I'll <laughs> straighten it up. Okay, so you, we have a motion to move the item. Um, that su suffice to what your needs are, if you could address. I think that it would be good for the public to understand why this item, there's a suggestion for tabling the item, which is what I would like to do prior to tabling or have an opportunity when it's being tabled to express this because it doesn't seem like there'll be any space otherwise. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Actually, I'd, I'd like to hear really quickly before. Um, I think what the um, parameters are within that. Vice Mayor Cummings could certainly introduce the concept of what he's proposing and then make the motion to table. Okay, why don't you go ahead and introduce the concept that you're proposing without any substantive direction and then we can make the motion. Just not to be a stickler, but I think a motion to table has to be voted on. That's, that would be my understanding too, but I'm hearing otherwise from our attorney. Yeah, a motion to table has to be a, an up or down vote without debate, correct? So the motion could be withdrawn. But then, th there you go. <laughs> so if I withdraw the motion, then we can go through public yes. comment and then we can, okay. We have to hear from the public yeah. if we yeah. aren't tabling with notice. I'll withdraw the motion to table. I mean, that sounds technical, but I, I do think it's a good idea to adhere to these rules so that we, sure. okay. yeah. So I, I mean, I actually appreciate council member Matthews pointing out that. Okay. So you've withdrawn your motion to yep. table the item at this time. Okay, so are there any questions before we open it up to public comment? No, okay. Who here is um, interested in speaking on this item? Okay. I, we, I was just wondering if, excuse me, if um, Council, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Cummings wanted to explain where he was going with it so the public would know as they're addressing, they could address those comments too or something. Would that be acceptable or would that be appropriate? Mr. Kandani, can you discuss it without it being agenda? Council can't have a substantive discussion about the item without it being agendized. So the dis so the the discussion of direction to staff to agendize for consideration of, at a future meeting has to be limited. But I think that some discussion can be had to introduce the item, you know, the the idea or the reason for. Uh, requesting it. I'm not sure if I'm following I, with that. that was, I'm sorry, I, was, I wasn't clear on what that. <laughs> First, can we just deal with the tabling issue? Uh, has the motion been withdrawn? Yes. Okay. So, I, I don't see a problem with um, the vice mayor discussing what he's proposing at this before point. Before we open it up to public yeah. comment. Okay, feel free to go ahead and discuss what you're so having heard from a lot of members of the community, um, those who were in favor of supporting Measure M, those who were opposed to Measure M, and then um, many people throughout the community who um, think that we need some form of tenant protections and rent control, but thought that Measure M wasn't the way. Um, many of these people have expressed wanting to come together and work um, to try to come to some form of consensus around um, how we should be moving forward with regards to any kind of temporary just cause um, ordinance at this time while we work on getting the task force in place. Um, I wanna be respectful of the folks who, um, of our community who have been you know, really expressing concern around, around the fact that the city council has been taking the lead on creating a temporary ordinance and the community has been wanting more of a process where they have an opportunity to work together. And so um, that is some of the um, justification that I've had moving forward with considering tabling this for a later date. Um, additionally, I just wanna put out there that there are um, concerns coming in from members of the community who have been receiving um, eviction notices, some of whom worked on the Measure M campaign and see it as retaliation for their participation in the democratic process. Um, there are also um, members of our community who are um, facing higher um, rent increases as well in addition to that. And I just wanna put that out there because I think that if members of our community are very concerned and really wanna work on 
um, kind of coming together to think about what we can craft as a whole that is gonna help our community. I would very much encourage members from MHJ, a movement for housing justice and for Santa Cruz together to come together and work with members of the city council on actually trying to come up with something that will help our community. Um, I know that myself and Donna Myers have been working together and are interested in reaching out to uh, members of those groups. Um, I've also been working with Drew Glover on some of these issues and other members of city council have been very much invested in working on these issues. So um, that is the rationale moving forward with trying to table this to another moment in time. And so um, I'd like to stop there and now he can make the motion to table. Now the options are to make a motion to table now, and then during your discussion of the calendar, discuss setting additional items for consideration at a future meeting, or hear from the public now before you entertain a motion okay. at all. So I think it's important that we uh, listen to the public who have been here and waiting for hours to speak and share their perspective on the issue. Um, also, um, uh, I totally respect and acknowledge the attempt of my colleagues in trying to find middle ground in what this ordinance should look like. Uh, while it's commendable at the lengths they have gone, especially over the last few days with back-to-back -back meetings with different groups, I'm disappointed at the way that things have unfolded. Uh, going into the weekend, uh, Councilmember Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself came up with a compromise, which we all agreed would potentially work, uh, a way to move forward that allowed for the protections of renters, uh, especially those ex experiencing retaliatory uh, evictions, uh, as, uh, while removing some of the most controversial parts of the uh, readings, which I've heard from the community members are the 62 years and older, the restrictions of people being able to move into their homes, the amount of people living in the houses with the subleasing agreements. So all of these were taken into consideration. Um, but, uh, and also extending the uh, application timeline so landlords would have 30 days instead of 14 days to be able to reject or accept a subleaser uh, agreement. And in fact, we were so united that we went and met with uh, City Attorney Condotti to ask him to craft the language so that we could tonight pass this language temporarily with instruction for the next meeting to have the agendized version of the alternative and amended uh, ordinance to be uh, voted on and then moved into a second reading. So that would have appeased and dealt with the issues and the concerns of landlords and it would have protected renters in the rental market that are facing evictions. What's problematic is that through the threat of referendum and recall, we have seen a pressure put on this council to make it so that those that were involved with that plan have completely abandoned it now to table the issue. While I understand it's important to be able to build that consensus around the community, if we table the issue now, we're putting the people that received evictions from December 11th till now in dire circumstances where they will, in reality, lose their housing without any kind of recourse. If we pass this tonight and move forward with goodwill, assuming that we're going to be able to find a middle ground over the next couple of weeks while we wait for the task force to get put together, then we'll have the opportunity not only to find middle ground, not only to address the concerns of the community, but also to protect renters, which I think should be our most pertinent issue. So I will encourage okay. us to open it up for the community. Okay, so what I, I, what I like to do is that if there is a motion to table We'll go ahead and entertain that motion if it has a second vote. If that uh, it passes, then we'll conclude this item and open it up for community discussion when it returns. And if it doesn't, then we'll open it up for community discussion. So is there a motion to table this item? I would make a motion to hear from the public. I, I agree with what um, Councilmember Glover said. The people came here, you know, the, we're, we're, we're their government. We, we have a duty to listen to them. Second. Uh, so is there a motion to so to make sure the folks in public get, Did you have get give their voice or are able to speak? Okay, if there's, I don't hear a motion to table. Am I hearing a motion to table this item at this time? I believe it was later. withdrawn, and I'm admittedly a little confused on our process right now. Um, so, uh, so uh, Tony, I yeah, I'd like I the my I, as I understand the motion to table was withdrawn. That's right. So unless there's another motion to table after people have had a chance to speak, which I heard was what we could do. Which you, you could do that as well. 
Okay, so I'm not. You have a motion on the floor now that's been seconded. I'm gonna. Okay, so we'll go ahead. And I'm gonna make another motion to table the item. So you're making a substitute motion yes. to table the item. Is there a second for that motion? Why don't we want to hear from the? I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. Let's, thank you. Do you have? Do we? Are you seconding to table it? Can we table after? Hey, I, excuse me. <laughs> thank you. Not at this moment, because I think that we should hear from the public if they're. Okay. So okay. So this is okay. So we, I don't know if we need to vote on that at this point. There's no. If there's no motion to table the item, that doesn't really matter. Essentially, we can. We would open it up for public comment. Okay. That's right. This is comment on the second reading. We've heard extensive comment on the first reading. So we had about two and a half hours of comment. I um, did hear from um, a few folks in advance. I would like to offer them two minutes and then subsequently one minute and we'll hear it until 7 p.m. Go ahead. Um, the motion to hear from members of the public is debatable. It's I think with the oh. response to council member. Yeah, I mean, call okay. would you, all those in favor of hearing from the public at the <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 okay. We that's need a, a motion decision you can make as well. Yeah. So I made that decision. We can go ahead and hear from the public. Uh, excuse me, are you, I heard from two organizations. I'm from one of the organizations. What organization are you from? I'm Casey Carlson from the Greater Santa Cruz Federation of Teachers. We contacted Chris Monroe, our superintendent, and myself wrote a That's right. letter. Okay, so you'll you'll be given two minutes. Um, Santa Cruz together will be given two minutes, and the tenants united will be given two minutes, and then every additional uh, speaker will be given one minute until 7 p.m. Essentially, okay. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. I'm Casey Carlson. I'm the president of the Greater Santa Cruz Federation of Teachers. So we represent the certificated employees in all the schools in our district, which is the city and then Harbor High and um, SoCal High. So our superintendent and myself wrote an email this weekend um, when it became apparent that um, this ordinance, you know, we don't know the final version of it, but it could um, make it impossible for us to go forward with our workforce housing. So I'm not here to take a position on the ordinance. We're just here to ask that um, whatever the ordinance is that's adopted, that you would make an exemption for our workforce housing. And I'll try to explain as obviously housing is a huge issue and it's really hard to attract and retain not just teachers, but classified employees as well. So our superintendent came up a couple of years ago with the idea of looking into workforce housing and visited a number of workforce housing projects throughout California. And we're still in the beginning phases, but we've identified a site and we have, you know, kind of tentative plans and it looks like it could be 82 units. But the way it would work, for the way workforce housing works is it has to be temporary in nature because it's a project where you're trying to help teachers new to your district, or you know, there could be possibly someone who has some change of circumstance in their life. And so you provide below market housing for them, um, but it has a limited time period. So at this point, we're looking at seven years and they have to be an employee of the district. And we're not at the point yet where we've worked out what happens if they resign in the middle of the year, we don't want them to lose their housing, but, but all, all of the bargaining units are gonna be part of that process. Um, but so we're not there yet, but we don't want um, to, you know, to be in a position where we can't go forward with this. The other piece that's difficult for us is the relocation fee. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And yeah. we wouldn't have the, the money to be able to provide that. Thank you. Thanks. Your time is up. Okay. Representing how, no, I'm sorry, you're, it, we're going through public comment. You'd have to get back in line and we have a couple people who are speaking in advance at this okay, time. Um, I'm so gonna not enact to, sovereignty. Not the time for you. I'm sorry, excuse me. That, so, no, um, no, please, please walk, step away. You have to get back and you'll, you'll be given one minute. I'm okay. totally with you. You'll, okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so you have uh, two minutes and then is, is it Olivia who's here? Okay, you'll be given two minutes and then two minutes. Uh, I have longer comments, but I'll submit them for thank the record. Uh, so council members, my name is Dan Coughlin. I'm a mom and pop landlord in the city and a co-founder of Santa Cruz Together. The grassroots campaign or organization comprised of homeowners, small business owners, community leaders, <coughs> renters, and other property owners. We formed one year ago in response to the council's late night emergency just cause eviction ordinance, and then again to prevent Measure M. 
We spent last year gathering peer-reviewed research, analyzing case studies from other rent-controlled municipalities, consulting experts, both state and local, tracking rental property sales, speaking with hundreds of property owners, homeowners, renters, and ran an honest campaign to inform this body and Santa Cruz voters of the extreme pitfalls of Measure M. The measure was soundly defeated in November by Santa Cruz voters, your constituents, <coughs> and not because of any particular, you know, special political savvy by myself or my compatriots, but because it was so fundamentally flawed that it was obvious that it would create huge disincentives to provide rentals or build new rental stock and would ultimately hurt the very tenants that you were trying to help through reduced supply, increased rents, and less maintained properties. Santa Cruz property owners communicated to us that, you, that a rent cap was a reasonable solution, but that the just cause provisions in the measure were at minimum unsound and at most an affront to the very foundation of property ownership and property rights. Despite the mountain of evidence otherwise, the hundreds of letters you've received and the rental housing sell-off, displaced tenants and in the November vote, you continue to rely on anecdotal stories and dubious rental price data to justify shoving through an ordinance that contains the most contentious elements of Measure M. No reputable data, no studies, and no formal public input. In short, we've lost faith in this council majority's ability to objectively lead in Santa Cruz housing policy and we're prepared to take actions and in matters into our own hands. As a grassroots organization, we're we're more than ample number of volunteers that are ready to resist this ordinance and we're prepared to continue to resist similar policies until the day Santa Cruz voters can rebalance this body with forward-thinking, reasonable, and facts-driven members. Uh, for audience members here that are interested in helping us keep the council in line, Thank you. And you feel, please website. do feel free to we'll submit the, Thank you. the comments. Okay, our next speaker. So I can't physically turn the microphone around, but this statement is directed uh, at the tenants behind me and those of you sitting in front of me. My name is Olivia Fisher-Smith and I'm an organizer with Students United with Renters. Um, last year, a lot of our time and energy went into canvassing and voter reg registration for Measure M. And despite Measure M's loss, SIR's work has always been grounded in the belief that the fight for housing justice is going to take more than just policy solutions. Right now, the little power that tenants do hold in this city lies within the policies that we are able to pass through our supposed political democracy and the candidates before me who we believe hold our best interests in mind. However, with no regulation of campaign donations plus the financial power of groups like the California Apartment Association, which individually spent somewhere around $352,000 on the campaign against rent control, democracy can be bent dramatically to favor the interests of landlords and developers over more, more vulnerable tenant voices. While many hope that the task force being discussed right now results in a net positive for tenants, our experiences with the opposition since November make this prospect less than hopeful. Last year, many people who voted no on M insisted that they would support renter protections if it felt like there had been more of a community process involved in its writing. However, the minute tenant advocates try to pass even the most minimal, temporary, bare bones tenant protections, we receive nothing but threats and promises to rescind. No one M landlords have given many fellow organizers and outspoken tenants retaliatory evictions, eviction notices for their political beliefs, and city council members have been, had their seats threatened for doing exactly what they were voted in office to do. The reason we're here today is because tenants don't have the money to buy an election. Tenants can hardly organize with the capacity of the opposition because most tenants work overtime to afford their rents. Look at us, we're broke students and we're here because we have to be. It's a shame that we did not have the financial means to send tens of thousands of dollars worth of mailers to pay for speakers, public phone surveys, large-scale canvassing operations. Money controlled the narrative, but we will control the future. So no matter what happens tonight, sir and our allies are determined to organize for eviction protections. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, each speaker will give you one minute. Um, I will, you'll be given one minute. No, you're, you're welcome to come up. You'll, we'll, you'll, be have, you'll have one minute. Um, we will hear public testimony until 7 p.m., at which time we will then move into oral communications. Um, so uh, this is just a reminder, the second reading of the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance specifically. So you can tailor your comments to that. Okay, specific. I, I hope that you do table it, because I think we need to clear the air on all the misinformation about, about landlords and how the economics of it works. And I did look at the data at UCSC about how much rents were increased. And it, if the worst case was a two bedroom apartment, which went up about 30% in a uh, uh, four year period that they have data for the latest data. And then you compare that to home prices, which went up a lot more like 34%. But if you look at all housing that on the UCSC data, it, it, the rents went up about 25%, 24%. 
uh, in that period. So actually, landlords are not keeping up with the price of housing, the, the wholesale price of housing. Uh, they are retail providers of housing. They must follow the wholesale price. I don't think people understand that. And it's not an outrageous, it, it, it's a perfect storm of inflation of home prices, yeah, which uh, have a lot of reasons and the bad guys for that are up in Washington, Thank not you. the landlords. Okay, next speaker. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Fred Antaki. I'm a commercial property manager and real estate broker here in Santa Cruz for the last 25 years. Uh, what is being proposed as a solution from some on the Council, I believe will definitely accomplish two things. It'll make it harder to be a housing provider. It'll make it harder to be a housing creator. And I am confident it will not effectively address the problem of affordable housing. Rather than trying to enforce affordability through a narrow mandate, I would encourage you to embrace pragmatic incentives for creating both permanent affordable and market rate housing. You will not get there by vilifying landlords or developers. You will make real progress on the housing affordability issue or crisis in Santa Cruz when you take practical actions to create more supply. This includes measures to incentivize sensible development like Owen Lawler Project on Pacific Avenue, partner with and support UCSC in the creation of more student and employee housing, and stand up to the vocal minority groups who do not represent the best interests of the overall community. And through this measure, are promoting a divisive and counterproductive you. and strategy. You're welcome, to, you're welcome to submit your Thank comments you. if you'd like. Okay, our next speaker. Good evening, Council. My name is Rosemarie McNair. And one of the things that I really, really hope for is that we can have the community back together and work together. The divisiveness that has been created by the Just Cause um, ordinance has placed a lot of angst on property owners who are bearing the brunt of, of the non-supply of housing, which they did not cause, they did not create, and they are alone cannot cure. But however, they are the ones that are taking on the burden of having their properties um, uh, mandated to have certain rents and so on and so forth and just cause evictions and whatever. The point I'm making is I've watched for 42 years as supply did not happen. And now we're, we've got to put the blame on somebody. And it just happens to be the, the property owner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Good evening again, Robin Cunningham. We, those of us who actually provide housing, need to have sure footing. We're making serious investments of time and money, many of us seniors who rely on the equation working so we can remain housed and will instead invest or build elsewhere if this council is gonna behave in a way that can't be trusted. If you can't enter into a contractual agreement with someone that's binding, then what's the point? What landlord would take that deal? You can't take, uh, you cannot inflict these ridiculous restrictions on landlords and expect this to make sense. It's not the way lives work. I don't think anyone is on board with those who might raise rents beyond a reasonable limit, but leave the just cause eviction piece out of this if you want landlords to stay in the game. Putting a heavy hand on our properties will not increase supply. Actually read the data, listen to the economists, and if that doesn't work, then try recounting the vote our city cast against it. Maybe some of you have good intentions, but this law is not gonna achieve thank the you. stated thank goals you. you claim to okay, have. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Good evening, my name is Elena Cohen and I've submitted my comments in writing. Um, I'd like to just highlight the most important points, which is that although the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance is better than the earlier JCE versions, I continue to believe that the ordi ordinance's substance and process for adoption will seriously harm most of those whom the ordinance is designed to protect and will erode the voters' trust in the council's competence and good faith. And most, I'm, I'm especially concerned about um, exposing everybody to uh, litigation costs and stress. And I also noticed in the um, ADU uh, comments about how stressed the, uh, the planning staff was in trying to uh, implement things competently. I really like the idea of, of what um, uh, Cummings said about doing the mediation with uh, the groups. And I really hope that that will happen. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Next speaker.
Hello. My name is Marta Aguilar, and I'm one of those tenants that received an eviction notice on December 12th with a eviction date of February 15th. And uh, today I had to make a decision on whether I'm going to accept a unit with a $275 rent increase or risk losing my rental that I live in. So I'm here to support you passing the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance with the understanding that there will be continued efforts to refine this to get a win-win because I think it's possible and it's going to take time. And if any of you, well, I know you all know, writing to perfection is, is endless. You can rewrite to death. So why not protect your, your people and continue to refine the ordinance? It make, I mean, I, it's a win-win to me in that situation. I think there is a win-win that's possible. Um, if you don't, if it's tabled, then tenants like us will lose our housing. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. Um, my name is Elise Casby. I'm a longtime activist. One of the things I've had to do as an activist is go through repeated sensitivity training uh, in terms of racial issues. I think as a predominant white body in a predominantly white city is it our duty to make sure that by this, the end of tonight, we know exactly who our mayor is and what his name is and what Drew Glover's name is and that he's not the vice mayor. That's number one. Number two, I am outraged to hear. I am just so upset to hear about this recall effort. After the, uh, the landlords were able to take our gargantuan amounts of money uh, to tilt this so-called democratic election in a time when we have so much inequality, robber barons predominant and the middle class is sinking. I think we need to see that the vulnerable people here are the tenants. They are not commodities. They are people and we must protect them. With a just cause of issue, I wanna move forward with uh, Drew's very generous Thank you. Uh, Thank ideas. You. Okay, Thank you. Next speaker. You'll be given one minute. <clears throat> My name is Ali Shah Mirza. <clears throat> I'm a citizen of Santa Cruz since 1981. And I just wanted to bring to your attention that I'm a foreigner, I, I'm from Iran, but you are well-educated city council members, lawyer staff that you have. Please take your time and understand what you are doing. Read the rental agreements that are in place. There are a lot of rental agreements that are a standard that we use, like California Association of Realtors or others. But by looking at it, I don't think you can tell me if, I've, if I'm 62 years old or 52 years old, you are putting a discrimination into this place that if I'm gonna go rent some place because of my looks, if I'm 62, they're not gonna rent it to me. So think about your action of what you're doing here to the tenants, okay? You're not really protecting the landlords. You're, you are hurting the tenants who are old. Thank okay, you. thank you. Next speaker. Hi, um, my name's Neil Langholds. Excuse me, this is his opportunity to speak. Did I say that out? Yes, you wow. did. So please, yeah. One person speaking before us, you can stop the time. Then it's your opportunity you to sure? speak without distraction. Because if she wants to talk first, You can first, go ahead and speak okay and address this. Thank you. Um, these dis discussions ignore the elephant in the room. The JC ordinance affects ordinary homeowners' ability to freely go about their lives. This isn't just a renter and housing provider issue. An ordinance like the JC ordinance has the city regulating what people can and cannot do with their houses, even after decades of paying mortgage and the high expense of living in this area. For example, if a homeowner rents to someone and they move in a family member who is over the age of 62, they may be blocked from living in their own house. That's crazy. Does council think they are being generous by letting people lease their houses freely for less than a year? but not after that, they are gravely mistaken. That is restrictive and not generous. Does council think that it is reasonable to create conditions? Okay. Thank you, you're welcome to submit your, your comments. Okay, next speaker. Uh, good evening, my name is Alistair Fife. Uh, first of all, sincere thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. 
Uh, I wanted to, to touch on the one comment that I haven't really heard addressed, which is there is there is some middle ground in this. Basically, it's in the trade-off between shrinking the existing rental supply and, on the other hand, providing no protection for tenants who, who legitimately need long-term housing. Uh, your inboxes fully document both cases. You, you, you've, you've heard from many, many tenants who, who will be long-term renters. You've heard from many, many landlords, uh, myself included, who have no intention of remaining as providers of, of uh, rental housing in a situation where every rental becomes uh, open and at occupancy. I would urge you to consider putting together two lists. One is uh, a list of all the landlords who would voluntarily be open to providing long-term housing, either five-year leases or whatever draft lease you provide. That there, there are such landlords that provide incentives via the ADU program or whatever that list would grow. Secondly, please put together a list of all tenants who actually legitimately need uh, 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 long-term occupancy housing. I've been renting in landlord, or my wife and I have been renting landlord. Okay, okay. Thank, you thank you very you. much. Okay, next speaker. My unofficial tally of the 663 pages of letters to council shows the following. Opposed to JCE, 471. In favor of JCE, 17. Neutral or indeterminate, 9. Duplicate submissions not counted twice, 99. I do not support the just cause eviction ordinance modification. A special subcommittee has been proposed and this committee could be tasked at your direction with gathering robust and publicly shared data that would help inform the community discussion on JCE. This should happen before any permanent and difficult to reverse decisions are made. Presently, we lack the foundational data required to understand the scope and extent of the problem, and no time has been spent researching or reviewing best practices. Without benchmark data, it would be impossible to gauge the subsequent success or failure of any changes. Unsubstantiated or anecdotal stories on either side are a poor substitute for empirical data. Instead, in conjunction with the findings of a good faith, diverse JCE committee as proposed. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Feel free. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Deborah Wallace, and while I'm a local property manager, this isn't just a landlord tenant issue. The, this just cause eviction ordinance affects ordinary homeowners' ability to freely go about their lives. This ordinance has the city telling people what they can and cannot do with their homes. And if a homeowner rents to someone and that renter moves in a family member over the age of 62, the homeowner would not be able to move back into their own house. It hardly seems right that they would be forced to invoke the Ellis Act in order to reclaim possession a whole year later. It's one thing to regulate apartment buildings like a business. It's quite another thing to tell people when they can live in their house and when they can't. Measure M was defeated by 62%. Homeowners are 60% of the voters. The correlation isn't hard to see. Homeowners are okay. also stakeholders. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next speaker. Let's see. Hello, Council. My name is Rosanna Bruni, and I'm here to ask you tonight to please be consistent. I've been here since 3.30. I've heard everything about the ADU discussion that you just talked about. And in, in, based on that, in my rental house right now, this ordinance would require that I allow brothers and sisters, grandparents, kids, spouses to move into my rental home. However, in my own house where I have an ADU, I can't have my kids be living there and then I can leave. Right? That's what you guys are talking about tonight. Justin, you're frowning, but I think I have this right. <laughs> right? You, you, don't, you don't want my, you, you say it's a slippery slope. Slippery slope to allow kids to be at the home when the parents can leave. And can't leave. The parents can't leave. The kids can't be in the house. So I, I just don't see this as consistent. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, council members. My name is Faz. Um, I wanted to thank you again for bringing this up. Um, this issue, I think, is very important in our community. Um, throughout the campaign, we had 
numerous discussions with people out in the community. Some of them may be here tonight, but most of them, the majority of them are out there in the community who said they support some form of tenant protection, they support some form of rent control, they just didn't support Measure M. Despite the misleading propaganda, I mean, it's completely false. This isn't Measure M. This isn't rent control. This isn't a rent control board. And the just cause eviction uh, provisions are significantly different than what was originally in Measure M. Um, and if we're creating a task force to try to bring this community together, right, a recall isn't that solution you're gonna only divide this community even further. A referendum is not the solution. I mean, tenants need something to protect them in the interim, right? Whether it's this meeting or whether it's next meeting, if we have a task force that comes up with a proposal, who are we gonna make those proposals to protect if we don't have renters in this community anymore? So please take action at this, whether it's today or whether it's next meeting, but please do something to protect renters and let's build this task force and bring people together. Thank you, Thanks. thank you. Okay, next speaker. And before, before you start, I'd like to get a sense of who's here to speak to us about oral communications, items that are not on our agenda. <coughs> okay, I'm seeing how many? Four? These are for items that are not on the agenda. Are you, excuse me, are you thinking of taking the delegation between now? Oh, that's definitely. <laughs> Okay. So we'll um, then I will be concluding um, at 7 p.m. public testimony on this item. So go go ahead. Ready? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Ernestina Saldana here. Um, I just want to uh, let you know that I am very sorry and I'm very hurt that somebody is trying to um, threaten with uh, recalling and uh, uh, all these kind of things. You know, that's not the way to build community. We all know that this is a problem, and the 25% that the gentleman was saying before, in a $1,200 rent is $300. Who has $300 extras to pay just like that? No, a working family. So I want to support this task force, and I want to require from uh, to request from the uh, council that you send a postcard to all the uh, households in the county and, and the city, and let them know that this is something going on, and invite them to participate. And I want Justin or you, Donna or you, Drew, to look at those par postcard before it's being mailed. Okay, that's to ensure an equal participation from everybody. Thank you. Okay, we'll have one more speaker on this item, recognizing we had over two hours with the first reading, and then I will open it up to oral communications at 7 p.m. Go ahead. My name is Andy Couturier, and I am both a renter here and I'm a property owner in another county. And I would like to speak to anybody who is a landlord and who is making money on their property, and I want to say that there is no requirement to turn a profit or to make money on your property at all. Uh, my partner and I have had a piece of property since 1992. There's been a house on it. We built it ourselves. We have never charged rent to anybody. We have always let people live there. So when people come up and say that they're being forced to do this or they're not allowed to do that, all that we're talking about is the activity of you as a landlord and you do not have to charge money, much less exorbitant amount of money in order to survive. Thank you. I'm, I am going to close public comment for the item on the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance. And I'm going to open it up now for oral communications. So we are no longer taking public comment on the second reading of the I Just Cause. After, after oral communications, no. No, uh, we're not. Wait, what happened to the second reading? This is the second reading. Um, we're we, there was a previous action taken by the council to make 7 p.m. oral communications at more of a time certain. <laughs> So I'm interrupting the item, and I'm following through with what was taken. I think it's just a clar clarifying question. We will continue. We will continue discussion. On item, but we will not be taking further public. Meetings. That's correct. Yes, comment. we will be voting on the item after oral communications. I am closing co public comment on this item. Okay. So oral now is the time for oral communications. Okay. So oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to address the council on any items that are not listed on today's agenda that relate to the work of the council. Are there any members of the, com of the public who would like to address the council? Okay, so if you're addressing the council on oral communications, please stand to my left um, and you will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, Nicholas Whitehead. Before, before you do, Nicholas, excuse me. I believe I'm next. Uh, 
well, actually, is there a Carol Walker in the audience here? Okay, Carol, you, you uh, approached me in advance, so you will go first, and you will be given three minutes. And then it will be you, and then, and then you, Nicholas. Okay, go ahead, Carol. Okay, good evening, Mayor Watkins, members of City Council and fellow Santa Cruz residents. My name is Carol Walker and I'm a 30 year resident of Felker Street. I'm speaking as a representative of the Felker Street. Okay, I'm speaking okay. as a representative. Okay. You can go ahead and pause for a time. Sorry, Bonnie. I'm sorry, I have laryngitis too, it doesn't okay. help. <laughs> okay. So if we could, okay, go ahead and pronounce and then we'll hear from you and if those that are in the audience could please keep your voices down while we hear from our speaker, okay. Mr. Justice. Go ahead. So I'm speaking as a representative of the Felker and Price Street neighborhoods, as well as Coastal Watershed Council, regarding our concerns related to the homeless encampment at Ross, also known as the Ross Encampment, and how it's impacting our neighborhoods and the river. Some of these concerns aren't new. City Council told us many years ago that the city had a tolerance policy and did nothing much to address our concerns at that time. Our tolerance level has now peaked and trying to tolerate the Ross encampment is more than is even reasonable to ask of us. So we're presenting to you six specific requests that we believe would provide immediately relief from some of the current issues and should be easy to implement. We've been working with Santa, uh, Coastal Watershed Council over the past year on projects that affect both the river and our neighborhoods. We include Coastal Watershed Council tonight as this encampment is having a negative impact on its efforts to rehabilitate and revitalize the river that helps our neighborhoods thrive. Coastal Watershed Council has been making great headway in educating the community and especially our neighborhoods along the river levy about the importance the river holds in our lives. The Ross encampment is challenging its efforts to support a thriving river ecosystem and create a river walk that is attractive and accessible to all of us. We are hoping we won't lose ground on the progress we've made along the river walk and in our neighborhoods. So please be thoughtful, compassionate, and very serious in considering our request to make positive changes that will benefit all of us. So our six requests are to establish a clear boundary around the camp in order to keep the Santa Cruz River Walk open and clear for public access to protect the river from the impacts of human activity. Move the entrance to the encampment away from the River Walk and Felker Street to the opposite end of the site at River Street. Move the porta potties away from the river walk to the River Street end of the site. Increase police patrol on Felker and Price Streets. We suggest foot patrol versus drive-bys as this allows for more attention to detail of illegal activities going on. <clears throat> Place gates at each end of the Highway 1 pedestrian bridge to be locked at night. Thank you. I have 30 more seconds. <laughs> I had an email that said I had three and a half minutes. I timed it to three and a half minutes. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry. You can give us your, your comments here. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. So, yes, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> no, at two minutes. <laughs> she doesn't. Oh, the next guy here. I'm next. Yeah, okay. Then go. Go. Well, I haven't been called up yet. Typically, the mayor says next. That's what I was waiting for. So, uh, regarding the homeless side, and um, uh, it reminded me of a month ago, maybe, when a friend and I spent uh, well over eight hours cleaning up the remains of a homeless campsite at the south end of Henry Cowell State Park. That was where the fire occurred that was threatening Paradise Park, if you all recall that. Turned out the fire, the ground zero, was a homeless campsite 
Again, I spent eight hours with a friend of mine. We took everything out to the highway. I had to take it down the mountain, cross tracks up a hillside to Highway 9 and take it to the dump. We paid for the dump fee at our own expense. And uh, just so you know, that was uh, that fire was courtesy of homeless people that are allowed to uh, infest our public lands, which are the most beautiful in the world, according to some. All right, now I wanna to get to main, my main topic here, which is the fact that Israel, or there's overwhelming evidence that Israel is primarily responsible for 9-11, which has led us directly into these endless wars. Uh, no more wars for Israel. And furthermore, Christopher Bolin, if you simply go to this website, Bolin, B-O-L-L-Y-N.com, you will see compelling evidence for what I'm saying. Israel did 9-11. Christopher Bolin is a highly respected investigative oh. reporter right here from Santa Cruz, UCSC. Christopher Bolin, you may never have heard of him because when he was going to speak uh, locally, the ADL, which is a basically a Jewish group, uh, uh, vested interest in promoting Israeli aggression against uh, the rest of the people in the Mideast. Anyway, the ADL prevented Christopher Thank Bolin from speaking. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> next. Oh, Nicholas is up next. Nicholas Sorry. Whitehead. Uh, I wish to thank you, Madam Mayor, for your uh, well-conceived uh, well and well-received remarks at the, the Martin Luther King. He's not here? <laughs> well, anyway, I want to thank her. <laughs> but fine words that she gave must be followed by determined action. We must, as a city, declare that critical human needs for survival are our top priority. Unless we act, the health of the destitute, their physical and mental health, will affect the overall health of our communities. In particular, we must act to house and shelter women and children, to grant housing stability to teenage foster kids, not forcing them onto the streets at 18. Finally, we must shelter or house all disabled people, including mentally disabled, and the very oldest among our homeless population. <coughs> I thank all those who work daily to secure the needs and provide hope to our homeless. We need to augment their efforts with priority funding to open shelter space and transitional housing countywide. We also need more public health workers and a huge increase in social workers to intercept poverty at its very roots. Without the intervention, we can't adequately redirect the lives of those struggling to survive. Moms with kids living in cars, alienated military veterans, distressed young people. They are members of our human family. Hello, I'm Henry Joseph Lopez. I enacted sovereignty earlier. Um, respect the 72 hour parking law. Um, I think officers actually save lives when they knock on people's windows and there's oxygen deprivation and the, you know, condensations going on. So uh, um, I could care less for someone actually wanting to kill themselves in their car subconsciously. But um, about communication have amazing communication skills because I see in algorithms. And um, as a contributor to making sure that renters' hearts are feeling a little bit more safe, I think that all of you, now that I have sealed your hearts with our new committee, because I knew that the last one was, you know, putting off so that newer um, visionist can actually, you know, perceive how they're actually trying to compensate with everybody because it's not easy to, um, um, you know, expand like the universe is trying to when it's so condensed in Santa Cruz. So it is I'm very gonna expensive. I'm going to pause your time here. This is an opportunity for you to speak to items that are not on our agenda that have uh, an impact that the council can influence. Oh, okay. So if it's not related, then I would like to so have you conclude your So this is items. for the council, okay? So, so you hit like a hit like a huge, you know, wave. You, you realized you had to go use the restroom real quick, come back, or whatever it was. You know, you had a big 
jolt in your system. And this is like the algorithms of the world right now. And then you came back and checked me, you know what I mean? Psychologically, um, which was another spike. Well, right now the top scientists, which I go to UCSC and I um, and am incorporated with the three top schools in California. And I consult and talk to the smartest people. Okay. So They're you, studying your the peaks. Your, your time is and up. all Thank I'm saying. So okay, your time is up. Okay. So just a reminder that this is an opportunity for oral communications, an opportunity to address the council on items that are not on the agenda. And um, if you're sitting to my left, then you're in line for oral communications. Is that correct? And these are all for items that are not on today's agenda, correct? Who, you as well. Who additionally is here? Or you could sit. You could stand if you'd like. Would you like to go first? Okay. What? Okay. You. You. Do you not want to be the last speaker? You could go next. If you're not the last speaker, he'll be the last speaker. Okay. I have just a quick question, man. Okay. One second, please. Why don't you go, go next? And then the, in the blue, you will be our last speaker. And, okay, go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm Scott Graham. Well, hang on, um, hang on just a second, buddy. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, um, just a quick question. One second. Just a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, for uh, the city attorney. Uh, it's my understanding that public comment is a time when people can speak about anything not on the agenda, but <laughs> is there a line stipulating it has to be something that the council can control or is it their opportunity to be able to express themselves with however they want for two minutes? The Brown Act requires the council to provide at each meeting an opportunity for any member of the public to speak on any item that they wish that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Oh. So it does not require um, topics uh, or the council to entertain topics on foreign affairs or um, you know, things that are unrelated to city business. Thank you for clarifying. It doesn't so require that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I, you know, I will note, noting that we have a 730 delegation from our sister city outside waiting, I will go ahead and change the time to um, one minute. What? Go ahead. I, I don't get my two minutes. Yeah, go ahead, you get one minute. Yeah. Any, anyway. Okay. Go ahead. I would, move, I would move to, uh, to increase the time back to the original two minutes to allow people to have their full time to speak. You can go ahead and pause it. Second. Okay, we have a motion in the floor to allow for two minutes to speak, go ahead. I'm speaking against that. Oral communications is an optional time to hear from the members of the public, which we are trying diligently to do, but we do have a group that has just arrived visiting from Japan that is uh, has a time certain to be introduced to us at 7.30 and we're trying to accommodate multiple needs. So uh, one minute will allow, it should allow everyone standing in line to have their say and almost everyone standing in line knows that you can communicate with us by email, written letter and so forth. So um, I respect the mayor's efforts to try and juggle multiple needs. Thank you for that. But I would also say that it's not impossible okay, well we can to, go ahead. Well, I'd to like just to just make, I'd, I'd like, to, I'd like as one. mayor, I'd like to take the floor, please. And we have a motion and a second. All, the, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. No. Okay, that fails with the lack of votes. We'll go ahead and move on to public comment. You'll be given one minute, sir. Do I get a full minute? I'm, yes, okay, you thank you. Yes, get one full minute. Uh, good evening, I'm Scott Graham. <laughs> Back in the 70s, the city council, which was made up of mostly Republicans, made a huge mistake. They tore down a beautiful library, the Carnegie Library, and built what they considered a modern library. Now, we're looking at tearing that library down or doing something else with that library and sticking the library in a parking garage. I would implore you not to make the same mistake that they made back in the 70s when they tore down the Carnegie Library. I wish it was still there. They could have added on to it. They didn't need to tear it down. So leave the library where it is. If it has problems, fix those problems. But don't stick the library in a parking garage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants. 
Um, you have the power to take less controversial measures and one of them is to uh, create a solid governmental base for sorely needed tenant services by establishing an office of tenant services. The office of tenant services would provide a centralized physical office from which to offer essential services to Santa Cruz's large renter population. It's not a rent board, but it could really help. Oversee data collection on the tenant condition which is needed in order to apply for and win grants and then submit well-written grants in a timely way. Fund bilingual tenant counseling and rights hotline, allocate and administer rent payment assistant, assistance, other protections of the renter residential population to be determined by people who know what they're talking about, a departmental manager director whose job description should be composed with the health of tenant advocates, the holder of this position should have the powers of a high ranking staff member rather than a mid-level administrator and should have the attendant qualifications and provide oversight for the programs for first time homeowners. Yeah. Okay, next, next speaker, you'll be given one minute. Okay, this is the second time I've only had a minute to speak. So I'm a business owner at the Gateway Plaza next to the Ross Encampment. So my business, as I spoke to you guys 60 days ago, is like a thoroughfare for everybody going to that homeless camp. The city manager and the police chief offered to put up a fence for us to fence that off, and all it is is the actual gate. The fence is only up there for about 20 minutes a day, and then they take it down. I have... I, you guys, I don't know when the last time any of the city council members have been down there to see that encampment, but it's just, people shouldn't be living in that. You guys need to find something else, somewhere else for these people to go. I mean, there's four bathrooms there. There's no way I could get a permit to build a restaurant with only four bathrooms for 100 people, right? Let alone 200 people a day. That thing needs to be moved, it needs to be somewhere else, so my customers don't need to see on a daily basis guns drawn for drug deals and um, ambulance is taking OD people away. I mean, it needs to move somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Gary Ingram. I'm a tannery resident and artist. Uh, I was going to talk about the Ross Camp, but I'm just going to speak a little bit about what happened today. Uh, we get a lot of people walking through, through to the Ross Camp and back again. This morning, a woman was walking her dog. I was watching my, out my window, and she was, for no reason, just this guy uh, with his bicycle and his guitar and everything, just started to rail at her with obscenities. He said, you, um, he told her she was a real bitch, that he was gonna kill her, and she's sneaking over to the side so she can be as intrusive as possible. And I'm sure she was scared to death. We get this stuff all the time, walking through there. And he did it all the way to the other, to the theater. And I'm talking about from the mall to the theater. And then another help. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. And I'm a, go, I'm sorry, we'll go ahead and pause you. Reminder, uh, <laughs> you in the blue will be our last speaker. So, <laughs> Okay, you will be our last speaker in the advisor. Okay, go ahead. I'm a new business owner, actually at the tannery. I also am a homeowner in Santa Cruz County. I am appalled that you all, whether you're conservative or liberal, can watch, and I drive by that Ross encampment every day. It's, you have, a, you have an opportunity to be leaders in this country. This is a nationwide problem. We all know it is. We all know it's difficult. Why don't you stand up? pull together public private funds and make 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 us make a name for yourselves this is it's a disgrace and i think you guys can do a lot better i will help you there are many people in this community that will help you it i'm just appalled and i think you all know that you all are too thank you Thanks to the two council members who tried to restore two minutes of oral communication. To the community, we deserve better. We have the right, when we come to these meetings, to speak at least for three minutes. That includes speaking This is the opportunity for you, oh. sir, to... Excuse me, can I continue? Go ahead and pause the time. This is the opportunity for you to address the council. And I am addressing the council. With my back to the council, disrespectfully, okay? Do you understand? What I'm saying is, this, what we want this council to do is establish new rules that don't allow this mayor or subsequent mayors to cut off the communication. So people have been standing in line waiting 
people who I don't always agree with, but who should have the right to speak here and not be interrupted in the midst of their speeches, as, as this mayor has been doing. She has to be held in check. We have four so-called progressives on the council. Why don't they do this? Thank you. All right, next speaker. Thank you, my name is Elise Casby, and I am going to address the $10 million that's, um, that the uh, city staff is in charge of dispersing for homeless services. My understanding about this money is that it will be, uh, there will be a meeting coming up very soon, perhaps this week I've heard, uh, which will address how to uh, make proposals for this money and so forth. And I just wanna say that in Santa Cruz, we have a history of absolutely refusing to build emergency shelters. I'm not gonna talk about what I know about the shelters that are existent, such as the Paul E. Lee Loft that leave empty beds all the time. Uh, in the grand jury report and investigation of 2014 to 2015, there is a very excellent summary given about the causes of homelessness and what they recommend is suitable emergency shelters. If you don't want Ross Camp and the problems there, make sure this 10 million goes into building emergency shelters in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Hi, my name's Alicia Cool, and I would just like to say that currently we have no protection for tenants. If we had any protection for tenants at all, I might not have lost my rental right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause ago. This is on items that are not on the agenda. Certainly. So I would pitches. just like to second what Cynthia Wait, requested, and I would also like to speak for again. the homeless. Um, I've heard a lot of negative comments. They don't infest things. They don't need to be locked in the gate. Um, we need to address the issues of our homeless population in a way that allows them to also have dignity. Um, currently, the Ross Camp needs potable water. They need wood chips to keep the ground dry. Uh, they need immediate laundry vouchers. And I would just like to say that we need to address the issues of the Ross Camp in a respectful way while keeping their dignity. The homeless do not infest the community. They are also part of this community. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I had other things that I wanted to speak about, but I, I think that this takes priority. To take away someone's right to talk for two minutes because someone was unable to express themselves clearly or was talking possibly off subject is denying that human being their own right and their own voice. You may not think that they're speaking clearly, clearly or coherently, but if you listen carefully, you can often hear wisdom from someone that you do not think counts. And I'm through. Good evening, City Council. My name is Isaac. Um, I'm a recording artist, go by Lyrical Eye. I've been in Santa Cruz for 14 years, and I just wanted to talk about supporting the arts and giving more arts an opportunity for diversity people as myself, because I think it's very important, especially with all these issues going on, I think it's really important for us to have more diversity with the arts and supporting the people that are actually doing the work. Myself, I've been performing in Santa Cruz for over 14 years on the streets and doing positive work in the community, and I think it's important to support those artists that are doing positive work, because that solves a lot of solutions when you got people that are actually doing the work and giving something to the youth. And I'm speaking for the youth, because I think it's very important because they need opportunities too. They're houseless and it's important for us to come together to solve those issues as well as all these other issues, but to support the local artists as myself that is putting in the work to make Santa Cruz better and do something positive. Thank you. Thank you. I had no plan to speak to you tonight. I thought I'd give you all a break. <clears throat> and then I heard an example of free speech that was incredibly offensive to me. Watching that person in the front of this room with that neon sign, if that sign had addressed any other minority group, people of color, people of a different sexual orientation, people of another country, would that have been allowed to go on? 
that's almost an abuse of free speech. And I just have to share with you that my heart is jumping out of my chest. I am incredibly upset that all of you sat there impassively watching that go on and allowed that to happen in front of this audience. That's not the Santa Cruz that I love. I'm sorry. Oh, hi, my name is Roberta Corder. I live on Price Street. And we had a meeting last night for Felker and Price. The Captain Mills was there, representative from McPherson's office. And we had talked, the neighborhood got together and we talked. And what we, what Kara Walker was saying, and I will reiterate, we understand that you're watching out for the homeless and watching out for the camp. But we want to raise our hand and say, watch out for us too. We need help right now, and we've been assured the camp will not be here for many, many months more. But right now, we are citizens. We are suffering. We are being, every day, people running up down our driveway, stealing our things. We need you to help us right now. And she gave you some ways that you could help us. I'm asking for help, for right now, until the camp can be, the issues can be fixed. And I know there's giant issues, but please help us on Price and Felker Street, please. Thank you. Before you get started, I want to just remind that we have closed public comment after, uh, oral communications after that, the one with the advisor. So we will not be hearing any additional members, no. But you're welcome to email us at any time. Okay, go ahead. No, you do. You do. You get to speak. You are the last one. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm, I'm hearing, okay, from the owner of one of the stores in the uh, Gateway Center and from people on Falker Street that, um, believe it or not, um, the camp there is, is problematic. Um, I noticed uh, Chris here raised his hand when he, when, when he said, you know, have any actually been there? And it is it is kind of too high density right now. It's, it's, it's squalid. Um, and I think you should consider the possibility of um, um, uh, drawing people away from there, incentivizing you know more responsible behavior from some of the people that they're they're in that camp area, because right now it's in a polarized um, uh, condition, just like the camp was on the um, um, the lower uh, part of uh, the, what do they call it, the benchlands. Um, you know, this is kind of a this is kind of an impossible suggestion, um, but I. I, I know that um, Bernie Sanders supporters are, are into impossible things, um, but I, I just uh, I just wanted to say. Um, okay, thank you. Maybe they That's could it. have That's half it. the thank people you. go your, to the bench lands. Okay, go ahead. You're the next speaker here. Susan Worth. I've lived <clears throat> I've lived here about 12 years myself in this county, but I actually live in Soquel. But um, <clears throat> my main concern is is the library and the fact that I have a feeling that maybe they decided to put up a parking garage and move that beautiful library because so many people that, you know, have their things and their belongings all around them and stuff and they're smoking and whatnot are hanging around that library. And it's like, do they want to bury them in the bottom of that, the basement of that parking garage? I'm not sure. And, you know, it all just doesn't feel right to me. And I, the people that are living by, by the Ross store, uh, I, I went through there too uh, about a week ago, and everything seemed pretty good, you know. But you. where are these people to go? Thank you. Okay. So at this time, I want to acknowledge that at 7:30 we had already identified that we would be having um, our sister city's business delegation from Shingu, Japan, um, to be introduced to our city, and I um, want to pause the item that we had before oral communications to um, go ahead and move forward with that. And I'd like to see if uh, Carol or uh, Linda is here and we're ready to get going with um, welcoming them into our community. Wait, you're postponing a vote after a second? We have a 10, we have a ten, we have a ten minute item to hear at 7.30 prior to this. And this is an opportunity for us to... <laughs> Okay. We're doing the right thing. Okay. That's weird. Oh, yeah. Seven. For staff. Used to be a store. Oh, 
safety ordinance. Okay, we'll go ahead and welcome in our delegates. In your phone. Are we ready? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Are we all, are we all here? Okay. Well, I want to just start by saying um, welcome. And uh, this is our official welcome for the business delegation and adult interns from our sister city of Shingu, Japan. And on behalf of the city of Santa Cruz, I would like to welcome our illustrious visitors from Shingu. For our business delegate. So for our business delegates, I wish you a full week of economic and cultural exchanges and of course continued good weather. So welcome also to the Shingu interns. This is the first time we have hosted interns for two months. I hope this will be an amazing experience for you and just for the first of many more business internships. So at this time, I'd like to now introduce Linda Snook, chair of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee. <laughs> We are truly honored to have nine members of the Shingu business community and two adult interns from our sister city, Shingu, Japan. I would like, I would ask that Mayor Watkins join me at the podium to officially welcome each one of our delegates and issue them honorary citizens of Santa Cruz certificates, which entitles them to all the wonderful benefits of Santa Cruz, including good weather. <laughs> We also have some gifts for you in the city council, from the city council. Mayor Watkins, please join me to make the presentations. Um, delegates, as I call your name, please come forward to shake the mayor's hand and accept your certificate. Please allow staff time to take a quick photo and remain standing off to my left, to my right. I would like to invite Iwasawa-san, chair of the Shingu Sister Cities Committee. And, and, and I would like to invite you to address the city council. Uh -huh. okay. So this is a uh, uh, singer's uh, photos the town of the singer from uh, the view of the top of the hill. And uh, this photo was taken by the mayor of the singer city. And he present to you. And uh, the singer city uh, has <coughs> Qing Dynasty uh, sends the legend, uh, always the technician, and we have the, some memorial park. And uh, that memorial park, they uh, made some the, uh, gold things. This, so this is a present Ooh. for you. Thank you. So thank you for uh, uh, keeping uh, those thoughtful relationship between the Shingu and uh, Santa Cruz. Um, 
I visited the first time in 1987 in Santa Cruz. Use the microphone. Okay. <clears throat> and so oh, I've been uh, uh, surprised of the how you abide uh, as a committee, uh, even if the uh, sometimes committee has some face in the crisis, but uh, you go beyond uh, the make a solution. And so uh, in Shingu City, more than 2000 history we have, but uh, we are facing the uh, less population and the aging here. Uh, it's all of Japan happening. So uh, we hope some kind of the key to uh, uh, restore in the community. Uh, we hope to find out in Santa Cruz this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I would like to continue introducing our delegates. Masaaki Inoki. Please come forward. Mario Kamura. And Noriko Kamura. Sashi Motodate. Misa Morimoto. Noriko Namikura. Do we already have? Do we already have? I'm sorry. Toshiki Okamoto. Daisuke Yam Yamamoto. Mr. Yuta Iwasawa.
And now I would like to introduce our adult interns, Madoka Saika. Madoka, would you like to address the council? Council. I appreciate all, all for your warm welcome. Thank you so much. And Moeko Iwamoto. You are receiving handmade gifts from Shingu right now. <laughs> As you know, Japan is a very gift giving culture. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. After they do this. Oh, that's you. Oh, that's there all. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's purple. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's okay? Now I can talk. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Santa, Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee and Shingu Subcommittee for all their hard work in putting together the agenda for the delegates. Thank you to the mayor and the city council. Thank you. Oh, thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just say, on the behalf of the City Council, we appreciate so much the work of the Sister Cities Committee, and we welcome with open arms our delegates from Shingo. We really appreciate that. Also, I just want to give a shout out to um, Andrea Rosenfeld. She's been um, right here. She's been really doing a lot of work, a business delegation to show the best parts of our city. She's been doing so much work to show uh, these delegates a fantastic time and all the beautiful gems of Santa Cruz. They do that for us when we go. Um, and also, just so you know, there are host families, people that are housing um, these delegates, just really generously opening their homes to all these delegates. So thank you for very much for, for all that you're doing for this program also. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you for all your work. I'm coming. Yeah. Thank you. Oops, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for taking this hand. Yes. Okay. 
All right, I want to thank the community for uh, letting us uh, take a pause and uh, welcoming those who've traveled very far to be here from our sister city of Shingu, Japan. At this time, I will bring our council back to um, item number 24 um, for action and deliberation, and that is the second reading of the Just Cause um, Ordinance. So now it's an opportunity for the council to take action or deliberation. Is there a motion or any type of uh, conversation to ensue? I'm gonna motion to table the um, just cause to a later date. I'll second. second it. Okay, so there's a motion by uh, council member, um, Vice Mayor <laughs> Cummings, seconded by uh, council member Myers to table the just cause second reading ordinance um, to a future date. Um, any further discussion? I just want to get here from the city attorney. Um, what does the future date mean, and does it mean it will never come back, or does it mean, um, well, what could it mean? Uh, it, it means a, a date uncertain. So it does not specifically <laughs> require that it be brought back at a, at a specific time. Um, I anticipate, however, that when the council considers its um, calendar, that there may be further direction asked. Um, by the council. Okay, okay. Councilmember Glover. I just uh, want to take a second to appreciate, even though it was during public comment, Mr. Whitehead's uh, acknowledgement of Dr. King. We just came out of uh, the MLK weekend and had a parade in Santa Cruz with speakers talking about Dr. King's vision and mission and goals. But I find it really hard to believe that he would allow the pressure from a affluent group of people in the community to force his hand in uh, avoiding protecting the people that are the most vulnerable while we can continue moving through the thing. I'm sorry to interrupt, but a motion to table is not a debatable motion. I know. Okay, motion to table. I'm not, I'm not making a debatable motion. I am making a counter motion because regardless of the pressure or threats that I feel, I think that I need to stand by my principles for fighting for those people who are left without power for such a long time in Santa Cruz. So I would make the counter motion to pass this language and uh, instruct the city attorney uh, as well as uh, request that the mayor to agendize the item of the revised language which removes the issue of the 62 years and older, redefines the subleasing timeline, and addresses many of the other concerns brought up by some of the people that came during public comment about the issues that they feel so that we can protect renters and at the same time move forward into a uniform consensus between renters point and point landlords. Okay. Yeah, I, think, of, I think the, that's uh, an inappropriate <clears throat> action. May I quote yeah, the handbook? If adopted, the motion requires that all discussion of the item under consideration at the time of the motion be held immediately without further discussion. Um, okay, okay, we'll, we'll ask him. Pardon me, that's if it's okay. adopted, so I, th I think a substitute motion could be made. So, you, uh, so just make sure I'm clear. We have a motion on the floor to table the item, and you're suggesting that we don't have to take an immediate vote on that, and that a substitute motion can be entertained. I'm just reading the rule that says, if adopted, the motion requires that all discussion of the item under consideration at the time of the motion be halted immediately. So, so we can we can essentially can entertain. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm. I know, I know. How, what, if you could please, um, go ahead. If adopted. All discussion of the item shall be halted. That's what it says. It would not preclude the council from directing further action at a future meeting. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's I need to call the we need to call the question in terms of the first motion. Reading this to, as saying that a, that a substitute motion could be made because it only applies if it's adopted. Okay. Yeah. So we have a substitute motion um, to, if I'm hearing you correctly, Councilmember Glover, it's to adopt <coughs> this or to make changes to have a first reading. Adopt the second reading of the current Just Cause Eviction Ordinance as is with the language that's been prepared by Attorney Kandati to, that takes out many of the controversial uh, issues that were brought up by homeowners, uh, especially during public comment so that we would have this in place to protect renters and then come back on February 12th with the revised language for first reading to remove all of the controversial things that have been brought up by the community. Is there a second? Uh, um, 
Yeah, I'm going to second it for discussion. Okay. Is there discussion on the motion? Uh, I think there are really two things. Uh, one was to adopt the second reading as as uh, distributed and published, and the other is to bring back additional language, which none, well, I shouldn't say none of us have seen, some of us have not seen. So that seems like an inappropriate motion. I think the it could be a separate motion to schedule an item for a future hearing with language to be prepared along a certain line, but is that what you're trying to? It's, it's, it's more to ensure the public that there is the intention and the desire to remove the controversial issues that are present that you've brought up, but at the same time, in a good faith mode, to uh, accept that we're moving forward with this to protect the renters because of the, uh, the remind me of the term. No, when retroactive retroactivity date. So you're moving the you're moving the second reading of the just cause, but you're saying at a future time. At the like next that. meeting, specifically, that's why I wanted it on the record and in the motion. So at the next meeting, that this language, which will be distributed throughout the, to the rest of the council members, will be able to review them and then come back for the first reading of the suggested changes. Councilmember Brown, and then Mr. Condotti, I have a question for you. I'm trying to understand exactly where we're at here, but my um, my comment was going to be that I would entertain the motion to table if there was some time certain report back at which time, and, and I, don't, I won't even go any further than that, um, some time certain report back. I get what um, my colleagues are trying to, to get at. <laughs> I, I understand that, but I wanna be clear that I am willing to support the motion if we have time certain to achieve that purpose. Okay, so we have two motions on the floor. I think I, we should. I don't want to speak out of turn here, but I think that um, based on our discussions, what um, Vice Mayor Cummings has in mind is to bring a follow up motion during your consideration of the calendar to schedule specific items for consideration by the council in relatively short order. Um, that would address the concerns that you're expressing. That was not clear to me for, uh, until now. Thank that you wasn't for clarifying. Clear to me. So any, so right now we have a vote on the substitute motion, essentially. Right. Okay. One point of discussion. Just want to make it clear that um, this is an issue that I deeply care about and that I know is affecting the community. But what I've been hearing from the community. Um, which has informed my decision is the idea that we can provide an opportunity rather than the city council being the ones who are making the decisions that we allow for members of the movement for housing justice and um, Santa Cruz together to come together and to craft or take some of what has been proposed into consideration and then work with um, Potentially, if they would like the assistance of myself and Donna, we could facilitate a meeting where we could work with them on some of the language so that whatever we propose has been coming from the the citizens of Santa Cruz rather than just from the city council itself. Okay. And so I view this as an opportunity to allow these groups to come together in a meaningful way, which is why I'm moving forward with the motion to table. Okay. So and I just want to point out that if that this is actually to do something constructive. So um, we're not trying to just delay this with no action to be taken in the future. This is for meaningful action to take place um, that's gonna be led by members of the community. Uh, Council Member Myers. I just, yeah, I'd like to just make clear that um, the intent to in this uh, tabling, the item is, is, abs is absolutely not to obstruct any forward progress um, and uh, I just want to acknowledge Councilmember Glover's comments earlier this evening. We did work hard um, up until Friday. We had some language. I continue to meet with constituents um, through the weekend. Um, and as I learned more and more, uh, I realize our community is, is continuing just to fracture more and more and more. Um, so despite the fact that we got some, uh, I think, viable language that we all talked about openly and creatively and constructively, 
Uh, I'm, I worry about the effic efficacy of the task force process. Um, I was provided information this weekend that um, based on the ML MLS uh, listings, I think data that can be vi verifiable by pretty much anybody that would want to dive into this. Um, it looks like we've lost close to 100 rental units um, in the past year. So we are seeing conversion of rental units to owner occupied and we are in an unstable environment with regards to policy and we, our community deserves the time and the effort by us to sit down conduct, you know, and conduct ourselves in a way that helps us move forward. And that's really the intent I think that um, Council Member Cummings and I are both uh, recognizing that uh, constructive work with a task force may not succeed with the starting point that we are right now. So we need, we need to just take a little bit of time and we will be moving things forward, but we just both felt that this was an effort to sort of, to sort of reset a little bit. Um, so I just wanted to explain that and appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to see if we can now at this time take a vote on the substitute motion um, as proposed by Councilmember Glover and seconded by Councilmember Crone. Um, I, I like where it's going, I, I, but I, was, I was, wasn't understanding what you were saying about you're doubtful of the efficacy of the task force. Isn't that what we may end up with or are, are moving towards, or we've given staff some direction, I think? No, I, I, I believe we've, we've started to give staff that direction. Uh, I worry about um, how the task force um, setting is beginning. And uh, so I, I, I just, I, we're a very divided and fractured community right now. And to expect to put people in a room for a year uh, with the starting point that we are at right now, uh, I just, I think we need to, to take, a, take a break and uh, try to do some work and see if we can, uh, and uh, get us to a better starting point for the task force. I look forward to providing more comment on the task force, uh, hopefully in, at the February 12th meeting, which I think was originally where we were shooting for. Okay, so I, I, I just to make sure, excuse me for just one second. Wanna, yeah. Just to make sure, we're, are you, um, do you, we, I would like to take a vote <laughs> on, the, on the substitute motion at this time. <laughs> Unless that is being withdrawn. I consider in light withdrawing of my motion. Okay. And I wanted to see what the uh, the maker of the motion uh, thought. Would you like to withdraw the motion? Well, uh, motion? Uh, it's I understand where people are coming from. Um, as I mentioned before, we're just coming out of the Dr. King weekend, and there's a quote from him: "The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy." We are in a time of challenge and controversy right now, but instead of abandoning renters, because if we do not pass this tonight, there's the very good, rea the very strong reality that those people will be displaced, many of whom, or some of whom, are direct causal effects of their participation in Measure M advocacy. So to say, oh, we're gonna lose a couple people so that we can make people feel better about the process, is problematic for me because I one person being displaced unjustly is too many for me personally. So I am going to hold with my motion, okay. and we'll see how the vote turns so out. So do you have a second? Are you oh. are you uh, holding to the second of the motion at okay, this time? No. I, I'm, I'm going to withdraw the second. Thank okay. You. Is there a second for the substitute motion? Seeing none, that so. does. Okay. So now we'll move on to the uh, original motion to table the item, um, unless there's any further discussion about that. All those in favor. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. That passes with Council Member Crone, Myers, Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself in support, um, and Council Member Glover voting no. Okay. So that then concludes the item, and that will lead us to the next item. <laughs> Which is the calendar. Oh, the calendar, right? Yeah, I don't know why I don't have it. Okay. Okay, all right. We'll wait just a second and we'll get started with the calendar. Okay. <coughs> all right, you can then, if you, if you wouldn't mind taking your conversations outside, we still have one more item. Mm -hmm. 
motion would be to direct staff to return at the next meeting with people that are okay okay we could take the uh, thank you All right. Okay. So now we're on to item number 25, which is the city council uh, review of the meeting calendar attached to our agenda. Are there any changes? Not by me. Oh. Are there any changes suggested by the council? Mr. Glover. So I noticed uh, I was really dismayed uh, to not see anything regarding homelessness on the agenda to be discussed at this meeting, especially because of the severe weather we've been experiencing and all of the uh, realities of what's going on with the Ross camp, the surrounding uh, issues with the neighborhoods and the humanitarian crisis that we're in in Santa Cruz. So I would urge that the council uh, prioritize the topic of the Ross camp and solutions uh, at the next city council meeting on February 12th at the latest. Is that the anticipated time? Uh, the council wants to continually do an update uh, with respect to the, uh, we are having meetings with the county staff on a weekly basis to look at uh, mitigation measures as well as uh, uh, to develop recommendations for you and the board of supervisors with respect to uh, what happens next. So those are being prepared, but we can at a minimum, a minimum do, an, do update. an update. If, okay. we have, if we're ready to, to have Actually. specific recommendations, we can bring them forward. Okay, one second. I think Vice Mayor. Yep. So I wanted to, um, make a motion um, I've just distributed to um, members of the city council and staff some recommendations. I know that at the last um, city council meeting, there wasn't um, very clear direction to staff with regards to the, um, what I've named in this item, the rental housing task force. And so I just wanted to um, bring a few items to the attention of um, the city and some proposals um, for staff, which would be to direct staff at the next council meeting with a proposal to establish a rental housing task force, and which would consist of creating an application for appointment to the affordable rental task force, um, recommendations on the composition of the task force, uh, the char and the charge of the task force. The second item is to direct staff to return at the next meeting with information leading to a proposal and budget for conducting a community poll. Um, so that the public can provide information on the, the problems with the rental housing market and some possible responses. In addition to that, number three, direct staff to return at the next meeting with information leading to a proposal for the city council to collect data on rent increases and evictions occurring in the city. And then finally, uh, direct staff to return at the next meeting with an example flyer to be sent to every city resident and absentee rental property owner that would describe the city's action <laughs> to create a citizen's rental housing task force. Um, in addition to these main points, I've made some recommendations. I know that the staff has been um, receiving recommendations about the, the composition and the many things I mentioned before. And so I just wanted this to be included in addition to what staff is considering and also provide um, a little bit clearer direction with regard to how we should move forward with the task force. So that's a motion? Motion. Yes. And so this is not a time for substantive discussion around any of the items proposed. It's essentially a time for the council to weigh in on making this the February 12th, uh, a, a February 12th agenda item, correct? Okay. So is there a second? I'll second it. I want to make one comment, and it's not substantive. Um, as I'm seconding it for the purposes of getting us to uh, formation of a task force as quickly as possible. I do have some additional, uh, with the acknowledgement that there will be, um, you know, some tweaking of this um, at that date. But I do, I would like to see that happen as quickly as possible. So I, I'll second that. Um. Any discussion on having this item come back to the council on February 12th for discussion? Would it make any sense to come back on February 5th? We do not have an item, a meeting scheduled at this time. And had previously polled the council for a meeting at that day for a different thing. So it wasn't gonna work. So this would be on the 12th is what's being proposed. Okay. Is there any other discussion about having this as the item that comes back on February 12th? Or Matthews? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, 
So are we committing to this work program here? No. no we're directing this, agenda. we're directing to agendize this for February 12th for discussion. Okay. Fine, thank you. Uh -huh. Is there any question about agendizing this for February 12th for discussion? The only one I wanted to mention was uh, we will do our very best to get you all of this information. So there might be That's some things thought. that we might, it might take a little longer, but sure. hopefully, hopefully we can get everything in to place. To respond as best you can. But, but it okay. seems like it's doable. Yeah, I was just gonna mention for some of the, I understand that the constraints that staff is, un, is under, and so, so for some of the items um, where it had, you know, specifically asked for a proposal, um, I've, I've discussed this with, with Tina prior to this, and some of those items seem like they were doable. And then for items that seem like they might take longer, I specifically put in language in saying that the staff would return to the next meeting with information leading to a proposal. Got it. So okay, just to make sure that that's okay, clear for, for certain items. Great, that's helpful, yeah. thank you. Clarifying. Okay, is there any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. I wanna follow up on the calendar item that um, Councilmember Glover was speaking of. I too am uh, really dismayed and disappointed that we didn't have anything to talk about uh, what's going on with respect to uh, homeless services. Um, and, it, and it is a crisis. I, I would make a motion to that it, that we do have a special meeting on February 5th. I didn't understand what the, I, I don't know if I missed your, your, your memo about um, that, that not being an available day, um, but a, a study session that, that evening. <laughs> so there's a motion on the floor. We had, we had conducted a, a, a poll of council members uh, with respect to this is uh, in the context of uh, the team building session, and uh, when we did the polling to find dates for that, it was not uh, a, a time that was available for all the council members. So, would fe would February fifth the evening work for folks to have a, to really talk about our homeless? You know. That will be a minimum Crisis. discussed on the 12th, and there's, so at a minimum we'll have that updated on the 12th. In the absence of being able to consult calendars, I don't think anybody can accurately a answer that question. So there's a motion to, are you withdrawing your motion, or are you? Uh, no, I think we should be having a, a special meeting on homelessness, uh, you know, I just think that we should be going forward and, and figuring out a, a work plan. Right. Second. Uh, so we, th there, there will be an agenda item coming up on homelessness. I'm making a motion that it be on the evening of February okay. uh, 5th. Okay. So there's a motion to Second. special meeting on the 5th. Um, I don't know if I can make that work personally on that date, so I won't be able to support that. I don't know if that could be, but I'm happy to put that to a vote. I, I, mean, I think it's oh, most, I, I guess my comment is, I think it's most important, and I, and I would actually like to see maybe more than just an update on the 12th. I think we need an actual, per, a set of policy proposals that we need to actually, um, that we're able to make, to, to take action on. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate, but I think if, we, if we're really trying to push something to the fifth and, and staff just isn't ready, then I think we're gonna end up not being able to really help. And so I but, would rather wait to the 12th and have substantive um, questions that can be answered and, and we can make, make policy. I, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, I, I agree, totally, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking that on the 5th, we could gather input from the city council and, and give staff some direction at that time, rather than waiting till the 12th for something being placed before us. How about just have a frank discussion uh, and a, see a priority list? I think we all have these ideas yeah. of what might work. I, I just don't, I'm just getting, I get frustrated because like yeah. the, but seeing a, a priority list and what we're gonna deal with first, second, third. And, I, and I've spoke to the city manager too, and he would like, I, I think he would like that, I want to speak for himself, but so, uh, so giving staff some direction on okay. these issues. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that we'd like to have as, as early as, if, I can't do the fifth, I don't think I can do the fifth. So I, I, earliest convenience an item on homelessness for us to be able to have input and direction. And so that, if, if that's what I'm hearing is direction, is that accurate? Or are you sticking to the fifth as it has to be the date? Um, well, as mayor, uh, respect, I can prioritize. Respect for the mayor, I, if you can't make it, I think it's really important that you're there. Right, um, okay. So I don't know if there's another day outside, I'm just thinking of Tuesdays being a day that right. um, council sets aside for uh, you know council business. Um, that's why I was thinking of that day. So is there any further discussion about Well, that? I, I know the staff is working on this hard yeah. with the county and the other partners, yeah. and Sorry. that takes time to do that work. So I too would like a substantive update, and if there are, if there's guidance or, or input we can give at that time, let's do it. But um, I know you're working hard on it, and everyone's eager to see the results of that. 
And it's frustrating. So, mm -hmm. right. exactly. Okay. So mm -hmm. hearing yeah. it's a priority for at, for discussion and action, which I think we all very much okay. so share. We'll make that a priority when setting the agenda. Okay. Okay. Can, can we, so take we can a, take a vote on the fifth if uh, you'd like. Well, not on the fifth, but it, I mean, will, is it coming back on the twelfth, and we're going to have something substantive um, that we really want to move forward, not just have a discussion. <laughs> If council wishes to put it on the 12th, it'll be on the 12th. Okay. 12th then, yeah. Okay, so there, so, there you should, so are you withdrawing your motion for the 5th? Uh, I'll, yeah, making it for the 12th, just to make sure it's on there. Second. Okay, so there's a motion for agendizing a uh, homeless item for the 12th, uh, made by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Councilmember Glover. In general direction, yeah. It, the only thing maybe I would request if there are particular questions that you have uh, and issues that you think are important for us to address to just you know, shoot me an email and then we, that way we can make sure and to the extent that we can cover any particular questions or issues, um, but we definitely will bring back to you where we're at with the, the entire process and all the various recommendations that uh, will be before you with respect to, because there's two pieces to this. There's the, the uh, Ross encampment uh, issue and then there's the, the more longer term uh, on what happens next with respect to uh, potentially uh, manage encampments as well as the the whole uh, state funding process as well. So those will be the various and components. The, there's no public comment on this, no. So there, this, um, and just also as an FYI, there's been a several two by two meetings. So there is absolutely gonna be information and action um, coming forward at a forthcoming date. Um, as, just as an FYI in terms of county city partnership, go ahead. I'm just trying to, Prior to motion making, I thought I was walking away with the understanding that this would be coming to us on the 12th. Yeah. Right. So That's does right. it, do, okay, so. Minimum of an update, but I think the motion now reflects that there has to be something further than that, correct? Well, I, I came away from two meetings. As, Go ahead, sorry. Media is, okay. I, yes. Okay. I'm, right. <clears throat> you wanna restate your motion? Uh, that we have a, um, homeless uh, update as well as, um, you know, sort of an action, action items on that, um, on that agenda as part of the agenda item. And I would hope since we're not gonna have a study session that we take the city manager up on what he just said about sending him email and how you would like to, what you would like to see happen on the 12th. Seconded by Councilmember Glover. Any further discussion? I'm sorry, I just have to, I'm just still a little bit unclear because my understanding is if this is agendized, then we are able to take action. So do we need a motion for this or? No. Okay. No, no but what I'm saying is, um, Councilmember Brown, is that I was told twice it was gonna be on this um, agenda uh, today, uh, January 22nd. And so I'm just trying to get a good Please. feeling like it's gonna be on the agenda. Okay, well, if, it, if in order to make my uh, preference know, or my um, interest known in this being agendized for the 12th, if that, then I'll support that motion. I just thought it was happening. Yeah, okay. it was. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. We'll take a vote. Do okay, you have a vote on that? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, I, I just passed out also to you um, something about a uh, transportation demand management study session for February 19th. And there's a motion to schedule uh, a session on, on February 19th to discuss parking pricing, reform of parking requirements uh, in new development and transportation demand management and leveraging parking funds for affordable housing downtown, uh, inviting the following people to make presentations. Adam Miller bald on pricing policy to optimize Availability of parking to visitors downtown. Patrick Sigmund of uh, Transportation Demand Management Measures and Reform of Parking Requirements. Barrow Emerson to present the Metro proposal for bus passes for all employees in the downtown parking district. And Sibley Simon to talk about ways of using parking funds to leverage affordable housing uh, in the downtown. All these folks said they were available on that date, uh, February 19th. And I think um, it would be wonderful if we could take them up on the opportunity to really have. Um, again, a study session and, and ask the questions before we proceed with some of the stuff that we're, we're, you know, is being talked about. Okay, hang on just a sec. Okay, so this is a motion to agendize February 19th, this item. At 7 p.m., yes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Can I make a comment? I, I signed on to this agenda report because 
I understand that our staff is working on our transportation demand management program. I would like to, and I, I do believe that given the conversations that we've had with folks in the community, um, there is a broader interest in having some discussion about this, a broader study session, inviting people in from the community to discuss it with us in addition to staff. And I think that, um, that I mean, I, so I support that. I don't see these as mutually exclusive or competing with each other. I would just, I think that there is um, a place for having this kind of broader discussion. So that's why I think we should do it. And this is a date that they're available, and so there it is. I'm really uncomfortable with the way that this has been presented to us uh, without, I don't know, has it been, has there been consultation with our staff? Uh, what's the role of our Transportation and Public Works Commission on this? Um, I, I have the feeling it's being, to be honest, an agenda-driven program that's being laid upon us, take it or leave it on a certain date. And honestly, that makes me uncomfortable. Okay. I'm just going to comment. Um, it's been a real fire hose <laughs> in the first three meetings yeah. Yeah. as a new council member. Um, and I understand that um, we all have goals that we want to accomplish for the community. Uh, and I think we all have a personal set of goals, And but it is our job to have a collective set of goals. Uh, and my understanding was we were going to be having a council retreat on February 19th in the morning till 2 p.m. Um, while I while I am very interested in this topic, I I feel like there is just a constant barrage of un. Uh, I I can't figure out what are what we're doing right now, and so if if I can't figure that out, <laughs> I um, I just I'm. Uh, I'm hoping that this is an important thing to talk about, but I really hope that we can honor the process of having to retreat together and understanding how to communicate and how to potentially even set some goals for the, for the year. And that's why I, I won't, wouldn't support having something like this right now. Okay. I'm not wedded to the date of February 19th at this point. I'm just supporting this because um, there are council members who have been trying to make something like this happen for quite a while now and um, have have been um, unable to do that. We have, have it's been well, yeah, we'll get to it sometime. You know, we'll, you'll hear about this at some point. And so this is um, an attempt to kind of to to move that issue. Um, it's not the priority that you know it absolutely must happen on February 19th. I just want to see it happen, and if we don't. Apparently, if we don't have a majority of the council um, support it, it's not going to happen. So that's why we're here with the motion. Okay. So I'll just say um, that, you know, one of the things that we all know is there's tons of issues happening within the city. And there's a lot of items that need to be agendized. There's things that are coming back to us that we've taken action on prior. There's um, the balance of mayor and um, with the inclusion of the vice mayor and staff to uh, look at the uh, onset of potential items that will be coming before us. And that's what I try to do and have um, uh, discussed about this specific item and also light of the remarks that were made that we have not yet had the retreat. Um, so for me, this seems to be uh, um, premature. And if the majority of the council wants to circumvent that process and agendize it, then that's the prerogative of the, of the council, but I won't be supporting it at this time. Okay. Um, just with regards to the, <clears throat> with regards to the comments about the, the retreat process. Uh, I, to my understanding that we're going to come together to determine issues that we feel are priority or that we all feel are important to work on. The issues addressed in this document are transportation and affordable housing. So I don't believe that it will be in conflict with, I mean, this is my assumption of what's coming out from the retreat, but I know that transportation and affordable housing are some of the top issues that I hear it from people both when I was canvassing during the campaign and now as an elected official, these are the two top issues that people have contacted me to speak about or to meet about. So they're pertinent, they're relevant, and especially you know, with figuring out how we can leverage parking funds for affordable housing in downtown, I have no problem personally with uh, doing this. And uh, just with regards to the agendizing process, 
it appears that there are council members that feel that the agendizing process, as traditional as it may be, is failing in making sure that the issues that they feel need to be spoken about are brought to the public's attention. So uh, if there is this need, just like with this homeless issue where there hasn't been on the last two agendas, but it is a humanitarian crisis, we need to circumvent the process and force it on the agenda if necessary. Okay, well you have that right, and so here we are, and before you call the question, can I just ask a, a, a question from my colleagues? Um, would the um, those of you who have uh, those council members who have expressed concern um, be willing to uh, vote in favor of such a thing if we were to agendize it for a, a different date? I mean, I don't I don't want to just say that the date is going to make or break us on this because if there is some interest in in or. <coughs> amenity to doing it at a, a later date, um, but knowing that we have some date scheduled and this is not just going to go into the ether, I'd be willing to, um, if the maker of the motion was willing to amend it for, to, for a different date. If it's, if that is not, um, if you are not inclined to do that, then I say we just move ahead. I just, before we get into sub substantive conversation, I do understand that there's going to be stuff coming back from um, staff that would naturally be an on um, ramp for this type of conversation. So I, I don't feel comfortable. I do know that this will be forthcoming. And so I'm comfortable with that. I, I don't know what else to add other than Unless there, and if there's being a specific date offered, I don't. That would be my position on it, essentially. Just to make one comment, I do know, for example, and I, for me, the council retreat was, you know, thought up as an opportunity for us to really start critically thinking about scheduling and making sure that we can be effective with our time, that we can respect the public's time, um, and I know that that was expressed at the last, at the very first city council meeting that went until midnight and many folks were a little upset about the fact that we were making deliberations during a time when most people were either too tired to make comment or um, the city council was also very tired at that moment as well. Um, I do remember that um, based on the last agenda that we were setting, there were also, um, there was also um, an item around the 15% inclusionary housing that was supposed to come back as well on the 12th, which means that we'll have inclusionary housing, we have the task force, we have homelessness, all of which are issues mm -hmm. that are gonna take a lot of time to go through. And so um, my position in, is that um, we utilize the time on the 19th to really start thinking about how we want to schedule out these things so that we don't have meetings where we try to address very large issues with not a lo enough time dedicated towards each of those issues. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a motion to agendize this for the 19th. I have a, a process um, response. I, I, I agree with you. And part of my thinking in this, study ses sessions are generally two hours. and it allows you without having the pressure of maybe having to make a, a motion and decisions. It gets you into the issue and, and kind of like uh, let's, allows you to ask some questions without going to midnight or, you know, and it's, it's just that. It's to study up on it, ask those questions in public with the public present, with people who are very interested in this um, item, and then, you know, we agendize it or not for a city council meeting. That, that's only my purpose here. And today, you know, Right, I, I would like to see a study session on the homeless issue too, because I think we're gonna come back and some stuff is gonna be put on us and we might not be ready to make those decisions yet, but if we had some time to really talk these issues through, and I hope during our uh, retreat, we, we, we also get to talk about these kinds of issues as well. I mean, maybe not the specific policy, but you know how we deal with them. There's no shortage of items that I think could go and be warranted for a study session, and I'm sure there's very particular specific items that every one of us could say that we'd like to have a study session on. So I'll just add that as my comments. Did you have something you wanted to add? I don't want to keep belaboring this, but the way that the motion is written, um, and, and and, and I, I respect that. I think we have very common, probably high level topics that we need to be looking at as a council. Sorry. This is a very, to me, this is a very specific use of a fund. Um, this, is not, this is not a study session. This is a study session to look at using a specific fund for a specific purpose. Now, if we wanna back up and talk about affordable housing as a whole, set a, a study session around that and funding of affordable housing, 
then that, to me, that's a worthwhile study session. But again, I, I would like to have us have the retreat so we can kind of understand how with these big picture things, we're gonna kind of frame things up. What are our questions around it? And that's that, my only that's my only concern in diving into <clears throat> something like this as a study session right now. And that would be the purpose of the retreat. Yeah. Okay. I'm a big fan of study sessions, but to do a good job, you need to give them enough time for the staff to pull together, you yeah. know, if they're gonna be other speakers as well, but also, um, there has been good work done on a lot of this that the new council members aren't familiar with, but uh, on um, we're on the cusp of some very exciting new TDM stuff. It's built on pricing policy. There was a huge amount of effort gone, gone into that in some of the previous decisions that we made. So um, I think probably a, a study session an update or an extensive report on our TDM program is warranted. But let's acknowledge the good work that has been done, that's been a foundation of many of the decisions that we've been making uh, so far. Bring him some new ideas, if appropriate. But um, I think certainly the 19th is really pushing it. And um, perhaps one of the ideas at the retreat would be, what are the things that we do want some focus study sessions on? I, I can remember. Uh, in some council cycles, this year we have labor negotiations. So we're, I think we have set aside one Tuesday um, a month to discuss that. But there have been uh, some years when there was a study session almost every month on big topics, if I recall on this. So there's plenty of stuff to study. Um, but let's be purposeful about it and uh, give ourselves time to do a good job. And, the and, and acknowledge the previous work that's been done. And the retreat is yeah. set to, to help us guide maybe, that. Maybe call okay. a question. So great, okay, we have a question to call the question. Um, all those in favor of supporting agendizing this item for February 19th, please say aye. Aye. Uh, no? No. No. I, I, again, I was trying to see if there was an alternative date that we could get at and so. But the question was called, so I believe it was, yeah, when the question is called, I have. So we have um, Councilmember Crone, were you, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your vote. I'll say no. Of no. Okay. So Councilmember Crone voting in favor, and Councilmember Glover, Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor, Cummings, myself, and Myers voting against. So that concludes this meeting. Woo, good job, everyone. We can add and bring it back. I'm not going to use them. Yeah, I tried to.